Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. The President, committees have lodged proposals as indicated at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we'll move on. I'll call the clerk. Government business notice of motion number one relating to the hours of meeting routine of business for today. Senator Fifield. Uh, I move the motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Fifield be agreed to? Uh, the que so Senator Fifield has moved the motion. Senator Wong. So Senator Fifield has the Senator Fifield has moved the motion. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, I um, uh, there have been a number of discussions around the chamber about amendments to this uh, government business uh, notice of motion. Obviously, um, we only have one day of sittings prior to uh, in, this, in this fortnight, and possibly this is the last day of the Senate. Well, likely to be the last day of the Senate sitting before the election. Um, uh, the opposition does have a view that there is some legislation in this truncated time frame which does need to be passed. Uh, so we will be supporting the motion to rearrange the routine for business today. I would make the point we would not be in the position of having to do so uh, if the government had actually put forward a sitting calendar which had the Senate uh, sitting uh, more than five days in four months. Uh, I think the sitting calendar confirms what many people know, and I think which the budget has demonstrated this government has given up on governing. Um, we're not going as a responsible opposition. We won't be holding up the passage of the bill of relevant bills for the sake of making political points, and the bill does enable key legislation, including appropriation and supply bills, uh, to be passed prior to an election uh, and preserve some, obviously, um, uh, the uh, first speeches and valedictories, which all of us uh, would like uh, to ensure we give uh, departing and arriving colleagues the courtesy of uh, engaging in. Uh, I might move the, an amendment to this motion now while I'm on my feet, if that's uh, convenient, uh, Mr President. Um, uh, there are uh, three uh, opposition uh, motions that we do wish to deal with today. Uh, general business notice of motion, and we wish to add to this program. Uh, one relates to an issue which has been a subject of much discussion in recent days and weeks since uh, uh, the uh, tragedy of Christchurch, and that is how people might show leadership in how they direct their preferences. And uh, the Labor Party for 20 years has had a very clear view about it putting extremist parties such as One Nation uh, last, uh, something even John Howard came to. Uh, we think that is a principled, correct position for parties of government, uh, and we will be putting. We wish to put to this chamber a motion that calls on parties to do so, and I hope that uh, the Greens and the crossbenchers, uh, relevant crossbenchers other than One Nation, who I suspect will not vote for it, uh, uh, or, Ms. Or, or the other senator who is the subject of a censure motion later, possibly won't vote for it, but uh, the rest of us can show some leadership to the Australian community. I'd encourage support on that. There are. Well, the, I'll take that interjection about extremist positions from the Greens. I don't think anybody would suggest. You know, I have a, 
a Greens view of life. I, I disagree with them on the US alliance. I disagree with them uh, on, on inheritance taxes. I disagree with them on how to go about uh, do, uh, implementing change. But they do not engage in racist hate speech, and that is what is, that is, what is inimical to our democracy. And you should show, you should have the leadership that Ron Boswell and Tim Fisher did who understood you put the country first sometimes. You put the country first sometimes. So don't get into this moral equivalence argument, which everybody knows, everybody knows is self-serving. Self-serving. Social leadership. Anyway, there are a lot. Two, two more things, two more motions. Yeah, that was a nice little diversion, wasn't it? Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whose side Senator Stirl was on that. <laughs> no, always on my side. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Um, uh, we have two motions also relating to Senator Cash turning up to estimates to answer some questions about the fact that the, uh, uh, it's quite clear from the previous estimates round that her failure to comply uh, uh, and cooperate with the AFP has had a direct uh, result of uh, the Commonwealth uh, Director of Public Prosecutions not uh, engaging in uh, a prosecution in relation to the uh, media leaks of a police raid, something which is contrary to the law, something which is illegal. Uh, and we also have uh, a further motion standing in the name of Senator uh, O'Neill. Uh, in relation to the public statements um, by the Australian Greens in relation to uh, a motion to suspend Senator Anning, uh, we have indicated a position uh, that whilst we do not support the substantive, we accept uh, the right of the Australian Greens to put that motion. And I have included, notwithstanding Labor will not be supporting the substantive, I've included in the procedural motion the capacity for that to be moved separately. Uh, and I hope that uh, this motion can gain, uh, this amendment uh, can gain the support of the chamber. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, I'll go to Senator Dinatale and I'll come to you, Senator Fifield. Senator uh, Dinatale. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Um, look, I just rise to speak to this hours motion. The Senate's been on strike for the past few months, and now we're being asked to support 30 bills, ramming them through this parliament with the support of the Labor Party. Some of these bills we haven't even seen before. We have not even seen Order. the bills that will be rammed through this parliament. You know, we, 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 um, we're dealing with some legislation that will fundamentally change the lives of people here. Let's look at what we're actually being asked to support. There's the cashless welfare card legislation, and you've got this dodgy deal between the two major parties that want to actually implement a piece of legislation that's got no evidence behind it, that makes life harder for people, mainly Aboriginal people, and let's name it here. It's racist because it targets Aboriginal people above everybody else. All, every single evaluation has shown that it doesn't provide any benefit when it comes to improving the lives of people. We've got a budget that delivers no money for New Start, and yet this paternalistic, top-down, we-know-best attitude from the Liberal Party when it comes to managing the affairs. This is a party of personal responsibility. Not if you're Aboriginal, though. Not if you're Aboriginal. If you're Aboriginal, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you how you can manage your money, even though it's going to make your life harder. So the cashless welfare card, a massive waste of public money, could be spent on targeted initiatives to help people, compulsory income management. It should be abandoned, and yet it's going to be rammed through this parliament, expanded, with no debate. We've got ethic, the ethic bill. This is, again, a capitulation from the Labor Party to the coalition. This is a bill that expands fossil fuel infrastructure, coal, oil and gas infrastructure ac across the Pacific. We're going to now use taxpayer money, while we're in the middle of a climate emergency, to bankroll more fossil fuel infrastructure in the Pacific. Here's a news flash. Some of those Pacific countries are now drowning. They are now underwater because of the unmitigated disaster that is climate change, and the only response from the coalition and Labor let's bankroll more coal, oil and gas projects. This is an existential threat for our neighbours in the Pacific, and yet here we are ramming it through without a moment's notice. Uh, not to mention that 
um, what this does in terms of the aid and develop development sector. We're hearing from people who work in the aid and development sector. We need more scrutiny. The Labor Party could hold off on this. This has got nothing to do with appropriations. It's got everything to do with allowing the Liberal Party to implement their agenda so that they can hide behind it when they're in government, and they'll almost certainly be in government. Will they repeal this? No, they won't, because they've facilitated the passage of this legislation. And then we've got some of the most significant changes to social media online regulation that we have ever seen. This bill hasn't even been introduced. It hasn't even been introduced and it's going to be ran through. We haven't had an opportunity to see it. Of course, in the wake of Christchurch, we need to look at how we regulate social media and online content. Of course we need to do that. People shouldn't be subjected to the abhorrent material that's posted online. But you don't go about this by introducing legislation that the parliament can't even debate and scrutinise. And of course, all done with the support of a compliant Labor Party. We've got no beef with ensuring that appropriation bills pass this Senate. Of course we want. But don't sneakily ram through legislation that hasn't had the opportunity to be scrutinised by this parliament. We have what we need is if we're going to regulate social media, let's do it properly. Let's have an inquiry. Let's talk to the people who actually know something about this stuff. Not the Liberals, not the Liberals, who, whose only intent here is a knee-jerk reaction in the lead up to an election to show they're doing something which may in fact even prove to be counterproductive. So we need an inquiry into this legislation to make sure whatever change is made when it comes to the regulation of social media is done in a way that actually achieves what we want it to achieve. Now, when it comes to this hours motion, uh, what we've got is we've got uh, an amendment to the censure motion that prevents the Greens from amending that censure motion. Now, the Greens believe that. Hate speech has no place in Australia and it's certainly got no place in this parliament. Uh, we wanted to amend the censure motion so that it makes it very clear that if somebody in this parliament can be booted out for calling out sexism, then they sure as hell should be booted out for invoking the final solution and for disrespecting the lives of those people who were killed as a result of a terrorist incident egged on by some of the voices in this chamber. We can't amend that censure motion because of this hours motion. The Liberal Party and the Labor Party getting together, preventing us from amending a censure motion that would suspend Fraser Anning from this parliament. There is something wrong with the rules of this chamber. If somebody can be suspended for calling out sexism and yet somebody who in this chamber invokes the final solution not only do they not get suspended, they get handshakes from members of the government. It says everything about this government. No, what we're seeing here is what we've seen for the last three years, indeed for my time in this place, is another stitch-up between the Liberals and the Labor Party to avoid any scrutiny on pieces of legislation that deserve a full and thorough airing in the House of Review in the Senate. Yeah, yeah. Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I uh, rise to speak to uh, Senator Wong's uh, uh, amendment. Uh, as Senator Wong has uh, indicated, uh, the government does have uh, before the chamber uh, a primary motion which seeks to uh, deal with uh, in uh, an orderly fashion uh, the business uh, that uh, it's expected uh, that we as colleagues uh, will transact. Uh, Senator Wong has uh, moved uh, uh, an amendment uh, to seek to bring on uh, three particular motions, and I just want to speak uh, briefly uh, as to uh, why uh, the government doesn't support these. Uh, firstly, uh, Senator Wong's uh, motion number 1430. Uh, let me be absolutely clear uh, that coalition senators have absolutely no truck uh, with racism, uh, extremism and hate speech. Uh, and that could not have been more thoughtfully or eloquently displayed than by Senator Birmingham yesterday in question time. Senator Birmingham uh, spoke on behalf of all coalition colleagues uh, when it comes to matters of uh, racism, extremism 
and hate speech. Uh, it is not, uh, Mr. President, for this chamber uh, to uh, speak to and seek to determine matters uh, which are for the electoral determination by party organisations, which is the other part of that particular uh, motion uh, that Senator Wong is seeking to bring on. Uh, electoral determinations are for party organisations. Uh, they are not matters that should be sought to be determined uh, by the Senate chamber. On the second uh, motion that uh, Senator Wong uh, seeks to bring forward in relation to uh, Senators Watt and Cameron uh, and Senator Cash, uh, Senator Cash has uh, addressed uh, time and again um, every one of these matters that has been put to her uh, in this forum, in Senate Estimates Committees previously. What this motion would seek to do is establish um, a new precedent whereby uh, Estimates Committees could seek to call ministers who don't actually hold portfolio responsibility for the matters that the Senate Estimates Committees address. Senate Estimates Committees budget estimates seek to address expenditure by government and to do so, and to do so uh, by portfolio agency. Um, Senator Cash does not hold portfolio responsibility in these areas. She is therefore not the appropriate minister to appear before that committee. So this would seek to establish uh, a precedent uh, which uh, we haven't previously observed, uh, Mr. President. And thirdly, uh, Senator Wong uh, seeks to uh, bring forward, on behalf of the opposition, uh, a motion uh, in relation to the Foreign Affairs uh, Legislation Committee, sitting as a Budget Estimates Committee. Now, this is extremely concerning because it seeks to establish a precedent whereby uh, a private business can be called before an estimates committee, uh, where the CEO of a private business can be called before a budget estimates committee, and whereby a former employee of a private business who would appear to have some issues with his former employer can be called before a Senate budget estimates committee in order to talk about the issues that he has with his former employer. The purpose of budget estimates committees is to call forth Commonwealth government agencies, the officials of Commonwealth government agencies, and to inquire into Commonwealth government expenditure. It is not a forum to call forward private businesses. It is not a forum to call forward former employees of private businesses and to canvass the issues that they may have with their former employers. There are appropriate forums for individuals who have issues with their former employers to pursue. Uh, there is Fair Work Australia. Uh, there are the legal recourses through the courts. They are the appropriate forums where an individual has a matter uh, in relation to a former employer. This would establish a very unusual precedent to have Senate budget estimates committees as a forum for former employers to raise matters with uh, with a Senate committee and to do so under parliamentary privilege. This is not the appropriate forum for those matters. Um, and I think Senate colleagues should think very, very, very carefully when looking to establish what would be a new an unusual precedent, uh, one which I think uh, would undermine uh, the purpose and intent of Senate budget estimates committees uh, and would be an abuse of the Senate Budget Estimates Committee's processes. So, uh, Mr. President, with those observations, uh, I indicate that uh, the government uh, won't be uh, supporting uh, Senator Wong's amendment, uh, and uh, I would encourage uh, Senate colleagues uh, on each of those uh, propositions to uh, take account uh, of what I've outlined. Right, Senator Spender, I'll come to you. Thank you, Mr. President. This is not my first speech. I am new to this place, but I can tell when the fix is in. And this is a fix between uh, the coalition and Labor to do lots of terrible things for our democracy. In particular, we're talking about an hour's motion that prevents us from debating a, a dozen or so bills. Now, I selfishly 
uh, would like to speak on these bills because I might not have a lot of time in this chamber. And so I would love it if instead of just saying at five o'clock tonight we're just going to ram all these things through without any debate, um, I've not had an all-nighter in this place. I know some of you had. I'd like one. I know you've got the stamina, so please let's have an all-nighter. I'll debate all of these things. You'll get to hear my fantastic views about the idea of expanding a government bank. Surprise, surprise, I don't support expanding a government bank. Government banks are complete failures. But this government wants to do it with this. <laughs> now, uh, last night we heard a lot from our fantastic treasurer about doing lots of things without increasing tax, uh, doing something else without increasing tax. Well, what are we doing this afternoon at five o'clock without debate? We're increasing tax. And then later on, a bit later on, if I can remember what that bill does, we're increasing tax. It's a complete lie that the government is not increasing tax. And they want to ram through some bills that increase tax the day after they said they're not increasing tax. A complete lie. We've also got some increased government spending, but that's par for course. And we've got this bill that I have no idea about. No one has any idea about. We have not seen. It's called Criminal Code Amendment Sharing of Abhorrent Violent Material Bill. Now, is that bill going to say we shouldn't do live streaming? I've heard a lot of debate in the recent weeks that we shouldn't have live streaming. Well, where did I hear that debate? During live streaming. I was listening to ABC Radio. I was watching ABC TV. I was watching commercial TV. I was commer watching commercial radio. And you know what that is? Live streaming. This debate needs debate so we don't make completely stupid decisions. Anyway. Um, I'd love to be able to debate these things at five o'clock. There's also other matters. I have a motion which we're not going to get to under this proposal, uh, General Business 1455, and that would be to say that Senate estimates can continue even if we call an election. Now, by the government and Labor proposing this um, motion and blocking the ability to have the motion that I will have about Senate estimates, you guys are basically just voting to have a week off. Next week, you're supposed to be in Senate estimates. Senate is a continuing chamber. You do not need to call off estimates simply because you call an election. But you guys don't want to do any work. Well, I've only just got here. I'd like to do some work, thank you very much. So next week, let's have estimates. Let's have motion 1455 included in this. Senator Griff. Order. Sorry, Senator Patrick. I was looking at your amendment, Senator Griff. My apologies. <laughs> Senator Patrick. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I, I would ask that when you uh, when you put uh, Senator Wong's uh, yep. when, you, when you put Senator Wong's proposed amendments that you separate uh, uh, that you separate double A uh, uh, three, which is uh, relating to general business notice of motion number one four seven zero. I'd like we'll to vote on that differently. Okay, I will. Now. Um, Senator Storer, there being no other speaker, I know you wish to move an amendment to the amendment of Senator Wong. I'll give you a moment to return to your seat. Senator Storer. Uh, yes, uh, Mr President, I would uh, seek to insert an uh, amendment to Senator Wong's amendment to the Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1, which is, I believe has just been circulated in the chamber, that uh, re relating to a parliamentary sure. transfer, transparency charter. Okay. Well, there being no other speakers, I'll commence by putting Senator Storer's amendment to Senator Wong's amendment. So, those in favour of the amendment of Senator Storer to Senator Wong's motion to amend the business motion, say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. So, the motion is now amended with Senator Storer's. I will actually, following the request of Senator Patrick, put paragraphs AA1. Two, four, and A B. Para four is the new motion, the amended part of moved by Senator Storer. Senator Wong. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got people speaking at me, but Senator I, Griff's amendment. Se, no, we haven't. Senator Griff has not yet moved his amendment. That is a separate amendment. Is he amendment. proposing to do that after we vote on? I was proposing to deal with that next after your amendment to the motion, because that can form paragraph A C effectively. Okay. Just to make it simpler, uh, I've got it as an amendment to the government business motion rather than yours. Sorry. Yep. So I will put paragraphs AA one and two. The new paragraph AA Roman four, which is the amendment accepted that was moved by Senator Storer, 
and paragraph AB of Senator Wong's motion, because Senator Patrick has asked that paragraph AA Roman 3 be dealt with separately. Would Senator. Yeah. Okay. So is everyone clear on what we're voting on? We're voting on everything with Senator Wong's motion, Senator Storer's amendment minus Roman 3 of Senator Wong's motion. So those in support of that amended motion say aye. Oh, sorry, Senator Cormann. We, we, we do need to, the government intends to vote separately on the amendment that has been added as a result of Senator Storer's okay. All right. amendment, so we need to take that separately, but we will be voting against all of the other parts of Senator Wong's amendments, with the exception of Senator Storer's okay. amendment, which is why uh, it probably would have been easier to do what Senator Griff is doing, to amend it separately. But, yeah. All right. I'll then deal with it this way. Paragraphs AA, Roman 1 and 2. I'll deal with those as a block up front. Paragraphs AA, Roman 1 and 2 of Senator Wong's motion. Those in favour of that amendment say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that paragraph AA Roman 1 and 2 of Senator Wong's amendment to the motion moved by Senator Fifield be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions. So I will now put paragraph 3 of Senator Wong's amendment to Senator Fifield's motion. So those in support of that clause say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Let's give the whips a moment. The question is. The question is that paragraph three of Senator Wong's motion be agreed to. The eyes will uh, AA Roman three, I should say. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the eyes and Senator Smith teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 33. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I will now put paragraph Roman 4, so paragraph AA Roman 4 of Senator Wong's motion, which was the amendment moved by Senator Storer. Those in support of that clause say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now put paragraph AB of Senator Wong's motion. Those in support of that clause. Sorry, what's the paragraph, AB? paragraph AB is consideration of a motion to be moved by the leader of the Australian Greens relating to the conduct of a senator. So I'm now putting paragraph AB. Those in support of that clause say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will now call Senator Griff to move his amendment. And Senator Griff, if it's convenient to you, the clerk has advised I can now treat your amendment as inserting a paragraph AC. Uh, yes, so after paragraph AA and AB, just inserted by Senator Wong, this would become paragraph AC to Senator Fifield's motion. Yeah, Mr. President, I move an amendment to the motion on the terms circulated in the chamber. Okay. So this would become paragraph AC to Senator Fifield's motion. Those in support of the amendment of Senator Griff say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. So I will now move to the motion as amended with Senator Wong's, Senator Storer's and Senator Fife, um, uh, Griff's amendments to Senator Fifield's hours motion. Those in support of the motion, amended motion moved by Senator Fifield say aye. Contrary, no. The, uh, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is the motion moved by Senator Fifield as amended be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 55, noes 10. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Can I ask senators to resume their seats before we move to the next item of business regarding the proposal of a censure? I have a statement to make. So I'll just ask senators to resume their seats. I thank senators. Before we move to this item, I thought it appropriate to make a statement. In the debate about the matter of conduct of senators, there has been some discussion regarding a proposal for a motion to suspend a senator from the service of the Senate, as well as a censure. Before we move to this item of business, it is important I draw to senators' attention the limitations on the use of that power. The basis for the Senate's powers, privileges and immunities lies in section 49 of the Constitution which incorporates into the constitutional law of Australia a branch of the common and statutory law of the United Kingdom as it existed at the time of federation and empowers the parliament to change that law by statute. A reference is Odgers, page 41. This means that the powers of the two houses are those inherited from the United Kingdom's House of Commons in 1901, as now modified by relevant statute law, principally through the Parliamentary Privileges Act of 1987. This background provides the basis for examining the powers available to the Senate to suspend a senator and constraints on the use of that power. The only precedents for suspending a senator relate to disorder occurring in the course of Senate proceedings in the terms contained in Standing Order 203. Offences against the standing order may be dealt with by the occupant of the chair naming a senator for infringing that standing order, seeking an explanation or apology from the senator and leaving it to the Senate the question whether the disorder warrants suspension. The offences in the standing order reflect centuries of practice in the UK's House of Commons and have never been updated. There is therefore no question as to the power of the Senate to suspend a senator in those circumstances. The question that arises is whether the Senate has the power to suspend a senator for actions remote from its proceedings. The only known power of the Senate to impose a penalty upon any person for conduct occurring outside of its proceedings lies in its contempt power. That is, its power to declare an act to be a contempt and to impose a penalty for it. The Senate undoubtedly has the power to suspend a senator for conduct determined to be a contempt. There are precedents for the House of Representatives suspending members for contempt, and the Houses have the same powers. However, there are limits on these powers. When the Federal Parliament's powers, privileges and immunities were reviewed in the 1980s, a joint committee on parliamentary privilege recommended that a statutory threshold for contempt be introduced. That change was, was enacted in section 4 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987, which provides that conduct, including the use of words, does not constitute an offence against a House unless it amounts or is intended or likely to amount to an improper interference with the free exercise by a House or committee of its authority or functions, or with the free performance by a, member of the members, by a member of the House's duties as a member. This constraint was intended to reinforce the purpose of contempt, and as noted, noted at page 83 of Odgers, this power to deal with contempts of either House is the exact equivalent of the power of the courts to punish contempts of court. The rationale of the power to punish contempts is that the court and the two Houses should be able to protect themselves from acts which directly or indirectly impede them in the performance of their functions. The threshold in the Privileges Act means that it is no longer open to a House, as it was under the previous law, to treat any act as a contempt. The reference for this you can check as page 84 and 85 of Odgers. Unless an act improperly interferes with the functions or authority of a House or its members, it does not reach that threshold, and the imposition of a penalty for that act would be open to legal challenge. The threshold was also adopted by the Senate in 1988 in its privilege resolutions. They codify the principle that the Senate's power to deal with contempts should be used only where it is necessary to provide reasonable protection for the Senate and its committees and for senators against improper acts intending substantially to obstruct them in the performance of their functions. The Senate is required to have regard to this principle in determining any question of contempt. 
While there is no doubt that the Senate has the power to suspend senators, its acknowledged power to do so is limited to those circumstances in which it is necessary to protect the Senate's ability to manage the conduct of its proceedings in the face of disorder or where the Senate determines that it is necessary to do so to protect the ability of the Senate and senators to perform their constitutional roles. Any other use of the power may be open to challenge. I also give notice to senators that if such a motion is moved, I will be participating in that debate prior to the matter being put to a vote. I call um, Senator Di Natale. Very brief statement in response to that. Is leave granted? Leave um, is granted. Well, uh, Mr. President, um, I, I must say I would have appreciated the courtesy of you letting me know that you were uh, intending to make such a statement. And had you have um, offered me that courtesy, I would have pointed out to you that the motion that will be circulated in this chamber shortly relating to a suspension of Senator Anning relates very directly to comments he made in this chamber as a senator. Uh, I appreciate that, Senator Di Natale. Um, I was trying to frame the matters coming before the Senate because I appreciate that they have been conflated in public debate by commentators and others outside the chamber as well. Um, Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, and also on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, uh, move the motion. Um, Mr. President, uh, today uh, the government and government senators join with uh, the Opposition and members of other parties uh, to condemn uh, in the strongest possible terms uh, the comments made by Senator Anning uh, in relation to last month's uh, terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand. A, a, a horrific, absolutely horrific uh, terrorist attack. And uh, that is uh, why uh, I uh, move the motion which uh, um, asks the Senate to note, uh, firstly, that Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and, reli and religion. This right includes freedom uh, either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest uh, his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. Also, religious Persecution knows no geographic or sectarian boundaries, and it afflicts religious believers of virtually every faith on every continent. Uh, the Senate notes the strong statements made across the nation, led by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, that violence, such as that witnessed in Christchurch, is an affront on our common humanity, and that in the face of attacks designed to sow division, our responses must bring us together recognizing that an attack on any religion is an attack on all religions, and that we all share a responsibility to unite, condemn, and defeat such an attack on our common values and way of life. That, this, that the Senate calls on all Australians to stand against hate and to publicly and always condemn actions and comments designed to incite fear and distrust. And that the Senate endorses uh, the statement of the Iman Hazan Center following the attacks in Christchurch that, and I quote, it is times like this that we lose hope and doubt humanity. When people of faith come under attack in such a way, it shows, it shows us how low humanity can fall. However, it never ceases to amaze how far humanity can rise after such despicable events. And finally, uh, that the Senate censures Senator Anning for his inflammatory and divisive comments seeking to attribute blame to victims of a horrific crime and to vilify people on the basis of religion which do not reflect uh, the opinions of the Australian Senate or the Australian people. I thank the opposition and other parties for uh, their support for this motion. It is uh, very important that the parliament is unified in its condemnation of these appalling comments that have been made. Uh, these comments were appalling and sadly made even worse given Senator Anning's position in this parliament and the platform that he enjoys as a senator. Uh, senator Anning's comments uh, were ugly and divisive. They were dangerous and unacceptable for, from anyone, let alone a member of this place. The Senate is completely right to condemn them and censure the senator that made them. The victims of the Christchurch attack were attacked while peacefully going about the observance of their religion in and around the place of worship. Senator Anning's comments were, as I said, as it says in the motion, inflammatory and divisive. In Australia, we do not accept and we do not tolerate that sort of divisive, inflammatory, comment inflammatory commentary which seeks uh, to incite hatred and which, is, which seeks to vilify people. It is why we are the most successful migrant nation in the world. The Australian people rightly expect that this parliament stand in solidarity with our New Zealand cousins 
following the monstrous attack in Christchurch. It is absolutely right uh, to censure uh, Senator Anning and anyone else, and, and ultimately to condemn anyone else within our community who seeks to use a horrific tragedy like this one as an opportunity to vilify and divide people based on their religious belief, I, beliefs. I commend this motion to the Senate. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to speak on the Central Movement motion moved jointly by Senator Cormann and myself, and I thank him for uh, promptly uh, uh, engaging with and agreeing with me and agreeing to move uh, a bipartisan Central motion uh, in the aftermath of the comments made by uh, Senator Ranning. Uh, Mr. President, we passed a condolence motion yesterday in which we stated our shared condemnation of the terrorist attack on the Al Noor and Linwood mosques by an Australian citizen in Christchurch. We expressed our solidarity with the people of New Zealand, our family. We expressed our shared grief and our sympathy to those who lost loved ones and who were injured and recovering. And we expressed our solidarity with the Islamic community of Christchurch, New Zealand, our own nation and throughout the world. And we made clear the view of this Senate that we abhor racism, and religious intolerance, that we acknowledge and celebrate diversity and the harmony of the Australian people. We stated our respect for all people, for all faiths, for people from all faiths, cultures, ethnicities and nationalities, a respect that has made our country one of the world's most successful migrant nations and multicultural societies. And we reaffirm, reaffirmed our commitment as Australians to peace over violence, innocence over evil, understanding over extremism, liberty over fear and love over hate. An important statement, a collective commitment to stand against hatred, because what we saw tragically in the loss of life in Christchurch <laughs> is where hatred leads us. The tragic murder of 50 worshippers uh, in Christchurch <laughs> were horrific acts of violence, they were acts of, acts of terrorism, and at their core they were acts of hatred. So if we are to accept, end the cycle of extremism, to end the cycle of hatred that underpins it, all leaders, political, community and religious, must stand united against hatred in all its forms. And today, we as a Senate make another important statement to take a clear stand against hatred and extremist ideology. In the aftermath of the Christchurch terrorist attacks, in the aftermath of horrific acts of hatred, whilst people were grieving, whilst a nation was grieving, the Senator in this place made an extraordinarily offensive and divisive statement. He blamed the horrific act of terror, of murder, not on the extremist right-wing terrorist, but on the victims of his evil acts. While well, families, friends, communities of those lost were still reeling from the shock, the senator blamed the victims. While those injured were being treated, this senator sought to further fan the flames of division. How pathetic. How shameful. A shameful and pathetic attempt by a bloke who's never been elected to get attention by exploiting diversity as a fault line for political advantage. Well, this motion makes it clear he does not speak for us. He does not speak for this Senate. He does not speak for this nation. And he does not represent Australian values. This motion makes clear that the Senate repudiates in the strongest terms the Senator's divisive statement and the extremist ideology that either motivates it or which he simply wishes to fan. And this motion delivers on our collective responsibility as senators, as leaders in our communities, to stand against hatred, to call out hate speech and to advocate for the values that make Australia the nation we hope it to be. We must repudiate those who seek to spread intolerance and hate and, in doing so, undermine our democratic values. Now, I want to be, briefly speak about this point. There is a difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. The former is a feature of our democracy. The latter is an attack on democracy, and let me explain why. A foundational principle of liberal democracies include foundational principles of liberal democracies include equality, justice, and non-discrimination. That all citizens are equal, all equal members of the community, and attacks which purport to posit a justification that some citizens should be different, treated differently, is an attack on the principles of liberal democracy. There is a difference between the robust contest of ideas and attacking people of a particular group because of the colour of their skin or the nature of their faith and dehumanising them. 
Because a central element in the way prejudice works is by dehumanising, by singling out people as outsiders, as second class, as not deserving the protections and dignity afforded to the rest of us. It is why we say legislative protections and hate speech are so important. It is why we on this side uh, and others in this chamber fought so hard to defend 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act from attempts to repeal it. You know, I do recall Senator Brandis advocating for its removal, stating people do have a right to be bigots. And I say hate speech cannot be defended on grounds of freedom of speech because it is an attack on our democracy, because it inflicts real and direct harm. Uh, and Senator Soker's response at one point was that if people don't like hate speech when she was advocating for Mr Yiannopoulos to be given a visa. She said, well, the solution is better ideas. Well, I say this is not about the contest of ideas. It's about democratic principles. It's about foundational principles. Hate speech is inimical to democracy. We can't normalise it through a concept of better ideas. We have to be uncompromising in our rejection of racism, prejudice, discrimination and hate speech. And we must call it out wherever we see it. Now, I do acknowledge the leadership that Senator Cormann has shown. I acknowledge and honour the words of uh, Senator Birmingham yesterday. And just as I honour the position that so many good Liberals have taken over the course of the decades in this country, Malcolm Fraser and many others, since even John Howard putting One Nation last, I honour Mr. Fisher, Mr. Fisher. There are times in our history where our bipartisanship has enabled us to confront racism and hatred. White Australia policy being abolished, the introduction of the Racial Discrimination Act, the confrontation of One, one Nation in its previous incarnation, the acceptance of so many Indo-Chinese refugees despite community concerns and dealing with them, this was bipartisanship. It is a great sadness, and I say this not as a partisan point but as an Asian Australian, it is a great sadness to me to see the way in which some on those sides do not honour that history. It is a great sadness in me uh, to see the way in which some on that side uh, have failed to repudiate uh, the ideology uh, the, uh, and the hate speech that we have seen in recent times. I would make the point that this, the senator who is being censured in his first speech argued for a return to the White Australia policy. You know, my parents married when the White Australia policy was still in place and it was abolished by Liberal and Labor governments. He also used a term associated with the Holocaust, a speech, it was a, a speech that didn't reflect the Australia we know, an Australia built by people from every country, from every part of the world, a strong, independent, multicultural nation. It is a sadness to, I think, all of us that many people, many coalition senators lined up and shook your hand, and I suspect many of them regret so now. I think it was disappointing to see uh, the motion, it's okay to be white, be voted in support. And it has been disappointing to see, but by those opposite, and it has been disappointing to see, see some government ministers being prepared to fan prejudice for political purposes. And I have in mind Minister Dutton's targeting of Victorians' African community and the focus on African gang violence, and even the way in which the Medivac bill has been discussed in the context of paedophiles, rapists uh, and murderers. And anybody who watched the project interview uh, would, would have, of Mr Morrison would have understood, I hope, that what Mr Waleed Ali was saying is that this is also about how you frame the debate. Those who use or fan intolerance and hatred for their own political gain are not doing the, only doing the wrong thing. They're actually harming our democracy in the process. So today I hope the Senate, Senate does censure this senator for his statement. And in doing so, we do take a stand against hatred and we are calling out hate speech. We are sending a clear message to the Australian people that people across the political stand landscape stand for values and principles that are central to our identity, Australian identity and Australian democracy. Inclusion, acceptance, respect and equality. And I hope that this moment that is Christchurch and its aftermath can in this country uh, generate a recognition of the importance of that occurring across the political spectrum. We're about to go into an election campaign and the contest will be fierce, but there are some things which are above the political contest, and this is amongst them. And if we do this, this makes our nation stronger at home and in the world. Yeah. Yeah.
Senator Di Natale. Mr President, uh, I rise to speak in support of this uh, censure motion and join with Senator Cormann and Senator Wong in those uh, heartfelt words. Um, it uh, doesn't go unnoticed that the leader of the Liberals in the Senate is a man of Belgian origin, uh, Senator Wong herself, uh, as she described herself, uh, somebody uh, as uh, an Asian Australian. Of course, uh, I'm very proud of my Italian heritage. We're a really wonderful reflection of multicultural Australia, and we are united together in standing against the hateful words that were used in uh, the uh, response to the horrific terrorist act, an act where people were men, women and children gunned down at a moment of deep contemplation. Uh, while their blood was still warm, we had a senator in this place effectively saying that they were responsible for their own murder. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on that individual. Indeed, um, he has shown himself to be a pathetic um, man lacking any empathy. What's much more important here is how we respond to uh, hate speech in our society. What is it that we do collectively to respond to the rise in hate speech in our society? Because hate speech has real consequences, not just the consequences that we saw play out in the most horrific way in Christchurch, but it has real consequences for people here going about their daily business in Australia. It has consequences for the young woman wearing a headscarf walking down the street when someone drives past them, winds their window down and yells the most horrific abuse. It has real consequences when Jews go to uh, the synagogue and they are forced to undergo increased security screening because they don't feel safe in their own places of worship. Hate speech has very real consequences, and it's not just about the pathetic uh, comments made by an individual who really sh we shouldn't spend much more time uh, addressing. I think it's fair to say, um, in conversations with um, senior people in this place, we're all wrestling with how we deal with hate speech. Uh, I think there's a view among some people that to engage in a conversation around this and to make a very clear statement uh, risks giving these people a platform, risks giving them the attention so they so desperately crave. Well, I, I accept that there is a risk there, but we must also appreciate that they have a platform, that they have a, a, a voice that very few other people in our society have the privilege of having. Indeed, when I look at some of the commentary around the, around the uh, contribution made by that individual, uh, that was quoted right around the world. It was quoted uh, in the Washington Post, the New York Times, it was quoted in the BBC, it was qu quoted right through Europe. Um, these people have a platform. They have a platform. And what we need to do is to come together and to do everything we can to deny them that platform, to deny them the opportunity for their voices to be amplified. Um, what we need to do is recognise that Ensuring a harmonious multicultural society takes work. And I'm sorry, but I don't accept that it's enough simply to censure one person and accept that, that we have fulfilled our responsibilities in standing against hate speech. This is an important step. Yes, it is. But it's not enough. We had the opportunity to censure uh, that individual when he invoked the final solution in his first speech. I put it to both the major parties that he deserved to be censured for those comments. That view was rejected. That view was rejected at the time. That was a mistake. Indeed, worse than that, we saw some members of the government offering hugs and handshakes on the back of that speech. It shows how desensitised we have become to the words that have been used not just in this chamber but in both houses of parliament, indeed right through the media over a number of years. We have become desensitised so that when a politician talks about settling Lebanese Muslims being a mistake, we don't respond in the way that we should. When another contribution is made that says that people can't go out at night for fear of being, being beaten up by African migrants, we don't respond in the way that we should. 
when we have politicians floating strategies to target Muslim people in an effort to shore up a few short-term votes, we don't respond in the way that we should. Now, multiculturalism, protecting the very fabric of this nation, takes work. I agree absolutely with Senator Wong's comments about hate speech. When you say that someone has a right to be a bigot, the next step is that they have a right to act on that bigotry, and we know where that leads. We give permission. Indeed, we nurture the voices of hate right across our community. So yes, of course we support this censure, but we have to do more. We need to again, again embrace that notion of multiculturalism. We should have a multicultural act that says that we come together as a society and embrace the principles of multiculturalism because it's what makes this country a great country. That we come together and say hate speech will have no place in a civilised society and we will now have hate speech laws that protect people against the sort of conversation that we have heard for far too long in our parliament and in our media. That we have a code of conduct in our Senate that ensures we all adhere to a set of standards and norms that are the norms that people right across society expect of us as leaders in our community. We need to call out that hate speech at every opportunity. And Senator Wong is absolutely right. There are voices on all sides of politics that have shown the leadership that's so desperately required. So we welcome this censure. We hope the parliament will support it. But we must recommit our efforts to do more, to stamp out the rise of fascism, this neo-Nazi movement that's growing right across the world, to no longer turn our head but to tackle it head on, to use every single ounce of power that we have to deny these people a platform, to make sure that those views are once again marginalised and not brought to the centre of Australian public life. And that's the pledge that we make in this chamber, to work together, to do everything that we can to ensure that Whenever we have the privilege of the platform that we are given, we use it in a way that brings this community together and that calls out the horrific language that has taken primacy in our national debate for far too long. Senator Bernardi. Mr President, words matter, not only the specific words that are used, but the timing uh, and the tone in which they are delivered. And let me start by the outset by saying I do believe that Senator Anning's comments in, regard to, in relation to the Christchurch massacre were imprudent, they were impolitic, uh, they were flat out wrong to blame the victims. But I, and I lament, I have to say, the political opportunism that was associated with them and also with the opponents of Senator Anning. And I've never Rarely have I been as disappointed in that political opportunism as in the last fortnight, and it's on display here today, I regret. Um, if this censure motion was confined to part D, which is to uh, disagree with and censure Senator Anning for the inflammatory comments, I would agree with it. But what I can't agree with is the adoption of this hypocritical language, this, this determination of hate speech that has been so widely bandied around. I'm disappointed in the government for adopting the language of the left. Because according to those in this chamber, hate speech is whatever they want it to mean. It wasn't that long ago where, of course, the Australian newspaper was deemed to be the hate media and had no business in, in, uh, in putting forward their own views of opposition or Labor government policy as it was at the time. We see that the Greens direct hate speech and accusations of hate speech to anyone that they basically disagree with. Uh, we, know, we know the Greens have targeted uh, the Israeli Defence Forces, for example, and, and the Jews, at least one Green senator, if not others, have accused Israel of ethnic cleansing. Is that hate speech? They have referred to the Israeli nation as an apartheid nation. They support the boycott, divestment, sanctions re regime. Is that hate speech? Senator Faruqi and a New South Wales Labor MP attended a rally 
protesting the recognition of Israel, where the senator said Israel was a settler colonial apartheid state. The, the rally itself chanted intifada, intifada. Was that hate speech? An intifada is an uprising against a sovereign nation. One placard at the rally depicted Jews as pigs and monkeys stalked by a Palestinian lion targeting them. Was that hate speech? A young child was photographed at another rally holding up a behead those who insult Islam placard. Was that hate speech by the mother who allowed the child to happen? Where were the pious and sanctimonious, the outraged about that? They only cheer on the tribe. They will not examine their own conscience. I note that Senator Hanson Young, of course, a regular tweeter about hate speech. She'd have Peter Dutton locked up in the Green Gulag because he, in her word, attacked Alan Joyce because he was gay, apparently, which she labelled as vile homophobia. Under this new regime of hate speech, where it's determined by whom you're cheering on, Peter Dutton would be in the Green Gulag. And of course, of course, You'd find people like um, uh, Miranda Devine, journalists, who call out the inhumane refugee policy pursued by Labor and the Greens. She'd be locked up as a hater as well, because Senator Hanson Young has accrued, accused her of hate speech as well. A rabid right wing cheerleader, in the words of the Greens senator. Of course, I've regularly been accused of hate speech. Um, once again, back in 2015, a tweet saying, will Tony Abbott let hate speech from Cory Bernardi dictate Australia's refugee policy, or will he listen to the calls to show more heart? So I'm in the green dystopian universe of haters simply for disagreeing with some policies that resulted in thousands of people dying at sea. Do you understand the can of worms that you are opening here? When you talk about people's language and you want to redefine something you disagree with as hate speech, whether it be reprehensible, whether it be vile, whether it be intemperate or whether it be just flat out wrong, which I think Senator Anning's words were, it doesn't mean you should adopt this rhetoric and this mantra which is coming through here because you will open up a process which is going to see us sink into an abyss an abyss, and not a decent abyss, because it is misused for political opportunistic op uh, chances. It is misused simply to score political points off and to bark off your opponents. We can keep going. We know that Sky Media, according to the Greens, are just the hate media. We know that this is, this is Senator Hanson Young again. This is the brutal reality check on the right, role of the right-wing media in promoting racism and broadcasting hate speech. Suddenly, Sky News is hate speech. And so will we be censoring that? Will we be having laws against that? Will you be trying to, to impose regulations on the broadcasting of ideas and facts that you disagree with? Simply because you disagree with it. Senator Di Natale says if it's hate speech, yes. Well, the problem is, Senator Di Natale, Mr. President, the problem for the Greens and Senator Di Natale is they make this stuff up as they go. They hold others to a higher standard than they expect to hold themselves. Sanctimonious hypocrisy is not unknown. It is not unknown in this place, and its major inhabitants are in that wedge of the Senate. They are seeking to wedge the Australian people. They are seeking to undermine some of the fundamental values and principles that we cherish and hold dear. Yes, you have the freedom of speech in this country, but you also have the freedom to condemn and criticise those you disagree with. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they only hold to one side of that equation, that we're allowed, they're allowed to beat up on whomever they disagree with. They will not be held to account for their own hatred, vile, misogynistic and racist outbursts. How else can you justify it? All around the world, the Green movement is saying any reference to skin colour is racist and vile, and we hear them say it here, except it's OK for them to chime in about grumpy old white men and terrible old white men 
I mean, they're ageist, they're misogynist, they're misandrous. They pick up whatever they want to suit their agenda, and they're given a free pass on it all. And what I lament about this censure motion is not, is not that it's inappropriate, it's just that the government and those who are meant to be sensible on the other side have adopted the language of the left. And what they are agreeing to is, today is to say that anything they disagree with, anything that is imprudent in politic, inappropriate, can be deemed as hate speech. The evidence is there. It is the, it is the defence of the weak to mask criticism and to label it as racist, hate speech, whatever it is, to suit the agenda. It is about shutting down an agenda. And so when you've got a senator referring to another senator as a creepy old white man, is that hate speech? When you've got senators referring to those who are worried about influences in our culture and our values, as labelling people as racists or hate speakers, where do we end up with this? Where do we end up with it? Why do we broaden what should be a very simple motion to say what Senator Anning said we believe is, is inappropriate? And I believe it's inappropriate. I think to blame the victims in the manner in which it had was absolutely wrong. It can never be justified. I believe the timing of it was it undermined basic civility and basic humanity. It was political exploitation and opportunism at its very worst. But I know, also know there are many people who actually support what Senator Anning said. And that's the beauty of this country. We're allowed to disagree. We're allowed to disagree with people and to call it out. That is freedom of speech. And the great hypocrisy is that those who champion these freedoms and these, that champion this idea that somehow we're, we can live in a paradise just by stifling and shutting down everyone else who we disagree with is going to lead to some utopia. It's not. It's not. We have, we have an obligation to speak truth to power, and the power, unfortunately, unfortunately rests with the hypocrisy of the Green movement and the left in this country. They are adopting language to make it mean things that it has, should never mean. They are doing Senator it Bernardi, as a means time. of stifling our discussion. I'm going around the chamber in the order I'm getting indications. I'll take all your names down. Senator Hinch is next. Uh, I rise to speak in support of the uh, censure motion against Senator Anning. Uh, early in uh, Senator Anning's unexpected and I hope short Senate sojourn, I said, and I quote here in this chamber, I'm starting to think that Senator Anning lies awake at night trying to think up new ways and words to offend decent, rational, compassionate Australians. There was his attack on vulnerable women who were terminating a pregnancy. Then Senator Anning attacked other people's rights to die with dignity. His attempt to politicise the Christchurch mosque massacre, in my opinion, sunk to a new level and is worthy of censure in this chamber. To me, it was straight out of the NRA handbook on how gun extremists can benefit from little kids being murdered. I'm actually surprised he wasn't on the source and on the plane with Pauline Hanson's treasonous apparatchiks as they requested millions of dollars from the despicable gun lobby to undermine our gun laws and undermine this parliament and put Aussie families at risk. And speaking of risk, yesterday in question time, Senator Anning tried to dismiss all of his grotesque comments as freedom of speech, as a part of free speech. Well, Senator Anning, I was a journalist for five decades, and I believe passionately in free speech. But if you did some research, you may have checked it out and found out there is an, there is an adage, and it's a rule that journalists follow, and I hope other people would follow. And that is the, the line, the rule, that you cannot shout fire in a crowded theatre. That is not freedom of speech. That is irresponsible, reckless and totally dangerous behaviour. Not free speech at all. And Senator Bernardi was 
leaning on, on you and saying the same sort of thing. You cannot shout fire in a crowded theatre because people may die. And for you to get up after Christchurch, after all those people, 50 people were murdered, and turn it into a political thing, that's what, that's what the NRA was telling One Nation, telling Pauline Hanson's people. This is what you do. If there's a massacre, you turn it to your advantage. What you do, you know, offence, offence, offence. You turn a murder of kids into a, a political thing on your behalf. You accuse them. You accuse your opponents. People are against uh, proliferation of guns. You accuse them of dancing on the graves of children. That's what the NRA was saying. That's what One Nation was trying to bring into Australia. So all I can say, Senator Anning, and I say it quite deliberately, you besmirch this place. You should be ashamed of yourself, and I hope you're soon gone. Okay. So, um, Senator Anning, I'll do you the courtesy of offering you the opportunity to speak now or at the conclusion of debate before it's put, um, given you're the subject of the censure. Would you prefer to speak now or later? Uh, at the end of debate, it'll be I'll, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that courtesy. Um, Senator Dodson was on his feet earlier. I'll come to you other senators next. Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I um, rise to speak in support of the motion put by the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Uh, our First Nations peoples have carried the consequences of murderous prejudice throughout our entwined history. First Nations peoples in Australia know what it's like to be powerless in the face of hateful prejudice, fanned by the illusion of superiority and the false courage created by a weapon in the hand of an oppressor. To be victims against superior weaponry. We know the impact of murder willfully carried out and morally justified by, hate, by hatred of minorities, misplaced power and bullying superiority. Justified by a determined and arrogant rejection of the shared equality of human beings. We're people of another culture, another religion, another social expression of our common humanity are viewed by cowards with power and guns as less worthy of humanity. In the Gurindji country, in the Northern Territory, people still talk of the killing times. Mounted Constable Wilshire was stationed at Victoria River Downs in the 1890s. He was a mass murderer in uniform who took it upon himself to protect the interests of the cattlemen to disperse the traditional owners of the land at gunpoint. He took to print, justifying his actions with boastful pride and emboldened by the rightness of whiteness and condemned the First Nations people to death. He wrote one day, one day of killing on Wave Hill saying, it is no use mincing matters. The Martini Henry carbines are the critic at the critical moment were talking English in the silent majesty of these eternal rocks. The carbines were talking English. I've walked through some of these sites of massacre, mass murder in Australia with the descendants of the victims and sometimes too with the descendants of the murderers. In South Australia, Senator Gallagher and I visited a monument erected uh, by both sides of the small community of Elliston to commemorate the mass murder of men, women and children pushed over the steep seawall by charging horsemen on barking dogs. I have raised, I have visited sites of massacre, of mass murder in Bulgo, in the Forest River and at Conestance, Conestance near Alice Springs. Those mass murders took place in living memory. I sat down with old Walpree men and women who luckily survived those murderous attacks as young babies. Hidden from the attacks, 1928 is not so long ago. My mother was just seven years of old, seven years old. But we are in the, in the 2019 now, and the mass murderer rejected the richness of diversity driven by religious hatred and xenophobia, empowered by military-style weapons. He waged his atrocities in Christchurch on innocent, defenceless people. In this Senate, we stand for common humanity, reject respect for religion and tolerance of life and all its diversity. We reject the scourges of racism, of bigotry and the kind of hateful 
violent, murderous prejudice we saw in Christchurch. The murder of 50 innocent people does not just happen. It arises from the, from the feeling, the fueling of hatred, irresponsible language and the demonising of people of colour and difference. It is neither fair nor honourable for the Senator from Queensland to sit to shift the responsibility of that crime to the community who were the targets. The Senator said in his tweet, the real cause of bloodshed on New Zealand streets today is the immigration program which allowed Muslim fanatics to migrate to New Zealand in the first place. We know the victims were not Muslim fanatics. They are innocent men, women and children at Friday prayers, finding peace and communion with God and their fellow believers. We know that Senator Anning knows the real cause of the bloodshed at Christchurch. The real cause was prejudice, hate and a passion for violent action aided and abetted by the availability of a military-style weapon. It also it's also entirely immoral for other senators from Queensland seeking political leverage to solicit donations from the purveyors and promoters of these designer weapons in the United States and to con conclude with them to overturn Australian laws that protect all of our lives. Mr President, the senator from Queensland, Senator Anning, warrants our censure. Through his words, his actions, he has aligned himself with the most vicious form of ethnic and racial hatred. He is exonerating the murderous action of a deranged and hateful killer. We cannot let his words and actions define this chamber. We cannot allow his hateful values to go unchallenged, and we cannot let the stench of racism and hate linger in this chamber. We call on all parties, including the One Nation Party, to stand with us today to censure Senator Anning. We shall stand with Senator Cormann and Senator Wong in their joint effort to ensure that this Senate is clear and steadfast on our shared values, on what we affirm and what we re reject. We must be one, of one voice and one heart on this issue. We turn our backs against xenophobia, against hate crimes, against any gunman who holds innocent people in their sights. We call out those who exploit fear and ignorance of, for political gain, who mock the traditional dress of women of another culture, who seek donations from the manufacturers of weapons of war to override our own laws, who argue that it's all right to be white. They, their actions and, and exhortations would plunge this country back into the killing times. And you've got to remember, this history is well known. First Nations peoples, and your language does matter. And if this remains unchecked, then we will go back into that awful period. We should in instead turn our faces to the light of a new future, a peaceful, non-violent, tolerant country of hope, respect and unity. A country where no innocent man, woman or child is ever again victims of mass murder. I say to those faithful morning for their families in Christchurch. Allah Yerham Hum, rest in peace. And I say to the people of New Zealand, Po Moto Mate Ka Kaha, we are sorry for your loss. Stay strong. I support the motion. Senator Spender. Uh, this is not my first speech. I'd like to thank Senator Dodson for those words. I welcome this censure motion and I'll be supporting it. I want to note that I disagree with some of the additional words um, put by Senator Wong, where she said that free speech does not include hate speech, and she said that Senator Anning's comment, uh, comments uh, were not part of the contest of ideas. Unfortunately, that's not true. We need to look at the polls. We are all failing to convince our fellow Australians about the importance and the rightness of non-discriminatory immigration. We can all here, other than Senator Anning, perhaps talk about how vile those comments were, and they were vile, and we can all talk about how non-discriminatory immigration is so important. But that 
is not a view held by so many, probably millions of Australians. We need to convince them, not by deplatforming people like Senator Anning, but by convincing people that he's wrong and that they're wrong and that they should think a different way. I find it amazing that we think we can solve our problem just by saying that Senator Anning shouldn't be allowed to have said what he said. The problem will remain. Now, Senator Anning has free speech. I think he should have been free to say what he said. Um, as it happens, we all have free speech and we can all strongly disagree in the strongest possible terms with what he said. And that is why I will be joining you all in voting for this censure motion. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak in support of the censure motion. Yesterday, I tabled a petition signed by 1.4 million people, the biggest online petition in Australia's history, calling on this Senate to remove Senator Anning from Parliament because of his despicable comments seeking to further demonize Muslims in the wake of the Christchurch massacre and blaming the targets of this horrific terrorist attack for their own deaths. I received this petition on the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and it was indeed a fitting day to receive it, because if there is one politician that trades in hate, fear and division, it is Senator Anning. And believe me, there is some competition in here. Some have stood up and have used deflection tactics, or they are being apologists for hate speech. And we've just seen that from Senator Bernardi. Senator Bernardi does not seem to have any understanding of the difference between hate speech and disagreement. He doesn't have any understanding of the difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. And it seems he definitely does not have any understanding of the impact of hate speech on people in the community. Others have stood by and remained silent in the face of hatred. They have failed to call it out. And I hope that they can all reflect and change. People feel so strongly about what has been said in Parliament and outside of Parliament um, that in their petition they say, and I quote, Senator Fraser Anning's views have no place in the government of our democratic and multicultural country. Within the bounds of Australian law, we request that he be pushed to resign from his position as senator and, if appropriate, be investigated by law enforcement agencies for supporting right-wing terrorism. This is the strength of community views. And I know that there is no mechanism to force a senator to resign, but the sheer number of people who signed this petition shows how strongly the community feels about those who seek to divide us and create an atmosphere of hate and division to further their xenoph xenophobic agendas. And we have seen that this has real consequences. Hate speech leads to political violence. The community stands against hatred. So the parliament must listen to those we represent and take action to make sure that people are held accountable for what they say and do. Senator Anning has well and truly crossed the line in here and out there. There is no question about that. He does not deserve to be in parliament. I have no doubt that the community will make sure that he is not re-elected in May, and I will be doing everything in my power to consign such awful, ugly views to the history books, where they are so clearly for, from and where they truly belong. There is no room for racism in Australia. Sadly, what Senator Anning said after the Christchurch massacre, however shocking it is, it isn't out of character. Just a week before I joined this place, he gave a speech calling for a ban on people like me coming to this country and for a white Australia policy. He even invoked the despicable final solution in his speech. 
He has flown business class on taxpayer dollar, I might add, to St Kilda to rally alongside neo-Nazi sympathizers. So yes, he should be condemned. Yes, he should be censored. And yes, he should be suspended from parliament. It is terrifying that right-wing extremist groups have found a mouthpiece in federal parliament. I have often referred to these groups and the politicians who support them as merchants of hate. They prey on the anxieties of Australians with a rhetoric that is empty, hateful and divisive. They whip up hysteria against minorities, against women, against Aboriginal people and against Muslims. They thrive on problems, conflict and suffering. And this is creating a very dangerous environment for all of us in Australia and across the world. How devoid of compassion and humanity is this senator to in effect blame the targets of this terrorist attacks for their own deaths? How low can you go? What did three-year-old Mokad Ibrahim do to deserve this, Senator? What about Hamza Mustafa, who had just celebrated his 16th birthday? Senator Anning, you are an absolute disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself, and you should resign. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. What a way to end the last week of the 45th Parliament. Senator Anning has barely been here for 18 months, and in that time he has made headlines for all the wrong reasons. In doing so, he has brought the office of senator into disrepute. Perhaps the 19 people who gave him their first preference vote had an inkling of what he would be saying and how he would respond in this chamber. But certainly the rest of us could not have known that this once unremarkable man would very quickly become one of Australia's most divisive, hateful and indeed hated politicians. My greatest regret in this parliament was actually following convention and shaking Senator Anning's hand after his maiden speech, and I'm sure there are many in this place that would feel the same way. As people would be well aware, it was not in support of his comments, but instead a regrettable adherence to polite protocol. Well, manners be damned, it is something that I will never, ever do again. It seems that every time Senator Anning opens his mouth, Australia recalls. I'm very much glad that we're taking such a strong stance today to cut out his extreme, unapologetic and very much ignorant views. For too long now, Australia's leaders have done too little to stand up for racism and divisive comments. In fact, this government has often been happy to pile on. Refugees, in particular, have been its favourite easy target. By not objecting loudly to extremist commentary and by not countering the lies with facts and a reminder of the good that migrants and refugees bring to our proudly multicultural nation, a negative mindset has been allowed to fester and grow. The tolerance of hate speech in our parliaments and sections of our media under the guise of so-called free speech has implied support for the venom that spews out of the alt-right. John Howard at least saw One Nation and its dangerous appeal to the right wing for the poison it was. This government is still somehow trying to have it both ways. The Liberal Party has finally and perhaps reluctantly drawn a line in the sand and decided to preference one nation after Labor. It's still not clear whether this will actually happen in seats where one nation preferences really matter to them. And so far, the Nationals aren't prepared to do the same. It seems the government's Conservative members still think that pulling to the right and being some sort of one nation light party will work in its favour. Ultimately, they are very much wrong. Voters don't want empty pandering. They want leaders to create a strong, prosperous and safe nation. They want solutions. And where voters 
are barking up the wrong tree, the answer is to give them the facts, not to indulge their ignorance. I could not believe it when I saw a recent news item in which Barnaby Joyce urged his party to move to the right to counter what he saw as an electoral threat from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. He reportedly said his constituents believed there was too much regulation on tree clearing, firearms ownership and pretty much everything they could do on their land. Incredibly, when asked whether those beliefs were correct, Mr Joyce said, and I'll quote, I don't have to believe whether it's right or not. I can just tell you we lost a seat over it. His solution was to pander to these sentiments rather than fight them with facts. That's not what leadership is about. Leadership is about bravery in the face of public ignorance, about doing and saying what is right and bringing voters with you on matters of national importance. If you want a cohesive society which welcomes migrants and refugees and which sees the good in others, no matter their differences, you have to talk the talk. Mr Shorten has been late to the party, but he was at least spot on when he reportedly said that dog whistling by political leaders about immigration and asylum seekers must stop. The Prime Minister might like to deny that he has used religion to incite fear in the community, but he has certainly used race to do so. Who can forget that after the medical evacuation bill was passed, the government well, the government's first instinct was to shamelessly demonise the refugee men and women who might be transferred for medical care as murderers and rapists. It is time that we as politicians remember that what we say actually does matter. Not because it might help us at the ballot box, but because our words guide the nation. With our words, we can either reject hate or give it refuge. We can embrace and welcome cultures or sow fear and suspicion. All of us in this place have an obligation to lead by example and to remember that what we say echoes and helps shape our nation. With every word we utter about religion and race, we create a legacy, a long-term legacy. We must always be mindful of what that legacy will be. With this in mind, Centre Alliance most certainly supports the censure of Senator Annie. Senator Giorgio. I rise to speak and put on the record, as Senator Hanson is unwell, I am making the following contribution to the debate on her behalf. I'd like to welcome to the Australian people the equivalent of a public flogging of an elected member in the Senate. Regardless of how many personal votes Fraser Anning may have received at the 2016 election, let me put it on record that he still drew a stronger vote than a number of you sitting in this chamber here today. Just ask Liberal Senator for Tasmania, Wendy Askew. Senator, you sit here today after receiving zero votes from your Tasmanian constituents. In fact, Senator Askew joins us today as a result of the nepotism that runs deep through the Liberal Party. I've got no doubt your brother will be, in, will be enjoying his plum job as Australia's Consul General in Chicago. Come to think of it, Fraser Anning polled a stronger number of votes than the Green Senator for New South Wales, Maureen Faruqi, received zero votes in the 2016 election from the New South Wales constituents. You, Senator Faruqi, are regarded as a to token replacement for Senator Rhiannon. Not one of you received a single vote from the Australian public, but you line up in this chamber hungry for this public flogging of Senator Anning. Australians were horrified at the murder of 550 people in Christchurch on the 15th of March this year. And we were horrified to think that these murders were at the hands of an Australian. Many of us thought Australia had witnessed its last mass shooting after the Port Arthur massacre, which resulted in John Howard rightfully introducing a ban on semi-automatic weapons throughout this country in 1996. But here, 
We are 23 years later, having to witness 50 innocent lives taken at hands of the crazed lone gunmen. Hate, extremism and violence has no place in our democratic, civilised nations. And I use this opportunity to reinstate one nation's commitment to a peaceful rule of law for all, in accordance with our democratic constitution and acts of parliament. But while Senator Anning's comments following the mass killings in New Zealand were untimely and therefore deemed highly insensitive, he still maintains a right to his opinion. If one nation endorses your actions to censor Senator Anning today, our freedom of speech as elected members of this chamber will be removed. Who will be the next member of parliament stopped from speaking their thoughts or their thoughts of the people they represent? We refuse to be led like sheep in this chamber and therefore we abstain from voting on the essential motion. Shame. Our vote will not contribute to the demise of freedom of speech or nor, or nor will it endorse the timing or tone of the comments made by Senator Annie. The exploitation of these murdered in New Zealand is offensive and each one of you should be ashamed on the manipulation of the events that day to suit your own agenda. The people of Queensland will judge Senator Anning at the ballot box, not us. Since the tra tragic event in New Zealand on March 15, 65 additional terrorist attacks have been recorded across the globe. That's 418 people died as a result of terrorism over the last 18 days. Is this the future politicians in this chamber want for the people of Australia? With more than 600,000 people coming into this country every year for work, permanent residency and education purposes, we have left ourselves vulnerable to the same carnage that is on display in other parts of the world. Only days ago, Prime Minister Scott Morrison made the announcement that this government would give another $570 million in extra funding to Australia's counter-terrorism and counter-intelligence operations. This is an admission that Scott Morrison's government has failed to keep terrorists out of Australia. And let's not forget who opened the floodgates to the influx of these people coming to the country in the first place, the Labor Party. How many radical Islamic hate preachers have been allowed into Australia over the past decade and yet complete silence from Labor and the Greens on the vile language that spews out of their mouths while they indoctrinate and, ra and radicalise vulnerable Australians? No, your political witch hunt in these dare question the immigration policy of this nation. The slightest whiff of protectionism in this country by the elites in this chamber and it sends you into a psychological frenzy. Governments and elected members have three primary objectives. Adhere to the constitution, manage the economic stability of rule and law in our country and lastly stop telling people how to run their lives and businesses. Instead of getting on the crafting of robust economic narrative for Australia by drought-proofing our nation with visionary projects like the hybrid version of the Bradfield scheme or establishing ways to bring back manufacturing or cutting power prices with the construction of new coal fire plants, they're all here beating your chests. We've treated the people of this country with the same disband and unworthiness that trust upon me and others who dare speak up the forgotten voices of the nation. The Australian people have been treated like mushrooms fed complete BS and kept in the dark. That is where One Nation steps in. We see the anguish, hurt and pain on their faces of ordinary Australians. We take the time to listen to the troubles and what they have to say. The people of Australia have watched you sell your souls and this country out so you can hold your seats in this chamber. What do you say to the generational farmers who have been forced off the land due to the pittance they are being paid for their produce and lack of water which governments have failed to provide? Your actions speak louder than words because you've continued flogging our prime agricultural land off to the highest bidder overseas. It's not foreign investment, it's called foreign takeover. What do you say to the homeless who have once had no visual presence in our streets? Today, more than 100,000 Australians are homeless, yet you bellow from the rafters when we dare to call to redivert the $4.2 billion in foreign aid into helping our own people. You've left the support 
of our returned defence personnel to the will of God, instead of assisting them to address the mental and physical scars that our wars have caused them? What do you say to the aged pensioners who are stumbling around in the dark, too afraid to use electricity because they're struggling to make ends meet, without even turning on their air conditionings and heaters because they're too scared? Every day, today's central motion has nothing to do than a public flogging, and One Nation won't be part of it. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Senator Storer, who's the last speaker I have, Senator Anning, then I'll come to you, if that is still acceptable to you. Senator Storer. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak in support of this censure motion. I was shocked and appalled by Senator Anning's disgraceful comments in the wake of the Christchurch tragedy. He is an embarrassment to our country and to this parliament. We must take this opportunity to rise as one and show that he does not speak for Australia, that he does not speak for this Senate. More broadly, it's time to draw a line in the sand. The Islamophobic race baiting and dog whistling engaged in by some politicians, commentators and media outlets must stop. There's one thing that Christchurch tragedy should teach us, it's that there are real world consequences to this behaviour. It's time for, for those of us with megaphones, for those of us in positions of power and influence, to reflect deeply on the impact of their words. We must rise above the politics of religious and racial division and disunity. It has no place in a modern, tolerant, multicultural society. I stand here as a passionate supporter of multicultural Australia. Our diversity and differences is what makes us strong and vibrant. It should be celebrated and embraced. Let us send a message to, to all those who wish to divide us, to tear us apart, that we are united, we are proud of, this, of our diversity, and we will fight like hell to defend it. Thank you. Well, Senator Anning, would you like to speak now? I, Thanks. I, I'll, I'm going to give Senator Anning the opportunity to speak. He's been quite patient. Senator Wish Wilson, unless you're raising a point of order. Yep. I heard you said um, the last, Senator Storer was the last speaker. I wasn't aware there was a speaker's had, list. Indicated they wished uh, okay, to speak. Senator Hanson, and I'd like to make a short contribution as well. Senator Anning. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this censure motion against me is a blatant attack on free speech. It is also an exercise in left-wing virtue signalling of the worst kind. Of course, it e this is exactly the kind of self-righteous left-wing intolerance of alternative views that you would expect from an extremist party like the Greens, Mr. President. What is shocking is that it is supposedly a supposedly liberal prime minister who is leading the charge, joining hands with Labor and the Greens. The specific reasons for moving mo uh, a motion to censure me are barely coherent. The motion calls on the Senate to censure me for supposedly inflammatory and divisive comments, seeking to attribute blame to the victims of a horrific crime. What inflammatory and divisive comments, Mr President? What blame did I attribute to the victims? I said nothing of the sort. Following this shocking attack on two mosques in Christchurch on the 15th of March, I issued a media statement condemning the shooting and the shooter in the strongest possible terms. However, after putting the immediate blame where it belonged, I looked for contributing causes. I, I identified that immigration program that allowed Muslim fanatics to migrate to New Zealand was a key enabler of community violence. The claim that this somehow blames the victims is absurd, Mr President. My real crime, of course, is that I simply told the truth at a time when the left-wing political, political and media elites least wanted to hear it. In the three weeks before the shooting in Christchurch, 120 Christians in Nigeria were shot or hacked to death by Muslims. The tragedy was not reported in a single Australian news outlet that I am aware of. Much closer to home, in the Philippines in January, a cathedral was bombed by Muslims and 20 innocents attending mass were killed with over 100 injured. Much closer, uh, where was the statement from Morrison's government denouncing the killers? Where was the outrage from the others condemning me? Just three days after the Christchurch killings, a Muslim fanatic killed three and wounded five others in a tram in Holland. Again, silence from those seeking to censure me now. Since the attack in Christchurch on the 15th of May, there have been 66 new terrorist attacks committed worldwide by Muslims, killing uh, 342 and injuring many hundreds of others. Since the Islamic attack on the Twin Towers in New York in September 11, 
2001, there have been more than 3, 000, uh, 34,000 terrorist attacks conducted in the name of Islam. This is a staggering number. Once again, we hear the deafening silence from these figures from those uh, moving this censure motion, because, of course, Muslims as perpetrators does not fit their current narrative. Where was the Parliament's condolence motion for these victims of Muslim terrorism? Yesterday, the government expressed solidarity with Muslim victims of, our New Zealand, uh, of one New Zealand attack, but the growing list of thousands of civilian victims of Muslim terrorist terrorism is ignored. Has everyone forgotten the scores of heinous terrorist attacks committed by Muslim fanatics here in Australia, in France, Germany, Britain, Spain and the United States and elsewhere? Australians and New Zealanders should be, uh, should be able to both condemn the attacks in Christchurch but also to see them in perspective and be able to discuss related factors without being shouted down or subject to parliamentary censure. Following my comments on the Christchurch shooting, I was a victim of a physical attack in Melbourne. Even though this only involved a young adult with an egg, it was nevertheless an example of political motivated violence. While those who don't like me may have been delighted to see me attacked, we might have expected a statesmanlike response by the Prime Minister deploring such action. Not at all. The President um, insisted Prime Minister Morrison uh, uh, said that I should be charged. He was reported saying that, having been a victim of politically motivated violence, I should, and I quote, be subject to the full force of the law. Yesterday I asked, the minister, uh, I asked Minister Birmingham if the government backed the Prime Minister's shocking statement that I, have one play, uh, that I have no place in Parliament and his apparent lack of concern for political motivated, politically motivated violence against me. The answer was a resounding yes. It may have only been an idiot with an egg this time, but there is a continuum which begins with this and ends with a fanatic with a gun or a bomb. But apparently, according to Prime Minister Morrison, that's OK as long as the victims are conservatives. Mr. Prime, uh, Mr. The Prime Minister loves to recycle the, his predecessor's mantra that Australia is the most successful multicultural society in the world. What a ridiculous statement. By what criteria is this conclusion arrived at, Mr. President? It is an established fact that diversity undermines cohesion, increases alienation and is a key driver of in increasing crime. It is also an established fact that if you import those who despise our values and beliefs and whose religion enjoins them to violence, then this sort of diversity leads to increasing violence and terrorism. This censure motion against me is an attempt to deflect attention from the government and the opposition's bipartisan commitment to reckless, indiscriminate immigration, a failed policy which is importing Muslims and Sudanese wholesale despite the proven track records of both groups in causing crime and terrorism. In response to the Christchurch attack, the extreme left, exemplified by the Greens, has seized on an opportunity to try and smear everyone right of centre as potentially violent racists. However, what is truly shocking is that the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, seems to have bought into that as well. Advocating politically or religiously motivated violence is an indicator of extremism, Mr President. Not the quiet, reasonable, peaceful advocacy for a change in our immigration program before European Australians become a minority in our own country. Now innocent conservatives and even the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilisation are being accused of guilt for mass murder on the flimsy basis that the killer's manifesto opposing Islamic immigration to Europe. To blame conservatives for Christchurch is now happening, is, uh, as is now happening, is as irrational as blaming socialist Democrats for communist mass murder. Apparent government sanctions to, the, to this left-wing exploitation of the Christchurch killing has abruptly tilted the Australian political landscape to the far left. It has created an atmosphere of fear and suspicion of anyone who dissents from politically correct left-wing orthodoxy. The idea that anyone with right-wing views might somehow be likely to undertake a similar attack to the de deranged 
psychopath, a psychopath in New Zealand is just absurd. It's sinister and Orwellian. That a supposedly liberal Prime Minister should, would buy into this extreme left-inspired witch hunt is frankly shocking and just shows how far to the left the Liberal Party has gone. However, what fair-minded Australian will find most offences offensive about Prime Minister Morrison's response to my comments and to his government's support of this censure motion is not simply the left-wing self-righteousness but the gross hypocrisy. This year the Morrison government is giving $43 million in aid to the Palestinian territories and another $50 million in aid to Pakistan, despite the fact that the Muslim government of both countries sponsors terrorist attacks on their neighbours. His government is giving nearly $100 million in Australian taxpayers' dollars to Muslim countries whose governments are killing innocent Israelis and Indians, and he has the nerve to condemn me. This censure motion against me is actually a reflection of the creeping neo-socialism that is gradually eliminating freedom of cons conscience in Australia. This government refused to replace Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, refusing to re rein in the commissars of the Human Rights Commission and now, along with Labor and the Greens, seeks to condemn someone by simply speaking the truth to power. Saying that, freedom, uh, that free speech is conditional on staying within the bounds that those in power stipulate, as Minister Birmingham said yesterday, is actually to say that there is no free speech at all. What is being censured here, censured here is not really me, it is the right of anyone to say something that those in power disagree with. If, a senator, if, as a senator, I am not allowed to express my views, what chance do everyday Australians have to say what they think? This le left-wing virtue signalling censure motion is also a metaphor for everything that is wrong with this government. Sir Robert Menzies would be rolling in his grave. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, if you ever wondered why this man should not be in this place and why this censure motion should go ahead, you've just heard it. You are a disgrace. And don't smile at me. Don't smile at the rest of us. People lost their lives. And you think it's a joke. You think it's a joke. What an absolute disgrace. He has no right to have the privilege to stand in this place and spout that hatred, that racism, to be an apologist for terrorism, for murder. He is not fit to represent Australians in this place. He's not fit to be able to stand here with the privileges that the role of senator comes with and feed hate, division and horror. We know where this leads because we've seen it. We saw it on the 15th of March in New Zealand. We know where it leads because we've heard the names of the 50 people who died. And to have, I'm not even going to call him Senator Anning because he doesn't deserve it. To have this man come in here and double down. He must be suspended. He does not deserve another moment of privilege in this place. He is not fit to represent the Australian people. He's not fit to call himself Australian. He is not us. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Um, I just wanted to get, get a few of my, of my thoughts on record today. We've talked a lot about, rightly so, about the role the polity has played, uh, this chamber, um, the other place, in the rise of the politics of division, hate speech, race baiting. I just wanted to comment a little bit on the role that the media has also played in this in this country. Now, it's quite clear from Senator Anning's statements from his first speech where he talked about the final solution in here that a policy adviser said to him, and these are Senator Anning's own words, that he needed something. He needed something that disgusting and that shocking to actually get his speech covered. 
in the media. Since I've been here, Mr President, I've noticed this trend towards outrage, towards shock. I noticed it with my previous Tasmanian colleague, Senator Lambic. She was one of the first people in this place to race bait, to talk about banning burqas and Muslim immigration. And I've just seen it degenerate over years. It's about getting a headline, it's about their personal gain, and it's about politics. And when I reflect on the role that the media plays in this, I, my previous leader of the Australian Greens calls the hate media in this country, and I will call it out. There are Murdoch, there are Rupert Murdoch publications in this country, like the Daily Telegraph, that everybody knows. Black and white have traded on dog whistling around Muslim immigration, around Muslim terrorism, around immigration, and so on and so forth. We've seen it in recent weeks with Sky TV. How do they get people to come in day after day, hour after hour, to sing off the same song sheet and say the same words about the Greens? How do these Murdoch mouthpieces operate so effectively in this country? Well, I'm sorry. We absolutely should be reflecting on the role the polity has played in race baiting and the rise of hate speech and ultimately the grooming and radicalisation of an Australian man who became a white terrorist. And I use those two words very carefully because they're often used in the hate media in discussions about Muslims. But this man was groomed and he was radicalised here and overseas and the, re the media played a role, an important role in that, Mr President. So while we should rightfully be reflecting on our role and how we can improve that and always call it out within our own ranks, it is absolutely essential that the media, especially elements of the Murdoch media, do exactly the same thing in this country. They need to be called out every time they race bait. They need to be called out for the role that they've played and they absolutely need to change that as well. Okay, now I'm going to put the motion moved by Senators Cormann and Wong. Um, I did have a request from a senator, Senator Bernardi, who's not in the chamber, to put Clause D separately. Um, I'll look to the clerk to see what I should do, given I've had the request but the senator's not present. Look, in deference, I will put, I will put the request separately. I have let Senator Bernardi know this is going to a vote now. Um, so the question is that the motion moved by Senators Cormann and Wong, um, notice of motion number two. Oh, here is Senator Bernardi. Paragraphs A, B and C to be put in accordance with your request for D to be put separately. Please acknowledge that. So paragraphs A, B and C of notice of motion two in the name of Senators Cormann and Wong. The question is that they be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I put paragraph D of that motion. The question is that that paragraph be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now move to well, Senator Wong. Uh, I think it might be a good thing for the record to note that no senator uh, voted against the operative censure provision in that motion. Yep, I heard no voice against clause D. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. President. May I record um, for the record that I was opposed to A, B, and C on that? So recorded. So we'll now move to notice of motion number three, in the, also in the name of Senators Cormann and Wong. Oh, also the clerk needs to call it on first. I'm afraid. Oh, Senator Burston, you're raising a point of order. Uh, no, just a, a quick. Um, for the record, I think it should be noted that One Nation abstained from that vote. Um, well, it wasn't a recorded vote, so it only reflects those who are in the, in the chamber. So I'll call the clerk. Government business notice of motion number three relating to gun control. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, and also on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, move the motion. All right, the question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Spender. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, you don't need leave. You can, this can be debated. And Senator also, Spender. I'm also seeking to have paragraph two treated separately from the remainder, if possible. Paragraph 
There's A, B, and C. You mean oh, B. A Roman two? No, B. Sorry, paragraph I think B. It's B. Okay. Yep, Senator Spender. Okay. This is not my first speech. Uh, this motion um, relates to the National Firearms Agreement. I can understand the widespread opinion that the National Firearms Agreement, known as the NFA, should be supported. But this motion goes beyond an expression of opinion. It asserts that the National Firearms Agreement has demonstrably made Australia safer. This is an empirical claim that is at odds with expert analysis. I quote Dr Andrew Lee, Labor's shadow assistant treasurer, who before becoming a politician was one of Australia's finest economists and statisticians. Dr Lee wrote, and I quote, time series analysis cannot conclusively answer the question of whether the NFA led to lower gun deaths." End quote. Senators are not here to follow groupthink. We should not say things that are truthy, things that we feel should be right. We should show some, show some leadership, which means being willing to state the uncomfortable truth. So, whilst I reiterate the widespread opinion that the NFA should be supported, this motion goes beyond that. It says that it has demonstrably made Australia safer, and that is at odds with the following quote from Andrew Lee, Dr Andrew Lee, Shadow Assistant Treasurer, which says, and I quote, time series analysis cannot conclusively answer the question of whether the NFA led to lower gun deaths. Let's have a commitment to truth in this chamber. Okay, so Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I rise on behalf of the Greens to um, support this motion. This is an important motion on an important topic. We need to remember that currently no Australian state or territory has fully complied with, national, with the National Firearms Agreement, which is completely unacceptable. There have been more than 50 breaches of the NFA since it was first implemented. There are more than 3 million licensed firearms in Australia, a rise of almost a million guns since the gun buybacks in 1997. I say that again, a million guns. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission estimates that there are more than 260,000 firearms in the illicit firearms market. We need to rekindle the kind of political courage we saw after the Port Arthur massacre and push back against any move to weaken our gun laws. Complacency is not an option. We have to remain vigilant and actively work to make sure our gun control laws remain strong and are keeping pace with the latest changes in firearms technologies. And I'm sure most people here have seen the Al Jazeera investigation that exposed Pauline Hansen's One Nation Party attempting to solicit donations from the American gun lobby the National Rifles Association, with the promise to try and weaken our gun laws. This should be extraordinarily alarming for each and every one of us. We know the gun lobby is becoming increasingly active in Australia in its push to weaken gun laws. A recent report from the Australia Institute found that Australia's gun lobby spent more per capita on political donations in one year than America's National Rifle Association did in 2018. Various Australian gun groups have donated 1.7 million to political parties since 2011. All political entities, I think, that have taken donations from the gun lobby should immediately return that money, and the Greens will ban all political donations from gun lobbies. The question is the motion moved by Senators Cormann and Wong be agreed to. I will put paragraph B separately in accordance with the request from Senator Spender. So the question is that paragraphs A and C of Notice of Motion 3 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now put paragraph B. The question is that paragraph B be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion number 4. 
standing in the name of the Minister for Finance and Public Service relating to section 44 of the Constitution. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator O'Neill. Leave to make a statement, Mr. President. Uh, you can debate this motion, Senator O'Neill, so you don't need leave to speak. Thank you. Uh, the opposition will be supporting this motion. Um, Mr. President, as senators would be well aware, the issue of Section 44 eligibility has plagued this parliament and our democracy. In May last year, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, JSCEM, issued their report on Section 44 and the issue of eligibility. Firstly, the committee recommended that broad constitutional change be considered to reflect the exclusionary consequences of Section 44 on our democratic institutions. However, short of constitutional change, the committee recommended the government investigate measures to mitigate the impact of Section 44 on the parliament. Importantly, the committee noted that the supremacy of the parliament and the High Court in these matters be respected. The Electoral Legislation Amendment, Modernisation and Other Measures Bill of 2018, passed through this parliament last year, implemented an eligibility checklist as a compulsory requirement for every person nominating as a federal candidate. This compulsory requirement is vital to provide faith to the Australian public that regardless of who they choose to vote for, these issues have been addressed in some capacity. The Australian Electoral Commission, in anticipation of a federal election being called, is already updating their process in response to this legislation. The motion before us ensures that the Senate can appropriately consider questions of eligibility in the future, complementing those measures introduced in the aforementioned legislation. The parliament has a responsibility to provide the Australian public certainty, and the opposition will support this motion to achieve this. I commend the motion to the Senate. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I move on to motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Clark, should I call you on or just deal with it myself? Clark. General business notice the motion 1430, standing in the name of Senator Wong, relating to racism, extremism and a hate speech. Senator Wong. Your motion number 1430. Apologies, Mr. President. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. This is number 1430. I move general business notice of motion number 1430 standing in my name for today relating to electoral preferences. And if I can uh, make a very short statement about it, this relates to the importance of putting One Nation and other extremists last on how to vote. Senator Rustin. I'd like to make a short statement. His leave, leave is granted for one minute. We agree that racism, extremism and hate speech has no place in our Australian democracy. However, it is not up to the Senate to dictate how political parties determine how they allocate their preferences. Electoral matters are the uh, for the determination by party organisations. The question is the motion number 1430 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. General Business notice the motion 1450, standing in the name of Senators Watts and Watt and Cameron, relating to budget estimates hearings. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I move General Business notice of motion number 1450, standing in the names of Senators Watt and Cameron for today, relating to the attendance of Minister Cash at the 2019-20 budget estimates hearings. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government opposes this motion because it contains a number of mistruths. Minister Cash has answered numerous hours of questions at several estimates hearings concerning the matter since October 2017 and has provided consistent answers throughout this period. She will again be at Senate of Estimates this Friday. The person who refuses to answer questions about this matter is Bill Shorten. He still needs to explain to the Australian people whether union donations to his own personal Order. campaign and to get up the Senator Rustin, authorised. please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of point order. Of order. The standing orders clearly go to the sorts of comments about a person in another place that the senator was making. I know that she's been given these talking points, but it is inappropriate to use a statement by leave to engage in a personal attack on the lead of the opposition. Senator Wong, it may be inappropriate, but I didn't detect a breach of the standing orders other than um, maybe the lack of use of a formal title for Mr Shorten. Um, leave was granted to make a one-minute statement, so I'm afraid that 
the statement was not out of order. Um, I will now um, put the motion. The question is that motion number 1450 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1450 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes and Senator Smith tell if the noes.
Uh, Senator Molan, can you please resume your seat? The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Storer, if you could move to your seat, I will call the clerk to call on the next item of business. 1446, standing in the name of Senator Storer relating to parliamentary transparency charter. Senator Storer. Uh, Mr President, I, I move the motion and I seek leave to make a one-minute statement and to table a document. Is leave granted to table a document firstly? Doc, um, I, you'll need to get the document to the whips for them to see it to get leave, Senator Storer. Is leave granted for him to make a one-minute statement? Leave is Thank granted you. for the statement. Thank you. Uh, public confidence in our federal pol politics is at an all-time low, with scandal after scandal involving corruption, misuse of public funds, political donations, unregulated lobbyists and attacks on whistleblowers. It's no wonder people are fed up. My parliamentary transparency charter aims to improve the integrity of of and public confidence in our national government. It represents common sense, achievable and deeply needed reform. Sixteen crossbenchers from both the House and Senate, representing different ideological backgrounds, have signed the charter and committed to pursuing its reform. The public should know who they are. Cathy McGowan, Andrew Wilkie, Adam Bant, Senators Griff, Patrick, Burston and all nine senators from the Australian Greens. If the crossbenchers can put aside our differences and recognise that this reform is needed in our politics, why can't the major parties? To be clear, this motion would pass if just one of the major parties voted for it. We would have the numbers. In the lead-up to the election, the public will know who in this chamber is committed to meaningful reform that will restore belief in our federal politics and who is not. I implore my Senate colleagues to realise that Senator Store, to time for the support of this motion. Has expired. Um, have, the whips, have you had a chance to circulate the document to the whips to seek leave? You can do that later by leave if you wish, Senator Stora. I will the, as the notice of motion um, itself. Then it will be recorded anyway, I think, Senator okay. right Stora. I'll put the motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Stora. Sorry? Oh, okay. Sorry, Senator Spender, I didn't see you. I've got a question from Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Senator O'Neill, you're um, seeking leave to make a short statement? I am, thank you. All right, I'll then come to you, Senator Spender. Is leave granted for one minute? It is. Thank you, Mr President. The opposition will not be supporting this motion. The opposition understands the intent of the motion by Senator Stora and his passion for parliamentary integrity. Um, that is why Labor is committed to establishing a National Integrity Commission, lowering the disclosure threshold for political donations to a fixed $1,000 and progressing real-time disclosure of donations. It's why Labor forced the government to ban foreign donations from our system and protect against foreign influence. However, this motion contains a number of provisions that require detailed policy consideration and consultation further uh, prior to introduction. As such, we will not be supporting this motion. Okay, Senator Spender, you seek Thank leave to make a short statement? I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave Thank is you. granted for one minute. Thank you. This is not my first speech. Um, there are some problems with Senator Storer's motion here on transparency. Firstly, it seeks to set up an integrity commission with public hearings. Public hearings aren't necessarily a good idea. They can involve uh, the chamber becoming a star chamber. Uh, there's technical 
technical suggestions about reducing thresholds for public donations. The main point to make about public donations is that parties' policies are on the public record and the voters determine which parties they want in this place. There is a suggestion for more funding for freedom of information. We don't necessarily know that we need more funding. There could be a need for a shift of funding. Uh, with regards to enhanced whistleblower protections, what particular enhanced whistleblower protections? Some whistleblower protections go too far. There is a suggestion that we need to control lobbyists more. Uh, lobbyists need to be able to communicate with the public, otherwise we all end up in one big echo chamber. And finally, the idea that we need a code of conduct for politicians. Voters are our bosses, no one else. Order. The question is that Senator Waters to make a short statement. Leave granted for one minute. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Look, I rise to um, just note and uh, welcome this motion. It consolidates probably 10 years of Greens' work on integrity measures. Um, we're in full support of all of the points in this charter. Um, and in fact, the, the ICAC uh, legislation was first proposed by uh, Senator Bob Brown in. Uh, 2009. Um, we welcome the fact that other parties have now, after many years of denigrating the suggestion, adopted it uh, as their own. And we certainly hope that many of these other positions are likewise. Uh, the other parties do a 180 degree and decide that it's their policy also. We won't, however, hold our breath on that. But I do just want to note that on donations, not only do we support the uh, lowering of the disclosure threshold, but actually we want to see donations capped by everybody. Okay, big money should not be running our politics anymore. This is not America. It is time for people in this place to represent their constituents, not their donors. The question is that motion number 1446 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1446 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Stora teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 44. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Di Natale, if I could ask you to take your place to move your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, I move uh, the revised motion as uh, circulated in the chamber. Um, Mr, uh, Mr President, um, uh, really important to get a few facts on the table here. I note there is some commentary uh, informed by your statement made today that uh, such a motion uh, may be unconstitutional. As, a, as I said earlier, uh, it's disappointing that that uh, commentary is now running and that your statement didn't refer to any specific motion that we were putting forward and that uh, it would have been helpful had we discussed the very uh, nature of our motion, because this motion uh, makes it very clear uh, that we are seeking a suspension of Senator Anning based on not just his efforts to attribute blame to the victims of the Christchurch massacre um, uh, outside the chamber, but indeed uh, his invocation of the final solution, something he did while he was in the chamber. Further, the motion has been revised to make it very clear uh, that it relates also to Senator Anning's response to the censure motion. I mean, his response to the censure motion only a short time ago further sought to blame the victims of that terrorist incident, further sought to vilify people on the basis of religion. I won't go into it, but when you have somebody talking about um, importing Sudanese migrants wholesale, which is a failed policy, or that uh, Muslim migrants um, 
are driven to violence, and that leads to increasing violence and terrorism here in Australia. That is the sort of uh, speech that deserves not just condemnation but uh, suspension. And so let us be clear on the first point, on that technical point. This Senate has the power to suspend Senator Annie. Uh, on the second point, on the second point, which is that uh, uh, we need to decide what standards we are prepared to accept in this chamber. Uh, let's be really clear. Uh, I was suspended from this chamber for calling out sexism. We are now saying that somebody should be suspended for the same period of time for their inflammatory and divisive remarks, comments that do amount to hate speech, comments that were made in this chamber. And if you ever needed proof for why a suspension is necessary, have a look at the response from Senator Anning to the censure motion. How seriously do you think Senator Anning has taken this censure motion? Indeed, we heard that horrific contribution from Senator Giorgio reaching out, reading out a prepared statement, effectively backing him in, not supporting a censure motion. Well, we need to go further. We need to make a clear and unequivocal statement. One and a half million people have now signed on to a petition to say, how on earth does this man get the platform that he has in this chamber? And many millions more Australians are asking the same question. Uh, Senator Bernardi, in his pathetic contribution to the debate, talked about hate speech and where do you draw the line. Well, I'll tell you where a good place to start is. When you talk about the final solution in your speech, how about we start from there? When you seek to blame the victims of a massacre, of a terrorist incident, how about we start from there? That's a good place to start. We are open to a debate about where you draw the line. Lines are drawn all the time through the course of the debate against the uh, amendments to the Racial Discrimination Act. On 18 c we made a clear-headed decision about where that line should be drawn. Some people wanted to shift it. Some people thought that people had a right to be bigots, but we were concerned that if you say that someone's got a right to be a bigot, it's only a small step to them acting on that bigotry. And the Australian community came together and said, this is where we want that line drawn. Well, they are coming together right now and they are saying to us, make a statement. Make a statement. Don't just use empty words, but act. You don't defeat fascism. You don't defeat the parliamentary representative of an emerging neo-Nazi movement by simply waving your hand and saying what they've said is bad. You do something about it. Now, we have the power to suspend Senator Anning from this chamber. We could kick him out for the rest of the day. That's all we're asking for. We have amended this motion to say that in the context of him using the final solution in the Senate chamber, in the context of his response to the censure motion, he deserves at the very least to be suspended from this chamber for a period of 24 hours. Let's not forget that only a short time ago this chamber voted to suspend someone for calling out sexism. How is it that we can have a set of rules that allow this chamber to call someone out, uh, to suspend someone for calling out sexism, and yet we haven't got the courage to come together and make a unified statement to say those views are not welcome on the floor of this parliament. This is a sacred place. We are elected here to represent the community. We've got our differences. Of course we do. We've got differences over the economy. We've got differences over how we address climate change. We have those debates in the chamber all the time. But the one thing, the one thing that unites us all is that we do not seek to use hate speech to divide our community on the basis of race or religion. We don't do that. That's not who Australia is. Well, how about this parliament makes a statement now? How about this parliament says to the one and a half million people who signed a petition given to Senator Faruqi to table in this place, how about we say to them, we're with them, not with One Nation, not with those other voices of hate. We are with the Australian community and we come together at this moment not just to wave our finger and say tut tut, but to take concrete action, to deny this attention seeker the platform that he craves. And we can do that right now. All it would take is a simple vote of the chamber, 
and he would be suspended. If that censure motion had any force, we would have seen some contrition from that senator. We didn't see that. We saw him double down. We saw him use the tactics of the NRA. When you're attacked, go on the offence, offence, offence. Well, it's about time that we, as a chamber, we, as parliamentarians representing the Australian community, say enough is enough. It's time to boot this bloke out. It's time for us to make a stand. Are there any further speakers? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Um, we, uh, the, the coalition, will be supporting Part A uh, for the reasons so eloquently um, presented by Senator Birmingham in his contribution uh, this week. But we do not support Part B of this motion for the reasons that were outlined by yourself, Mr. President. Um, because we do not believe that suspension is not the relevant sanction under these circumstances. So we will be seeking for uh, this motion to be divided and would ask that part A, 1, 2 and 3 be separated from part B. Sure. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I rise today to speak with a great sense of disappointment and a deep and abiding feeling of anger. I'm disappointed because, once again, we find ourselves here condemning the actions of one or two senators who have sought to use hate speech and the recent atrocities overseas to promote their divisive and dangerous political agenda. I know that these feelings of disappointment and anger are felt not only across the political spectrum in this place, but also in the hearts of millions of Australians who rightly expect better from their community leaders. Mr President, I would like to make clear that I and the entire Labor Party stand strongly and defiantly against the statements and actions of Senator Anning following the recent attacks on two mosques in Christchurch. We stand united against people who seek to divide our nation, particularly at a time when Australia is craving leadership, stability and harmony. And I acknowledge the important contribution of Senator Wong in articulating in her speech this morning the point of tension between celebrating the, use, the democratic freedom of speech and, its, and the right to that freedom of speech with a principled rejection of hate speech, because to do otherwise undermines our democracy. Mr President, I would like to state that the opposition uh, will not be supporting uh, this motion today, certainly not part B of it. So we've taken a position on this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the actions that this motion essentially seeks to address took place outside the chamber. Uh, it, it is a well-asserted principle that this chamber should act where breaches are committed inside the parliament. And I, I will take the interjection from uh, Senator Di Natale, who protests that in the shape that it's finally arrived here in the chamber at 11.45, after having not been shown to us in any form until after 10am 10, 10 this morning, has a, a modesty veil to try and pretend Order. that it's about action here in the Senate. But everybody knows that you are riding a, a wave of genuine anger across this community that we accept, but using a device that I think is quite deceptive. It was only a matter of weeks ago where we saw this very Senate vote to suspend a, mem a member of this place for words and actions that took place in this chamber. It was proper and appropriate action, but very different to the scenario that we have before us now. And I repeat that action was for behaviour inside this chamber, and that action is absolutely in accord with the rules and established practices that govern the Senate. Senator Di Natale has at the last minute informed the chamber that this motion is actually regarding comments made in this place. Well, I have to question the motives of Senator Di Natale. This motion could have been circulated to all senators in this place with an appropriate level of notice that afforded people the time to reflect on its content and make an informed decision. But he chose not to do that. In reality, the situation that's before us is that Senator Di Natale has only sought to bring this motion to the chamber today on the eve of an election and following comments made by Senator Anning in the wake of the horrific events in Christchurch. 
Senator Di Natale has said today that he moves to try and suspend Senator Anninger based on comments made in this chamber, but I don't think that is believable or credible to try to convince members of this place. Senator Di Natale had the chance, he had the chance to suspend Senator Anning at the time that the comments he refers to were actually made. He did not do that. Senator Di Natale had the chance at the time to take the level of action he believed necessary. He did not. So Senator Di Natale is within his rights to move this suspension today, but let's call it for what it is. This is a motion that he's chosen to raise in the aftermath of the New Zealand terrorist attack, and it is something that is seeking to, to deal with the comments and actions of Senator Anning in response to this horrific incident, which I remind him were made outside this chamber. Today we as a Senate have banded together to condemn Senator Anning. His comments and actions were deplorable and pathetic. He's seeking to capitalise on some people's darkest hours for his own political gain. We stand against these views and we stand against this man. We have done what the Australian people expect of us. We've defiantly voted to condemn Senator Anning to support harmony and unity over division and hate. Labor has taken our position on this motion that is before us right now because we believe that progressive voices need to be protected in this place. It would be a dangerous precedent to set, where suspensions of this nature become yet another political procedural tool to silence progressive views by conservative members in this place. I would warn those on the Greens bench who sometimes engage in somewhat radical political discourse and a lot of indignant posturing from setting a benchmark that they may well be unable to meet themselves. The motion the Greens political party have put before the Senate today is seductive. It appears on first glance to be a way to vent our collective disgust, a quick fix method to lance the boil that is festering in our nation in the form of Senator Annie. We all just want to be rid of it. 1.4 million Australians have let us know they feel the same. But, Senators, we should not let the seduction of the undertaking of such a cathartic action blind us to the risks to democracy that lie in following the path that the Greens political party lays out before us in the motion to suspend Senator Anning today. Mr President, as parliamentarians, we are certainly servants of the people of Australia. Every day we serve you, the people of Australia. And in this matter, can I say to the 1.4 million Australians who signed, we do hear you. But as we take our places on these benches, we must remember that if we're judicious, we will also hear the wisdom of those who have served here before us, and we will acknowledge established, tried and true traditions for the sustainable practices of the parliament. And I acknowledge, Mr President, your contribution this morning with, uh, to provide some clarity around that. We cannot act today with wisdom if we ignore the wisdom of those who preceded us in this place. And on the suspension of senators, their advice was well articulated by the president in his statement. We should not suspend senators except in the very specific circumstances that are identified for us clearly in Standing Order 203 and 204. Our actions today with regard to this motion have put it beyond this day and will fundamentally change the precedence of the Senate with regard to the suspension of senators. And if we overstep the mark, senators, what we do will likely be subject to legal challenge. I cannot see how that achieves the will of those who are rightly outraged by Senator Annie and yearn to see him gone from the political landscape. This parliament is one constant in a world of political turmoil that rises and falls like the tide across the history of this nation. The stability of the institution, its processes and procedures have, for the most part, served us well. This motion and its outcome is just not just a matter for today. This is not just a matter of great interest to those 1.4 million Australians who have asked us to suspend Senator Anning because of his appalling behaviour. It is of interest to every voting Australian. What we do today in this matter reveals to Australians the power of their vote. The power of their vote to determine who comes into parliament 
and if we reject the Greens' motion before us, reveals to them the enduring value of the vote of each and every Australian who accepts and enacts their rights and responsibilities as citizens to determine the formulation of our parliament. Our response today matters, and it shows to people that we get in this place who the Australian people vote for, and we're stuck with one another. Our determination today in this motion shows one of two things. Your citizen vote is very powerful and long-lasting in its impact. Or your citizen vote is an indication of who you want in the parliament, but senators can remove the people that you elect. I remind senators that despite the churning of senators we've seen through this place, and the as the implications of section 44 of the constitutional qualification washed through here, the elected government has continued to govern and the parliament has continued to function. Not particularly well, in my view, but it has continued despite that chaos. The stability of our parliament in the changing times is something of value we should consider here today. Mr President, Labor's decision on this motion before us has not been made lightly. This is a weighty and serious issue, and one that's been considered carefully and at the highest levels of the opposition. There's only been one occasion where this kind of action has been taken by the Australian Parliament, and that occurred in 1920. Mr Hugh Man was expelled by then Prime Minister Billy Hughes for his views on British policy and remarks about the monarchy and the British Empire. I should note the following changes to Parliamentary uh, Privilege Act. Neither House has the power to expel. However, given the outpouring of despair that we've seen reflected in so, by, in so many Australians asking us to suspend Senator Annie, it's warranted that we view the decision, like the one before us today, with considerable rigour. As a responsible party of government, we, the Labor Party, do not believe that behavioural conduct outside the Senate chamber should be punished in this way by the institution unless it complies with the standing Order. orders. What the Greens do today, seek to do today is to blur the boundary. They seek to assume a dangerous position of moral righteousness in the limelight of a looming election. Let's be clear. I understand that the Greens have a political purpose here today. I also acknowledge that the decision the opposition has taken today may well be used by our political opponents in the course of the upcoming election. However, unlike the Greens' political party, Labor are seeking the endorsement of the Australian people to form a mature and responsible government, a government that carefully ensures the value of each vote cast at an election is retained for the whole course of a parliament. Today, our decision is in keeping with those attributes. I would like to clearly reinforce that our decision to oppose this suspension motion in no way means that we endorse the views or actions of Senator Adding. His utterances and actions are disgusting. They are dangerous. They are quite plainly divisive and unworthy of a person given the honour and privilege of serving our nation in this parliament. Senator Anning's opinions that have surfaced in recent weeks have no place in our community, let alone here in our parliament, and the people will have their chance to speak loudly with their vote in just a few weeks' time. People with divisive views and extreme ideologies like Senator Anning, who have entered this place on the coattails of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, need to be sent a strong and enduring message. It will not be tolerated. And the Australian people need to stand ready to deserve to deliver that admonishment that Senator Anning deserves. Mr President, I, I had hoped that I wouldn't have to make a speech of this kind. I had hoped that some lessons may have been learned about the negative and dangerous impacts of hate speech. I strongly urge Senator Annie to reflect, reflect deeply about his views. They are completely at odds with any civilised notion of humanity. But we are a strong community. We are a proud multicultural nation. We are a tolerant an open-minded society that warmly embraces different cultures and religions. We can clearly say today that this Senate condemns you, Senator Annie. 
We condemn your actions, we condemn your words, and we condemn your attempts to divide Australia. I say to Queenslanders, use your vote, reject this man and any others of his kind. The power of the vote of Australians is firmly in the hands of those who have the right to determine the character of this place. I have confidence in the Australian people. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr President, I didn't really want to speak on this motion because Senator Di Natale has very eloquently expressed um, the views of the Greens, including mine, but I just feel that I can't remain silent um, after that speech by Senator O'Neill because we do need to respond to some of the comments that she has made. And the first one is um, that this motion actually asks for the suspension of Senator Anning based on his comments outside of this chamber and that procedurally that's, um, that can't happen, which is an inaccurate statement. If Senator O'Neill reads the motion, it very clearly says that it is also about invoking the final solution while speaking in the Senate, which do not reflect the opinions of the Australian Senate. We, the Greens moved a motion. Order. The Greens moved a Senators motion at that time. And the Greens moved a motion at that time to you censure you Senator you Anning, which both the Labour Party and the Liberal and National Parties voted down. So please don't stand here and tell us that we didn't do anything at that time. We did. And this is a pretty straightforward motion. Even if you saw it five minutes before, which you didn't, you, you can exactly see what it says. So again, don't come and stand here and tell us, oh, we didn't give you enough time to look at this motion. This, and, you know, and I do have to say something about your, uh, Senator O'Neill's... Senator O'Neill. Senator, Senator O'Neill, you were heard in silence. I do want to also um, talk about Senator O'Neill's accusations that the Greens are doing this because of some political uh, imperative. This is completely and utterly about a moral imperative, Senator O'Neill, and you know that. So standing up here every time and criticizing the Greens, whether you actually agree with us or not at this time, that's the political imperative that you have. That's what you're trying to do. We have been standing here strongly for years against racism, against xenophobia, no matter which community it is done against, or no matter who spouts that language. And that's what we are doing today. So if you have any guts to both the Labour and Liberal parties, you know, stand with what you are saying, what you were saying yesterday and what you've been saying this morning. You know, just don't talk the talk, walk the walk. This motion is about suspending a senator who stands in here, spouts fascist speech, hate speech, you know, stands out there as well, doing exactly the same. So walk the walk. This is a suspension. This is not about a democratic thing of who have elected politicians. If politicians talk, spout hate speech in here, then we have every right to suspend them for a day. You have done this before. You have done this for Senator Richard Di Natale, who was actually standing up against sexism. Surely you can do it for someone who has racist, bigoted views and who spouts them in this parliament. Senator Cameron. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Um, this is not about the Greens. You know, this is about racism. This is about a situation where we could have this society deteriorate to the same situation as we have in the, in the worst areas of the United States. And for the Greens to stand up here and do as they always do, that they are purer, that they are better, that they have got all the, the knowledge and all the wisdom is just another example why you will never get more than 7, 8, 9 or 10 per cent of the voting public in this country. Because you just don't get it. You want to turn this into a, it's about you. And it's not about you, it's about making this place a better country. 
And I'm just sick and tired of the Greens at times getting up here when we could be making you know, clear and unequivocal statements about where we head as a nation. The Greens suddenly turning it in to a political position to try and promote their deteriorating electorate position in this country. It's just disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Now, we had an opportunity today to be a, a, a combined Senate, a Senate that was dealing with the issues, but you couldn't let that go. I've watched you now for 11 years. It's always about the Greens. It's always about some political advantage, and it's just not good enough today. You should have actually accepted that the Senate was certainly uh, c considering this in an appropriate way, had made the appropriate points, but not good enough for the Greens, not pure enough for the Greens. And Senator Di Natale, you know, if you could get your own house in order, then you might have some credibility when you come in here. You might have some credibility. But the Greens political party's got no credibility. If you could just get your house in order, then maybe someone would take you seriously, because no one does at the moment. Order. If there being, order, if there being no further contributions, I am going to make a contribution, as I indicated earlier. Order. Senator Di Natale, you made the observation earlier that you would have appreciated my advice earlier. Um, I was at no point given a draft motion about suspension um, at any point over the last um, while this has been subject to public debate, and I thought it appropriate to frame the debate in the Senate given the public commentary about that. But at no point was I given advance notice of a specific motion or term of motion. I made, I made, sen sen Senator Di Natale. I listened to you during. I listened to you quietly. You could return some courtesy. Um, at no point was I given a draft motion. I therefore thought it appropriate, given the public commentary, to outline with the advice I had taken from the clerk on the powers of the Senate. Now, my statement earlier today confirmed to this matter confirmed the ability of the Senate to suspend a senator, senator in relation to disorder in the chamber. I don't believe the conduct outlined in this motion reprehensible though it may be, meets the test that has been set for a breach of the standing orders or disorderly conduct. I also think it clearly does not meet the test that I outlined earlier, the statutory test of, a, of contempt. Senator Di Natale, you referred to the period where the Senate suspended you. You were suspended for a refusal to respect the authority of the chair, not for the comments that you made. And it is unfair and unreasonable and incorrect to conflate the two incidents. Standing orders can always be amended to create further notions of disorderly conduct. That is within the power of the Senate. But the conduct outlined in this motion, to my mind, does not meet the test of disorderly conduct. This isn't a debate about accepting or otherwise what Senator Anning said. The Senate has, in my view, rightly expressed its view earlier today that those comments are inappropriate, appalling, reprehensible, divisive and utterly unrepresentative of the Australian people we represent. Respectfully, Senator Di Natale, opposing this motion does not mean that I or any other senator is with those who express such views, and I think it is unfair to characterise opposition to Clause B of your motion in any such way. Furthermore, I don't agree that, to use a phrase I think you did, if the censure had more force, or you did allude to those terms, we wouldn't see this senator doubling down. I've made the observation before that I think it is a sad element of modern politics that some seek attention through outrage. I firmly believe to suspend a senator on these terms when it is not a formal breach of the standing orders and disorderly conduct and does not meet the test of contempt would be a bad precedent and would be a further step down um, a political path I don't think this chamber should represent, and I don't think this chamber, when it's at its best and represents the views of the Australian community and a deliberative approach to politics, um, should seek to represent. I'll therefore divide the question according to the request of Senator Rustin. The first question is that Clause A, Romans 1, 2 and 3, but all of Clause A, moved by Senator Di Natale, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it, and I'll also note there were no dissenting voices. The question is now that Clause B be agreed to. 
Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that paragraph B of the motion moved by Senator Dinatali be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What teller for the ayes and Senator Ketter teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 40. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I ask you to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions unless there's a realignment of the chamber. I'll ring the bells for one minute. We will now proceed to further motions pursuant to the order adopted earlier today, and I will call the clerk. 1428, standing in the name of Senator Griff relating to the order of production of documents. Senator Griff. I move general business notice of motion number 1428, standing in my name for today, concerning an order for the production of documents relating to the universal service obligation. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Sorry? Uh, sure. Senator Rose okay. leaves granted for one minute. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, I only saw you go through one motion. So, um, it's all good. The government has decided that the universal service guarantee will retain the current universal service obligation arrangements until a more cost-effective arrangements are identified that are not in any way a detriment to services. This requires careful work to build upon the government commissioned report of the Productivity Commission. The current arrangements for voice services and payphones will be retained because they are important to regional and rural communities. There is scope to carefully examine payphone locations, particularly given the strong uptake of mobile services, and the government will undertake further work in this area. Releasing the high-level cost modelling of the universal service obligation reform options and the cost implication impacts on NBN Co of servicing additional ADSL costs could significantly compromise any future negotiations with industry over the future delivery of the voice payphone broadband services covered by the USG. This is seen as a real, not hypothetical risk. Undermining the Commonwealth's future negotiating position would have the contrary effect to the notion in motion's intent of advancing Order. USO Senator reforms Ruston, the time and achieving the long has expired. We'll move to matter number of the clerk to call on the next matter. General business notice of motion. 1429, standing in the name of Senator Griff, relating to the introduction of a bill. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Act 1987, and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read at first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff. I move that this bill be now read a second time, oh, sorry. and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. My apologies. I forgot to get the clerk to read the title of the bill. I'll ask her to do that now, then I'll take your motion. The clerk. Sorry, the bill had not been walked over, hence we. You, John. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Act 1987 and for related purposes. My, my apologies to the attendants. I'll call Senator Griff again. Uh, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. No, the next one, Senator Griff. Okay, I Sorry. move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek to seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Griff. I table an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and can, to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Griff. Clark. General business notice of motion number 1443, standing in the name of Senator Patrick, relating to AFL women's competition. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, before moving this motion, uh, I'd like to the name the, uh, add the names of Senator Wong, Farrell, Ruston, Birmingham and Griff to this motion. So added, Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr. President, I move that general business notice of motion number 1443, standing in my name, my name and the names of Senator Wong, Farrell, Ruston, Birmingham, and Grift, uh, today, uh, relating to Australian uh, Football League's uh, women's competition. Uh, you move, move the motion. The question the is motion. that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. General business notice of motion number 1444, standing in the name of Senator Patrick, relating to a Murray Darling Royal Commission. Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I move general business notice of motion number 1444, standing in my name for today, relating to the Murray Darling Basin. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much. 
I seek leave to make a short leave statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. We, uh, we've seen one of the worst summers on record in parts of the basin and horrific fish kills. There's been report after report into the basin and the fish kills by the Productivity Commission review on the, of the implementation of the basin plan, uh, the South Australian Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission, the Academy of Science review into the fish kills and the review commissioned by the minister to the fish kills. But the government seems intent on doing nothing. Labor is committed to helping our rivers and restoring the basin plan. We've already introduced a bill to repeal Bunaby Joyce's 15, um, uh, 1,500 gigalitre cap on buybacks. And in addition, we've committed to requiring the Basin Authority to update the science, an urgent review of climate change impacts on the basin now and into the future to determine any change in inflows and evaporation rates, urgently renegotiating the Menindee Agreement, which determines how the lakes are managed, restoring the current socio-economic test for delivery of the 450 gigalitre through on-farm infrastructure projects in the basin. Labor will continue to stand up for the environment Order. and protect Senator the Murray-Darling Basin. Senator O'Neill, time for the statement has expired. Qu Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Adding uh, to Senator, Senator O'Neill's uh, comments, uh, there are a number of things that are in the plan, uh, such as uh, 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 supply measures, constraints, efficiency measures, and we need to be very aware of the fact that uh, uh, the Productivity Commission, in addition to the, the South Australian Royal Commissioner, has indicated that these are highly risky, highly ambitious projects, and uh, so, so the Labor has moved a, 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 or has introduced a bill to uh, uh, remove the 1,500 um, uh, gigalitre cap. What's wrong with having tools in the toolkit of government uh, that allow us to manage our, our river properly? And I uh, ask everyone to support this motion. Question is, Senator Hanson Young. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Um, I obviously, and the Australian Greens support this motion as put forward by Senator Alliance. So I just want to place it on the record. While the National Party continue to control the water portfolio, we will never get this river fixed. While Barnaby Joyce continues to funnel uh, the taxpayers' money into the pockets of his big corporate cotton grower mates, we will never be able to save this river. If we're going to save the environment, if we're going to return the water the river needs, we have to kick out the National Party and get their hands out off our Murray-Darling Basin. Senator Spender. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. There should not be a further 450 gigalitres sent to South Australia, given their mismanagement of water to date. South Australia has misused water. They have used water to basically turn a salt water system into a freshwater system. They are saltwater lakes, not freshwater lakes. South Australians have misused water, sending fresh water to the Coorong when it would be uh, when what the Coorong should be watered by is water that is otherwise sent to the sea by the South East Drainage Scheme of South Australia. And South Australia have also misused water merely to keep the mouth of the Murray open. To send 450 gigalitres to South Australia, the only way you could do it is by ignoring the humans further upstream. Humans are a part of nature. They should not be ignored. Senator Rustin. I'd like to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. I would not have made a statement on this particular motion. However, the comments that I have just heard from Senator Spender um, uh, require a response. To suggest that South Australia has been misusing its water when South Australia has had a track record of responsible and efficient water management over the entire duration that the Murray-Darling Basin has been operating under an irrigation system, I think just reflects the fact that you have absolutely no idea about the operation and management of our river system over the last 100 years. South Australia has never breached its cap. It has never exceeded its limit. It was an early adopter when it came to efficient irrigation practices. We are regarded as world's best practice. And for you to stand there and suggest that in any way that South Australia has mismanaged, misrepresented or in any way not achieved its obligations and met its obligations under a responsible river management just shows your complete ignorance and misunderstanding of river management. The question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, that concludes the formal motions that were determined this morning as part of the order. I'll call the clerk to call on, call on government business. Government business order of the day number one. Appropriation Bill No. 3 2018-2019, Appropriation Bill No. 4 2018-2019 and Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2 2018-2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cameron. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, this package of bills is required to ensure the ordinary functions of government continue for the remainder of 2018-19 financial year. The bills appropriate a total of around $3.3 billion in the 2018-19 financial year. This amount is already incorporated into the budget bottom line as presented in the 2018-19 MAIFO. Labour will not block supply. Despite all their talk about being better economic and fiscal managers, debt is at record highs and growing under the Liberals. Net debt has more than doubled on their watch and is now a record $368 billion. Gross debt has crashed through half a trillion dollars for the first time ever in the country's history and all on the Coalition's watch and has reached a record $543.3 billion. Both kinds of debt are growing faster under the Liberals in rosy global conditions uh, than under Labour, which had a global financial crisis to contend with. Scott Morrison and his Liberals have no one else to blame but themselves for their record and growing debt. In the last year alone, the Liberals have blown $200 million on political ads to distract from their cuts and chaos and the division and dysfunction that has consumed this rabble of a government. And every week, the government spends $100 million on cash refunds for excess franking credits for people who don't pay any tax an unsustainable tax loophole that the vast majority of Australians don't access. The budget is a mess and debt is at record highs because of the Liberals' twisted priorities, including giving unsustainable tax breaks to those who need them least and spraying around hundreds of millions of dollars on political ads. Scott Morrison and the Liberals aren't managing the economy on the budget or the budget in the interests of ordinary Australians. Under the Liberals, the economy is not working for all. Everything's going up except people's wages. A strong economy needs a stable government. The Liberals are so divided, so dysfunctional, so much of a rabble that they can't manage themselves. Five years of the Liberals' cuts and chaos have damaged the economy. Under the Liberals, wages growth is the slowest on record. Childcare costs are up 24 per cent, power bills up 15 per cent and private health care costs up 30 per cent. Company profits are growing six times faster than wages. Can you believe it? Profits up six times faster than wages. 1.8 million Australians are underemployed meaning they can't find enough hours at work, and living standards are stagnating and household debt is at record highs. The Liberals' only plan have, have been cuts to Medicare, cuts to schools and massive tax cuts to the banks. Labour has a plan to give all Australians a fair go, not just the banks in the top end of town. We'll pay for our plan by making multinationals pay their fair share of tax, closing loopholes mostly used by the top end of town and not giving the big banks a tax cut. We have a fair go action plan to fix our schools and hospitals, ease, pressures, ease pressure on household budgets, stand up for workers, invest in cheaper, cleaner energy, 
build a strong economy that works for all. Our Fair Go Action Plan fixes schools and hospitals, delivers bigger tax cuts for workers and puts money back into the pockets of everyday Australians. That's a good for the whole economy. Labour has led the way when it comes to budget repair and we will continue to display the fiscal and economic leadership the government has been incapable of. The budget that the, uh, the coalition brought down last night fails to reverse cuts to schools and hospitals, fails to reverse cuts to TAFE and apprenticeships. Uh, in the past six years, the Liberals have cut $3 billion from TAFE and skills and cut 150,000 apprenticeship places. Promises a surplus that is subsidised by shortchanging people with disability through a massive underspend in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The budget also confirms that the economy is not working for everyday Australians. Everything is going up except wages. Wages growth has again been cut. Economic growth is slowing, downgraded from my EFO. Household consumption is down, downgraded from my EFO. The, the budget confirms net debt has more than doubled under the Liberals' watch. That's nearly $15,000 for every person in Australia. After doubling the debt, their promise to pay it down is laughable. The Liberals will say anything over the next six weeks to cover up for six years of cuts and chaos. Labour will support the tax cuts that begin on 1 July for working and middle class people. This is essentially a copy of what we proposed last year, and they are simply catching us up. Now, a shortened Labour, go Labour gov government through our Fair Go Action Plan will fix our schools and hospitals ease pressure on family budgets, stand up for workers, invest in cheaper, cleaner energy and build a strong economy that works for all of us. We will pay for it by making multinationals pay their fair share and closing tax loopholes used by the top end of that town. Bill Shorten and Labour will deliver a fair go for all Australians, not just the top end of town, and the sooner the, the Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, calls a, 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 an election, the better, because the sooner we get this rabble of a government out of the government benches and into opposition. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'm glad I got to hear Senator Cameron say the word rabble one last time. Not sure if he'll be able to squeeze it into his valedictory speech this afternoon, but I suspect he will be able to. Um, this is the seventh budget that I've been involved with for the Greens. And while budgets have a lot of information, there can be a lot of detail out there, they're actually quite simple at the end of the day. Budgets are a plan. They're a plan for a government seeking a mandate from the Australian people. And it, they're a document that outlines the priorities of a government. And that plan then supports the government's priorities. Well, I would say, Acting Deputy President, this government's budget has no plan and they've got all their priorities wrong. My predecessor in this place, Senator Bob Brown, used to say a good policy is a policy that's good for your grandchildren. Well, I look at the budget and I look at the lack of vision, the lack of planning, the lack of strategic foresight in this budget, and I really am concerned, Acting Deputy President. While there might have been a surplus, a fistful of dollars, a surplus on a one-off windfall gain from mining revenues for our exports, there was no surplus of good ideas in this budget. There was no surplus of big ideas. There was no surplus of reform in this budget. What mandate exactly is the government achieving? Because let's be completely honest, this was one of the most unique budgets, if not the most unique budget in Australian political history, because it was announced just days before a federal election. Now that's never happened before. So make no bones about it, last night's budget 
by the Treasurer was the beginning of their election campaign. And what mandate exactly are they seeking from the Australian people? What is their plan? What is their vision? More cash splashes? Spending money from an unsustainable one-off budget surplus, the first surplus in many, many years? Where's the reform? Well, there's one reform that the media is talking about this morning, and that's their reform to the Australian tax system. But what exactly is that? It's making a flat tax system less progressive in this country. It is making the rich richer at the expense of the poor. Whichever way you look at it, wealthy Australians will benefit the most from these changes. How is that tackling one of the great challenges of our time? Inequality. How is that dealing with long-term planning, helping a social safety net, investing in the countries down and out and most unfortunate? How is that planning for a future for our kids? This budget robs from the future of our children to give to potential voters for the Australian Liberal Party, Australian National Party. That's what this is. These are election bribes designed purely to get the Liberal Party re-elected, to hang on to power at all costs. There's no vision in this budget. There's no plan for the Australian people. The only plan is to get the Liberals re-elected. I've tallied the so-called surpluses, which, by the way, have been questioned by a lot of good economists as to whether there actually really will be a surplus over forward estimates. And when I say forward estimates, I mean the next three years. I've tallied those, those surpluses based on last night's figures, and they're about $45 billion. And I look at the, the tax cuts and the potential savings from opposing those, and I say, if we had $65 billion, because that's what they add up to, if the Greens had $65 billion, let me tell you, Acting Deputy President, what we would spend that money on. That is reform. That is a plan for the Australian people, and that shows some vision. We would give higher free education to all Australians. We would increase New Start for the country's battlers who are doing it tough. We would put Denticare under Medicare, and we would build 500,000 new homes for Australians, because we desperately need public housing in this country. And lastly, and possibly most importantly, we would transition this country to 100 per cent renewable energy, and we would have money left over. We would be tackling inequality head on for increasing public housing and making education more affordable for young Australians. We would be tackling inequality head on by raising New Start. And we would be tackling arguably the greatest existential crisis we face as a country and a nation, which is our climate emergency. We've got no time left to fiddle around the edges. I spoke in here yesterday about my experience being down at Cape Grim at the, within 24 hours of Mr Turnbull calling the double dissolution in 2016. Now, Cape Grim is on the northwest of Tasmania. And by coincidence, within 24 hours of the double dissolution being called, the weather station there, one of two on the planet, had measured carbon dioxide in our atmosphere at 400 parts per million. It was a very ominous beginning for that election campaign. And I stood on the beach with a placard, 400 parts per million, and I did a short video urging as many Tasmanians as possible to make this a climate change election. We have to make this a climate change election. This was a line in the sand we didn't want to cross. But even though, Acting Deputy President, I'm a Green senator and I feel deeply about these issues and I've been fighting for decades for the environment and for climate. Even though that is the case, I can tell you, looking back now, standing on that beach, I could never have imagined how bad things have got in our climate. I could never imagine that very year we would see the worst mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. I could never imagine, and nor could any of our climate scientists, some of the best in the world, whose models predicted it wasn't possible 
until 2050 to have back-to-back -back bleachings on the coral reef. I could not have imagined that the following year that would actually happen and we would lose nearly half the Great Barrier Reef. I could not have predicted that Tasmania's giant kelp forests would disappear in 2016. The last of a 10,000-year-old ecosystem that spanned the entire east coast of Tasmania. I couldn't have predicted that we would break every weather record possible in this country in the last three years. We would see fires burning in the middle of winter in New South Wales in unprecedented levels. We would see our world heritage areas burning three out of the last five summers, areas that haven't seen fire for thousands of years. This has all happened in the last three years. And what do we get in this budget? What do we get in this budget? What's in this appropriation bill before us for climate change? Senator Di Natale said today that this government is spending more money on setting up Christmas Island as a detention centre than they are for the entire 15 years of their plan for the environment and for climate. The Greens have announced a climate fund. We've announced an environmental fund to fund new laws and properly fund threatened species recovery plans and the agencies that are necessary. Our commitment is at least 10 times what the government has outlined, just on forward estimates. That's the quantum of funding we need if we are going to have policies that are good for our grandchildren. A good policy is a policy that is good for your grandchildren, not a one-off cash splash on the back of an unsustainable budget surplus. That is not a good plan. This government has got its priorities totally wrong. There's no forward thinking here. This is a budget to get the Liberal Party re-elected. We desperately need to change government. We desperately need to get a serious action on reducing emissions, investing in biodiversity, investing in the future of our grandchildren. And the Greens will be going to this election and we will do everything we can. We will do everything we can to make this election about climate because I look back on 2016 and while I felt like I did everything I could, I failed in my state to make it a climate election. I'm not going to make the same mistake twice, Acting Deputy President, because based on the current parts per million out of Cape Grim, we've got less than 10 years to go before we hit 450 parts per million, which every scientist recognises is runaway climate change. It's, it's too late. That's going to happen in the next decade based on our current emissions trajectory. It's not going to happen on my watch if I have any say in the matter, Acting Deputy President. And I know I speak on behalf of my party who raised this issue first in parliament in the 1990s. We will continue to fight to get climate action and we will continue to fight for whichever government is in power to get a proper plan funded through a budget, funded through appropriations such as we have before us today, to actually make, take meaningful action, take the strongest possible action, because there's no point in talking about jobs and growth and whatever it is that is sprouted by the ideology of this Liberal National Party. There's no point in talking about it if we don't get the climate settings right. It's all going to be undermined in the future. Inequality, threats to national security, it's all there if we don't act on climate. It is what this budget should have delivered and it has failed miserably to deliver on climate change. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I thank uh, senators for their contribution. I particularly enjoyed uh, Senator Wish Wilson's, if I were Prime Minister one day, uh, contribution. Uh, it would have been helpful if he'd shared uh, some of the other Greens policies, such as their plan to introduce death taxes, dismantle the US alliance, deindustrialise the economy, uh, allow you know, illicit drugs to be made freely available, open the borders. Uh, we didn't get all of uh, the, 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 the Senator Wish Wilson vision for uh, if the Greens were in charge, but uh, it is a scary thought nonetheless. But uh, I digress, uh, and I could for, for the edification of Senator Wish Wilson in relation, in relation to what we've gotten before us, uh, appropriation bills three and four, 
Uh, they pertain to the mid-year uh, update, not the budget. Bills three and four work the same way they do every year, and nothing has changed about them this year. But I would like to thank senators uh, for their contribution to this debate. These additional estimates, appropriation bills, seek authority from the parliament for the additional expenditure of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Passage of the bills will ensure continuity of government programs, commencement of new activities agreed by the government since the 2018-19 budget and the Commonwealth's ability to meet its obligations for 2018-19 as they fall due. Details of the bills were considered in the additional estimates process. But in summing up, I would like to highlight some of the particularly important, uh, imp important areas relating to delivery of these, the government's commitments that are supported by these bills. First, the bills include, uh, the, su include support for the Royal Commission's aged care quality and safety. Second, they provide assistance for farmers and farm communities in drought. Third, they include additional funding for the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. Finally, they deliver critical enhancements to the security infrastructure of Australia's overseas diplomatic network. Once again, I thank all senators for their contribution and commend these three bills. The uh, question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2018-2019. Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2018-2019. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2018-2019. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I should call the minister to move the third reading. Uh, thank you. I, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2018-2019. Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2018-2019. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2018-2019. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2. Advances provided under the Annual Appropriation Acts Report for 2017-18. Senator Cameron. Thanks. I'll be very brief. Uh, Labor supports the passage of these bills. We will not block supply. That's the next one. Oh, sorry. I... Senator Cameron. I, I don't have a contribution on this. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I... <laughs> we, 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 the contribution will come. You can bet on it. <laughs> OK. Uh, Minister. Uh, I move that the Senate approves the advances provided under the Annual Appropriations Act as final charge for the year ended 30 June 2018. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. This report discloses details of one advance released under the Annual Appropriation Act to enable an urgently required funding allocation to be issued during the year. The report was tabled in February and considered in the estimates process. Following reports of the Estimates Committees, the Senate now approves the report consistent with long-standing Senate practices. In the 2017-18 financial year, the one advance issued was an amount of $122 million provided on 9 August 2017 to the Australian Bureau of Statistics to conduct the Australian Marriage Law Postal Survey. The report shows that the final expenditure required for the marriage survey was $80.5 million and on 15 January 2018 access to the underspend of $41.5 million was withdrawn. This report shows that efficiencies were achieved by the ABS working in partnership with other Commonwealth agencies and leveraging off existing statistical infrastructure. Costs relating to the marriage survey were one off, so there is no risk of similar recurring spending pressures. The one advance in the 2017-18 year was unique in that it was subject to two legal challenges. The High Court upheld the validity of funding for the marriage law survey, ruling against every aspect of the legal challenges. The limited number of advances in 2017-18 and in previous years under this government reflects well on our responsible financial management, which has allowed other urgent and unforeseen pressures arising out of outside the budget cycle to be managed within existing appropriations. I commend this report to the Senate. You. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Zazelja be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day relating to Supply Bill No. 1, 
Supply Bill No. 2, 2019-2020, Supply Thank Parliamentary you. Departments Bill No. 1, 2019-2020, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Thank you. Senator Cameron. Yes, I'll, I'll do the same again. I've now got dynamic red opened up. Uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Labor supports these bills. We will not block supply. Thank you, Senator Cameron. <laughs> Senator Macdonald. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. In uh, uh, supporting these supply bills, uh, I wanted to say a few words uh, uh, about the uh, budget last night and uh, budgets uh, over the time that uh, I've been in this chamber. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in my 28 years uh, in this place, this is uh, one of the better budgets uh, I've seen, if not the uh, best. And I've had the privilege to hear uh, many of them from the uh, Hawke and Keating uh, days uh, uh, through the uh, wonderful Howard years and then the Gillard, uh, Rudd, uh, Gillard, Rudd, Gillard, Rudd uh, years. And then in the last six years, under the leadership of uh, Tony Abbott, uh, Malcolm Turnbull and now uh, Scott Morrison. But we've had some very, very good treasurers and uh, I do want to congratulate uh, uh, Mr Frydenberg uh, on the budget he presented uh, last night as he was uh, uh, willing to acknowledge uh, what he was able to do last night to a great degree, depended on the work of uh, previous treasurers. Uh, in particular, uh, Mr Morrison, who was Treasurer for several years uh, in the um, most recent coalition uh, government. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, this budget is full of benefits for Australia and Australians. And um, it, uh, uh, it uh, has wonderful news uh, for infrastructure, building the infrastructure of the uh, future. And it shows that the uh, government uh, does understand the significance of the agricultural and mining industries. They're well recognised in the uh, budget. And there is in this budget as well an attempt to try and bridge the gap between what I often call these days as the two Australians. Uh, those who live in the capital cities and their surrounds and the rest of us who live in regional Australia. And there's no doubt about it, uh, never has been in my mind, uh, that uh, those of us who live in regional Australia don't have the uh, access to all of the uh, qualities of life, the things that make life so pleasant uh, for people who live in and around the capital cities. And good luck to those who live in and around the capital cities. And might I also say uh, that uh, I, for one, uh, wouldn't want to live in capital cities. I'm very happy living in regional Australia. But there are uh, things, um, uh, benefits that those living in regional Australia don't have simply because of their isolation and the sparseness of our uh, country. It's always been my goal to try and bridge that gap and uh, I'm pleased to see the uh, budget uh, last night has taken some steps uh, uh, towards that. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, for 28 years since I've been in this place, I've been trying to return the zone tax rebate scheme to what it was um, originally in designed to do back in 1946 when it was uh, first uh, introduced. And I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, just this year, uh, the government and the Treasurer has instructed the Productivity Commission to start work on that zone tax uh, rebate scheme because it to a degree was designed to and did sort of <coughs> equalise the disadvantages that uh, people have living in remote parts of our country. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, it's been my lifetime goal and certainly the goal during my time in this parliament to ensure that that part of Australia, which with only 5% of the population produces something like 55% of its export uh, earnings is recognised and rewarded. I'm pleased to say that uh, the Northern Australian Development White Paper, uh, which is something that uh, uh, was introduced in 2015, but it's something that I've been working on 
uh, since my days as the Minister for Regional Services, Territories and Local Government uh, all those uh, years ago. And it came to fruition in 2015 and since then the, uh, the measures in the white paper have been implemented and it has seen a flow of money and activity and action into Northern Australia and it's a, uh, an activity and an action which I hope will continue in future parliaments uh, uh, of this uh, nation. I'm pleased to uh, see uh, in the budget the continuing flow of money to our external territories, which I became very fond of, if I might say, uh, in my uh, years as Minister for those territories. And curiously, a lot of the uh, money that in the budget is going to the territories is for things that we spoke about uh, all those years ago, at the beginning of this century uh, when I was Minister, which regrettably haven't advanced much since that time. Um, Mr Acting um, Deputy President, uh, at the, uh, as uh, someone who was four times elected as a local government uh, councillor, I've always had a soft spot for local government, uh, not only uh, as a councillor myself uh, uh, for 11 years, uh, but also as the Federal Minister for Local Government uh, for three years. So I was pleased to see in the budget last night the extension of the greatly loved by local government Roads to Recovery program, which sends money direct from the uh, Commonwealth to local governments, avoiding uh, state uh, governments, uh, the middlemen who always used to slice a bit off the top, meaning less for local governments. That program I was uh, very proud and honoured to introduce in this chamber uh, back in um, 2004, I think it was, uh, and it's been a program that local government has benefited from, and indeed the Australians we all serve has benefited from uh, over those uh, uh, years. Unfortunately, uh, local government didn't get uh, what they were hoping for with some uh, movement upwards in the financial assistance grant scheme. That's a, uh, a, uh, a, a program, a, a goal, a, a determination they have, and uh, I know that that campaign uh, will continue on uh, into the future, and I wish them luck with it, because I, for one, recognise that local government, as the sphere of government closest to the people, uh, is the one that uh, is often overlooked in our uh, system of uh, uh, government, and I do think they do a wonderful job and perhaps uh, do need uh, funding uh, increases uh, through the financial assistance grants and otherwise. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, can I also note that in the uh, uh, budget uh, money was continued uh, to be provided for our fishing and our forestry industries and for uh, conservation, uh, that part uh, of uh, our uh, operations that looks after uh, our land, our landscape. And I'm pleased to see uh, funding continuing uh, there. I well remember how important the forestry industry was to Australia, and perhaps I remember even more so uh, that uh, forestry paid a very large part in the 2004 election, when the Labor Party, the Greens, and uh, dare I say, most of the Liberal cabinet ministers uh, wanted to cease forestry operations. Uh, but uh, working with the CFMEU, dare I say, uh, and uh, Michael, uh, O'Connor, the uh, current head of the CFMEU, who was then the head of the uh, Forestry Division, we worked together for months, for months, to get the right program. And uh, those of you who were around in those times will remember Mr Howard uh, went to a hall in Lost Launceston, was absolutely mobbed by people with hard hats and, and high-vis uh, shirts. And not only did that mean we won considerable uh, most of the seats in, in uh, Tasmania in that election, but as well it showed workers around Australia which party it was that looked after workers' jobs. And so it was a very, very significant uh, part of the forest industry uh, debate uh, at the uh, time. I also uh, see that we are continuing in this budget to look after our southwest Pacific uh, neighbours and neighbours in Papua New Guinea. And that reminds me, as uh, Fisheries Minister, 
Uh, we did a lot of work uh, not only with the Australian uh, fisheries and fishermen trying to make them sustainable and uh, competitive, but we did a lot in the uh, Southwest Pacific. And uh, I was delighted to be involved as fisheries minister in the establishment of the uh, uh, Central and Western Pacific uh, Tuna Commission, uh, which got the island states to recognise the value of the fisheries they had to then start organising them and regulating them. And I was at, led a delegation to Kiribati uh, not uh, long ago, a uh, little island state, uh, you know, sort of a coral atoll almost, uh, had uh, used to have difficulties uh, uh, paying its way. Uh, but since, uh, with Australia's help, they regulated their huge sea boundaries and were able to sell licences they now run their budgets in surplus and have been doing for some time. And again, that's something we as Australians can be very proud of in the way that we help those island states to look after themselves. Uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, I also uh, see in the budget uh, some money for our natural resource uh, managers. Uh, as in my time as uh, Minister, we were able to establish for the first time those natural resource management groups all around Australia, which did wonderful work. They're not quite as uh, uh, prominent or active these days as they were in those days, uh, but it is good to see them still operating and still doing the right thing uh, by our land and seascapes. Mr Acting Deputy President, in uh, congratulating Mr Frydenberg uh, on last night's budget, I also recognise that we, uh, as ministers, as parliamentarians, uh, whilst we get uh, a lot of the uh, credit, uh, a lot of the work is done by people who work for us, be they uh, in the departments, in the case of uh, ministers, or be they our own uh, personal staff. And so, in congratulating the Treasurer for uh, his uh, budget, uh, I also acknowledge that a lot of the work uh, that uh, Mr Frydenberg relied upon was done by his own personal staff and uh, so I acknowledge them and also by uh, people in the Treasury and other uh, government departments and I want to congratulate them and thank them all uh, for the work they uh, have done. Uh, in mentioning this I uh, also mention my own staff who have always uh, helped me so much in everything that uh, I've attempted, from my very first staff, Zania, Guy and Leanne, uh, through to my uh, current staff, uh, led by uh, my long-term employees, Mari and, um, and uh, James, <coughs> and other staff uh, uh, which I've uh, had. And on the way through, I've met some wonderful people, some very, very good staff who've gone on to bigger and better things, uh, mentioned Phil Canal, uh, Lisa, uh, and uh, Sharon, Liza and Sharon, and uh, it, it's, it, I think it's appropriate at times that we do recognise the people who support us and look after us. And that of course goes, Mr Acting Deputy President, to people uh, who support us in this chamber, the attendants, the clerks, uh, all of their staff, the committee staff, uh, who do a wonderful job in furthering the uh, work of Parliament and of uh, parliamentarians. I should mention, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, last night's budget uh, was a good one for the North, uh, and whilst I take some uh, pride in uh, what has been achieved, I also recognise that I don't do this uh, alone. I do it, as I've mentioned, with my staff, but also my colleagues. I particularly want to mention the help that uh, my friend and colleague Warren Inch, the member for Leichhardt, has been over most of the years I've been in Parliament, and also my colleagues uh, who operate out of, uh, who have operated out of Townsville in the past. Uh, since I've been uh, in the parliament uh, working from Townsville, I've had Peter Lindsay, I've had Ewan Jones, uh, and uh, I will uh, in the future have uh, Phil Thompson, I'm quite sure. And those people, uh, along with George Christensen, the member for Dawson, whose electorate now comes right in to, almost to the heart of Townsville, uh, together we formed a group that has made its presence felt in uh, Northern Australia and as a result there have been benefits. And some of the things that we're determined to achieve uh, into the future is more jobs, more security of jobs for coal miners and others in the mining industry and the small business that supports them. And I desperately hope that we can uh, see Adani uh, start work, the uh, Reinhardt uh, coal fields, 
uh, all of those uh, activities which will provide real jobs, secure jobs for workers and uh, will support the, uh, the uh, uh, small business, uh, medium-sized businesses in the north uh, that support those uh, industries. Uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, um, last night's budget, as I say, was one of the best I've seen, and I've seen a lot over the last uh, 28, 29 uh, years. Some have been very good. Uh, I heard uh, Mr Swan deliver six budgets, I think it was. Each, bu each budget he promised that next year we would be in surplus, and not once did he deliver a surplus. And uh, so I'm delighted to see this year, in my 29th year in this parliament, uh, a budget that has brought the country back into uh, surplus, brought the budget back into surplus and got the uh, country back on track. And with projected surpluses uh, into the future, we will be able to start paying off uh, the debt run up in the labour years uh, and the 80, get rid of the $18 billion we pay uh, every year in uh, interest rates on um, borrowings that uh, previous governments have made. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I have been in public life for 40 years now, 11 as a councillor and uh, almost 30 as a, um, a senator in this parliament, nine of those uh, as a minister. And in that time, um, uh, I've helped uh, to shape some budgets back in the old days and have uh, made my voice felt in more recent budgets. But um, it's not again me. Uh, uh, we only get here, we as parliamentarians only get here because of friends and supporters. And I do want to mention uh, some friends of mine that have uh, helped me all of the way through my life and for anything I may have achieved, uh, they have uh, been part of them. That's Peter and Lorraine, Tony and Janita, uh, Neville and Elvy and my Burdekin branch of the Liberal Party. And um, also, of course, my family, my siblings, uh, Faye, Beth and Jim and their, their families as well, all of whom have been particularly helpful. In the 28 years I've been there here, uh, uh, things have changed, budgets have uh, uh, hopefully getting uh, better again. Um, I, I don't like to say, but uh, it's true that uh, this place is not the place it was when I first came here 20 years ago. There is more nastiness, more division, uh, more politics uh, being played uh, now than I recall when I first uh, came here. And lies and hypocrisy just seem to be the order of the day. Uh, I mean, what really distresses me is uh, where people get up and lie about things, and those lies are heard the world round and believed. And uh, comments uh, like, uh, regrettably, we just heard recently about the Barrier Reef being dead, are just plain outright lies, and yet they are heard around the world, and they do affect jobs, uh, they do affect businesses uh, in Australia. And it seems to be now that uh, facts and truth are irrelevant in some of the debates here, and uh, people have the, uh, uh, the tendency just to say whatever they would like things to be and try and make them out to be facts. But apart from that, um, hopefully uh, in the end result we all do come here to try and uh, uh, make a difference, and uh, hopefully we all do make a difference in one way or another. Uh, for the betterment of Australia and all Australians. Uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, there uh, was in the budget good news for lots of people, uh, uh, not so much good uh, news I, I guess for uh, uh, some others, uh, but I do see uh, there is uh, increased funding for the aged and that's perhaps something that I might be uh, interested in in a few years uh, in advance. But I just do uh, want to uh, uh, recognise that in electing me to Parliament and even to Council, my constituents got good value for money because they really got two for the price of one. And uh, I have to mention that um, my wife Leslie has been my greatest supporter all the way through my, through my life and particularly in my uh, political life because uh, she, uh, she's the first sounding board, uh, she gives me lots of thoughts, she encourages me, as I'm sure all of our spouses and partners do. And uh, I particularly want to uh, pay tribute to Leslie and the work uh, that she has done uh, for me over the years.
Thank you. Before I go to the minister, uh, Senator Macdonald, thank you. It's not very often we hear first readers tangled up with a valedictory note as well. So congratulations. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you. And uh, in summing up, can I uh, take the opportunity, I'm sure, on behalf of all colleagues, and particularly colleagues uh, in the Liberal and National parties, uh, to very much thank you and honour you uh, for your 40 years uh, of public life, uh, Senator Macdonald, uh, for uh, your almost 30 years uh, in this place. That is a rare achievement. Uh, I myself can't imagine still being here in another 23 or so years, but uh, to have achieved that is something that can never ever be taken away from you. Uh, and there is no doubt that both your supporters and your opponents uh, would agree that you are someone who fights very, very hard uh, for the things you believe in, including uh, the regions, uh, Queensland, uh, North Queensland in particular, uh, and you fight hard for really important industries in our nation. You mentioned some of those, uh, and you've been someone who has never taken a backward step. Uh, I'm sure that Senator Cameron and Senator Wong will particularly miss you and your contributions during question time uh, and others uh, and we will well, and, and, and indeed and indeed uh, and uh, whilst there are great challenges ahead may, may, may your contribution in this place continue for a long time but I want to thank you for your service uh, Senator Macdonald and uh, thank you for your great contribution and to Leslie uh, and all of your supporters thank you thank you very much uh, can I uh, can I uh, conclude and thank all senators who have contributed to the debate on the supply bill number one 2019 2020 supply bill number two 2019 2020 and supply parliamentary departments bill number one 2019 2020. These supply bills seek authority from the Parliament for the expenditure of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the 2019-20 financial year. The total of the appropriations sought through these three supply bills is just under $45.7 billion. The bills must be passed in this session to ensure funding is available to all entities from 1 July 2019, thereby ensuring the continuity of program and service delivery. The appropriations proposed in these bills are based on five twelfths of the estimate, estimated 2019 annual appropriation as presented at the 2018-19 budget, adjusted for economic and program specific parameters. And the effects of decisions announced as part of the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook or included in the 2018-19 additional estimates appropriation bills. Therefore, this funding will last through until the end of November. I wish to emphasise that these bills seek provision only to appropriate money to fund government expenditure on an interim basis until appropriation bills have passed. This arrangement allows for the budget appropriation bills or similar bills to be passed in 2019-20 by the next parliament if necessary. Once again, I thank all senators for their contribution and commend these bills to the Senate. Now, before I uh, uh, put the question, Minister, if the Senate could just spare me a minute, Senator Cameron. I, Chair, I was just going to seek, yep. seek leave to make a, yep. a brief statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So, yeah. So, um, uh, could I just uh, indicate that uh, it did seem like a valedictory uh, speech uh, from Senator Macdonald. Senator Macdonald and I have got uh, a long history uh, in this place, as long as I've been here. Uh, could I just indicate that he is the ultimate liberal warrior? There is no question about that. Um, I think at times he's been cantankerous, he's been curmudgeonly, uh, he has, but he has always ran, ran the liberal line. And I wish him and Leslie all the best for the future. I don't want him to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Cameron. And yes, the uh, Senate will be poorer without the Cameron Macdonald blues. But anyway, <laughs> now, Minister, I believe no, the question no, was I'm, put. I'm, put oh, the question. Sorry, I, yeah, no, no, it's quite all right. Yep. I just wanted the question to be put. But anyway, we'll take it as being put. The committee. Oh, sorry, the question is that the bills now are be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Supply Bill No. 1, 2019-2020, Supply Bill No. 2, 2019-2020, Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2019-2020. Thank you. Now, um, we want to read them a third time. 
Okay, so I'm just going to put it now that the uh, question is that the bills now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Supply Bill No. 1, 2019-2020. Supply Bill No. 2, 2019-2020. Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 1, 2019-2020. Government Business Order of the Day. Social services, social services Legislation Amendment, Energy Assistance Payment Bill 2019. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Services Legislation Amendment, Energy Assistance Payment Bill 2019 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the bills now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. Yeah, I just have it, Minister. No, sorry, Clark. Clark. Sorry. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The question is that it now be read a second time. Those are the Oh, sorry, Senator Cameron. Yeah, uh, you thanks, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, yesterday, uh, Labor circulated a second reading amendment for what we expected to be an earlier version of this bill to the House crossbench, proposing the government should expand the payment to those on New Start, youth allowance, and other payments. Never in our wildest dreams did we anticipate it would be so successful so quickly. Labor called on the government to extend the one-off payment to other people on means-tested income support, including AB study, OS study, double orphan pension, new start allowance, parenting oh, payment, Clark. partnered, partnering allowance, sickness allowance, uh, special benefit, win widow allowance, wife pension, youth allowance and veteran payment. Of course, it was good to see that this bill has been changed, but it seemed that even the Treasurer was taken by surprise. On Nine News last night, when he was asked directly about extending the payment to people on Newstart, he didn't say yes. He said, and I quote, well, Newstart does go up twice a year. It's indexed. But importantly, the majority of people on Newstart move to another payment in or move into off new start within 12 months. They hopefully go into work, and many have been doing that." End quote. But it was a totally different script this morning. The Treasurer told ABC Radio, this is uh, Josh Frydenberg, well, a couple of things. Firstly, the energy supplement, supplement will be extended to people on new start. Sabra Lane said it will be. Josh Frydenberg said it will be. What a turnaround. This budget hasn't lasted overnight. It didn't last from late line to lunch. Uh, this just shows you how bad this rabble of a government is. An absolute rabble of a government where the Treasurer, the Treasurer can't even get his budget to hang in overnight. What a rabble! What a terrible government! You are terrible! You need to go quickly. You should go to an election soon and let this government, let the public determine that this rabble won't last any longer. You are pathetic. You can't, they are a rabble. That's what they are. They know they're a rabble. Look at their heads hanging their heads in shame. The budget doesn't last overnight. You are a pathetic joke. A pathetic joke. An absolute rabble of a government. You must go, go quickly. Go order, quickly. sorry, point of order, Senator Cameron. Oh, point sorry. of order, Senator Bernardi. I've been waiting for 30 seconds to pull a point of order on Senator Cameron, the last one in this place. It's just to reacquaint ourselves with old friends. We'll move to questions without notice. Oh, sorry, Senator Cormann. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today due to illness. Uh, in Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Centenary of Anzac, and the Minister for Emergency Management and North Queensland Recovery. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. In last night's budget, the Treasurer delivered a once-off energy payment which left out thousands of Australians who rely on AB study, Oz study, double orphan pension, New Start allowance, parenting payment, partnered parent allowance, sickness allowance, special benefit widow allowance, wife pension, youth allowance and veteran payment. On what basis did the government think those supporting these government payments were not deserving of support? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Services and Families, Senator Fifield. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the uh, government is uh, aware of the financial uh, pressures that are placed on households, uh, which do make it harder for many Australians to pay their bills, especially those receiving uh, income support payments. Uh, the government has uh, taken the decision uh, that around five million income support recipients will receive uh, this energy payment, uh, including uh, those on the age pension, the disability support pension, as well as other working age benefits, including New Start and Youth Allowance. Uh, we are in a position to offer this support uh, because of uh, strong economic management. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Um, this is indeed uh, an example of the fact that uh, pursuing uh, good, strong economic management and a responsible approach to the budget is not uh, an end in and of itself. Uh, it has meaning uh, as far as it provides the opportunity for government uh, to assist members of the community who need it. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the government uh, absolutely um, uh, puts its hand up and acknowledges uh, that uh, we have taken a conscious decision uh, to make uh, this payment available for those on Newstart as well. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. I don't know if you answered my first question, but um, on radio this morning, less than 24 hours after he delivered his budget, the Treasurer caved into pressure from Labor and backflipped, saying that Australians on Newstart would now receive an energy payment. Can the minister confirm that this change was agreed in a crisis meeting between the Prime Minister, Treasurer and Finance Minister last night? When was the minister first advised of the change? Before or after the budget speech? Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister don't have crisis meetings. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, they conduct uh, the administration of, uh, of government uh, on, a, on an orderly Order. uh, and methodical basis, uh, as you would expect. Uh, but, uh, but, but, Mr President, uh, what we wanted to ensure was that uh, this measure uh, secured swift passage through the parliament order. so that Senator it could— Fyfield, um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. The question is, when was this minister first advised of the change of the, to the budget? Um, when was the minister first advised of the change before or after the budget speech? Um, Senator, Senator Wong, you, you rightly remind the minister of part of the question. I consider him to be directly relevant to the other part of the question at the moment. Senator Fifield, are you concluded your answer or continuing? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue, uh, Mr. President. Um, as, I, as I was saying, um, we wanted to ensure that this important measure uh, had swift passage through uh, both chambers. Uh, we did not want to uh, allow those opposite uh, a reason, a rationale, to delay or prevent the passage of this measure. Uh, so, through the decision the government has taken, uh, there will be more support, uh, and I'm confident uh, that this chamber will support the passage of this legislation. Order, Senator. Order. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm the government's backflip less than 24 hours after delivering the budget has blown an $80 million hole in it? And isn't it clear 
that with the budget unravelling, this is a government in crisis, continuing a sixth year of chaos and division. Senator Fifield. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, what I can absolutely confirm uh, is that uh, what this government has done is uh, deliver a budget that will see a surplus uh, for the first time since. Well, we'd have to go back to when Mr. Costello was the treasurer of this country. Hey, Mr. Mr. President, there used to be there used to be a rule. I'll call it the Costello rule where the former Treasurer said that for each year of bad Labor government you would actually need three years of good coalition government to undo the damage. Well, what order, this government has Senator demonstrated Fyfield, is order, we can— Senator Fyfield, order. I will call Senator McAllister on a point of order when there's silence. Senator McAllister. My point of order is relevant. So I ask for a confirmation of the cost of this backflip, and that's yet to be provided. Um, you've reminded the minister of part of the question. I'm listening carefully. He has 23 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Fifield. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. So, as I was saying, um, this government has demonstrated that within six years uh, you can actually repair six years of damage done by Labor. We have got the budget back in balance. Obviously, there's still the work to do to pay down the debt of those opposite, and we will. Order. Order. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. How does the Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy, as set out in the 2019-20 budget, provide the opportunity for hard-working Australians to get ahead? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think it's time to remind the Chamber again that when we came into government in September 2013, uh, the economy was weakening, unemployment was rising and the budget position was rapidly uh, deteriorating. Today, the economy is stronger, employment growth is much stronger, the unemployment rate has got a four in front of it, and of course, we've got the budget back in a strong uh, and improving position. In fact, we've got the budget back in the black. Now, what a stronger economy delivers is better opportunities for families to get ahead. Of course, the opportunity to get a job and get a better job. Of course, uh, it, also means, it also means as more people are employed, uh, that government collects more personal income tax revenue without the need to increase taxes. More people paying tax means more revenue for government without the need to increase taxes. And you know what the government can do in that circumstance? We can cut taxes. We can provide income tax relief to encourage and reward and incentivise hard-working families across Australia, as well as funding all of the essential services across health, education, uh, you name it, that Australians rely on. Because, of course, when Labor was last in government, they had made such a mess of the budget that made such a mess of the budget in the context of a weakening economy, rising unemployment and a rapidly deteriorating budget position. You know what, you know what happened under Labor? You know what happened under Labor? They stopped listing essential medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Order. On the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Now, this government, this government under our period in government, on the back of a stronger economy, on the back, on the back of uh, expenditure, con more effective expenditure control, on the back of managing the budget better, we are actually able to invest in providing affordable access to high quali quality medicines for all patients across Australia. 2,000 medicines listed uh, during our period in government at a cost of about $10 billion. These are the sorts of things that a good government can do that manages the economy properly, that manages the budget properly. Uh, this is, of course, not the time to change direction and go back to the discredited Senate, labor order, way of Senator the past. Coleman. Senator Hume, yeah. a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. How does the Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy guarantee the essential services that Australians want and expect? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, President, and as I was just indicating, our economic plan has made it possible to deliver the more and better services Australians deserve. More medicines on the PBS, more access to quality health care, secure defences, less congested roads, a new inland rail network for Eastern Australia, and a new Western Sydney airport breaking a deadlock that had eluded successive governments for decades. But we're not complacent about the need to continue to build a stronger economy, which is why, of course, we have a plan for stronger growth, 
another one and a quarter million new jobs over the next five years, a plan that will drive stronger wages growth across the economy, and it's a plan that is based on rewarding aspiration, rewarding enterprise and effort. And that is why, of course, in last night's budget, the government also announced more tax relief for small and medium-sized businesses. We want small businesses to prosper. We want them to employ even more Australians and pay them better wages. That is why we need to ensure they can be as successful as they Order. possibly can. Senator Cormann. Senator Hume, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. How will Australians be safer and more secure under a Liberal National Government's plan for a stronger economy? And are there any alternate approaches? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the impact of alternate uh, economic approaches is entirely predictable. And there's no question that if uh, Mr Shorten was successful at the next election, it would make our economy weaker, it would make our country weaker, it would make Australians poorer. Uh, a shortened Labor government would take us backward. Higher unemployment, weaker growth, lower living standards and a budget mess. Uh, Mr Shorten, of course, sneers at those who want to get ahead and only promises them a higher tax burden. I mean, he's already said, he's already said people, uh, aspirational middle class Australians, do not deserve tax breaks. That is what Mr Shorten, that is what Mr. Shorten says. If you buy an investment property to, to secure your family's economic future, the Labor Party will uh, have their hand in your pocket. If you buy some shares for your retirement, the Labor Party will have their hand in your pocket. If you try to build a nest egg to pass on to your kids, the Labor Party will have their hand in your pocket. I mean, it is, the Labor Party does not know how to manage money. When they run out of money, they come after yours. That is the message to the Order, Australian people. Senator Cormann. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. In 2018-19 financial year, the Coalition Government oversaw a $3.4 billion underspend in the NDIS. In la last night's budget, it was revealed that in the 2019-2020 financial year, the Morrison Government is banking a $1.6 billion underspend in the NDIS. Can the minister confirm that this means 77,000 people will miss out on the NDIS this year alone? The minister representing the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Fifield. Sa thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, and can I say, as a former Minister for Disabilities, how disappointed I am that those opposite who know full well how the NDIS operates are seeking to create a problem that does not exist. The NDIS is operating under this government exactly as it would operate under those opposite. Uh, Mr President, uh, Order. the NDIS is fully funded under this government and will continue to be fully funded under this government. Uh, funding for the NDIS is like many programs within government, Mr. President, it is a demand-driven program. NDIS estimates are updated up or down at every budget, as they would be under those opposite. Uh, the NDIS uh, estimates are updated up or down at every MAIFO, as they would be under those opposite. NDIS estimates are updated up or down at every final budget outcome, as they would be under those opposite. Mr President, the NDIS is a program which is in transition. Uh, we are transferring from a state-based system to a national system. People are progressively moving from their state-based arrangements to the NDIS. There are now, I would hope all colleagues would be pleased to acknowledge, more than 250,000 Australians who have a disability who are benefiting from the NDIS and 78,000 of those are people who are receiving supports for the very first time. Everyone, everyone who is eligible for the NDIS, who has transitioned to the NDIS, will get the support that they are entitled to. They will get the support that they deserve. Uh, for those opposite to portray the usual process of estimates uh, being adjusted uh, as something uh, strange and unusual is quite, quite wrong. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In response to the re revelations, Kirsten Dean of everyone, Every Australian Counts has said that, and I quote, it is completely unacceptable to leave people with disability waiting two years for a wheelchair while you bolster the budget bottom line. End quote. Is Ms. Dean wrong? Senator Fifield. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I know Ms. Dean uh, very well, uh, and she has done an outstanding job uh, advocating for Australians with disability. Uh, and I think uh, many colleagues in this place uh, have uh, worked uh, with uh, Kirsten Dean. Uh, but, uh, Mr. President, it is completely and utterly wrong for those opposite to contend and to purport uh, that there has been funding cut from the NDIS. That is not true. Uh, all funding that is available, um, all funding that is needed uh, by uh, NDIS participants will be forthcoming. There will not be uh, anyone who requires support uh, under the NDIS who does not receive that support. Every eligible person for the NDIS uh, will receive the support to which they are entitled. Those opposite should know better than to seek to cause fear and distress amongst people with disabilities by misrepresenting, by misrepresenting Order, the way Senator that the Fifield, works. time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. What does it say about the priorities of the Morrison government that it's willing to use a $1.6 billion underspend in the NDIS to prop up its budget's bottom line? Senator Fifield. Mm. Uh, well, Everything that Senator Brown just said is wrong. Uh, Mr President, um, I had hoped that if there was one area of policy where bipartisanship could be maintained as we head into a, an election, that it would be the NDIS. I would have hoped that those opposite, rather than seeking to cause fear where there is no reason for fear, would actually be part of helping to explain the way that the budget processes operate and helping to explain to Australians with disability, their families and carers that there's nothing to worry about, that the NDIS is fully funded, that everyone who is entitled to an NDIS package will receive their full package without any deviation. Uh, Mr President, it is extremely disappointing that those opposite can't raise their sights, can't raise their sights on this issue. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the people of Australia are ready for strong action to stop our climate breakdown. They are desperate for some leadership and vision. Minister, how on earth do you explain why your government has spent more on opening and closing Christmas Island over the last four weeks than you will spend on climate change over the next for years. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, you know, this government is absolutely committed to uh, strong, effective and appropriate action on climate change, uh, including uh, through our $3.5 billion climate uh, change uh, package. And of course, and of course uh, you know, what, what, you, uh, what I'm sure you would uh, remember is that when we came into government in 2013, you know what the situation was in terms of meeting the Kyoto Protocol targets uh, by 2020? We were 755 million tonnes of CO2 behind. 755 million tonnes of CO2 behind. And that was after a six-year period of a LIBOR Green government. Now, I know, of course, that the uh, Green uh, part of that uh, government uh, was uh, not so supportive of LIBOR's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And, and you know, I can understand that. I had a lot of sympathy for that at the time. But you know, what, you know where we're at now? After six years of Liberal National Coalition government, we are now running 367 million tonnes of CO2 ahead of our 2020 emissions reduction target. And we have a clear plan uh, to meet the 2030 emissions reduction target that we've signed on to uh, in Paris, the 26% emissions reduction target. But you know what? The Liberal National Party will always uh, pursue environment, sensible environmental uh, yeah. policy in a way that is economically responsible. Uh, you can go uh, to your supporters and uh, you know, continue to try and make them believe that you can shut down the economy, that you can shut down the economy and that that is a sensible way to go. That is not the way we're doing it. We are, we are telling the Australian people very, very openly and very transparently that we want to do the right thing by the environment, meeting our emissions reduction targets that we've committed to, but in a way that is economically responsible because we want families around Australia to continue to have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, we're facing a climate emergency, and yet over the next four years you're committing $189 million for your so-called climate solutions package, 
yet you're spending 174 times more than that, a staggering $33 billion to pay massive mining companies to burn fossil fuels. How on earth do you justify that to the Australian people? Senator Cormann. Well, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The, pro the problem with socialists is that they don't understand the difference between spending money and raising less in revenue out of the economy. Now, and I wasn't reflecting on the Labor Party. I, know, I, I heard that Senator uh, Wong uh, might have been getting a bit sensitive there. When I say socialists, I mean those green socialists at the bottom of the uh, Senate chamber over there, at the corner of the Senate chamber over there. Now, now let, let, me, let me just make it very clear. Uh, when, the when the government raises less in tax out of the economy, that is leaving business and Australians with more of their own money. With more of their own money. Now, and you're obviously talking about the fact that in relation to road user charges, uh, that businesses that don't actually use roads are not required to pay road user charges, which is of course an entirely reasonable thing to do. I mean, if you use roads, you pay road user charges. If you don't use roads, you don't. That is sort of what we believe in on this side of the chamber. And of course, we do believe in stronger economic growth. Order, Senator more Cormann, jobs, time for the answer has expired. The Senator Cormann. Order. Order. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, since 2012, uh, the coalition's received $4.7 million from the coal, oil and gas industry. Uh, given last night's budget sellout on climate, can you fill us in on a figure that wasn't in the budget papers? How much money do you expect to get in donations from the coal, oil and gas industry to fund your election campaign and to continue selling out Australians when it comes to action on climate change? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. Order. Order. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business, Skills and Vocational Education, Senator Cash, who recently visited a number of small businesses in Launceston with my, our Liberal candidate in Bass, um, Bridget Archer, and myself. How will the Liberal National Government's budget benefit our nation's 3.3 million small and family businesses and their 5.7 million employees? The Minister for Small and Family Business, Skills and Vocational Education, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for the question, and I acknowledge that it is her first question, and congratulate her on that. Colleagues, as we know, last night's budget, the Treasurer yet again overwhelmingly affirmed the coalition's commitment to small and family businesses in Australia. Why? Because we know that small and family businesses are the engine room of the Australian economy. When small and family businesses in Australia grow, Mr. President, they create more jobs for Australians. Last night was a vote of confidence in small and family businesses across Australia. In particular, as you are aware, we increased the instant asset write-off from $25,000 to $30,000, and we extended it out to the 30th of June 2020. But, colleagues, because of the strong economy that we have put in place, we were also able to uh, increase the threshold, Mr. President, from businesses with an annual turnover of $10 million or less to medium-sized businesses. We've expanded it to medium-sized businesses with an annual turnover of $50 million or less. Mr President, that is what you get when you put in place a strong economy. You can give back in particular to small and medium businesses in Australia. And Mr President, on that policy alone, it will benefit around 3.4 million businesses, employing around 7.7 .7 million workers. And, Mr. President, of course, this comes on top of our tax cuts for small uh, businesses, which we are able to fast track again because of the policies that we have put in place that have given us a strong economy. These tax cuts, Mr President, will see small businesses in Australia, small and medium businesses, paying 25 per cent by 21-22. Again, you back small and medium business, you create jobs Order. for Australians. Senator Cash, Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Minister, why is supporting small business so important to ensuring continued economic growth and returning the budget to surplus? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we all know, 
When small and family businesses in Australia prosper and grow, they create more jobs for Australians. When we were elected to office in 2013, we said to the Australian people, we will put in place the economic framework so that businesses in Australia can create jobs. And Mr President, that is exactly what we did. We said we'd create a million jobs within five years, and we did that ahead of time. Under the coalition government, the Liberal National Government, the economy has created almost 1.3 million jobs. And Mr President, we have now been able to make the promise that if we are re-elected, we intend on ensuring we put in place the right policies so that businesses out there can prosper and grow and create a further 1.25 million jobs. Mr President, last night's budget was the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan, which we intend to deliver for the betterment of Order, Australians. Senator Cash. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Minister, what are you doing to ensure that Australian small businesses are getting the skilled workers that they need to continue to prosper and grow? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, a big feature of last night's budget was a more than half a billion dollar investment in skills for today and for tomorrow, because we understand that businesses need employees with the right skills. And one of the big announcements in last night's budget was that we will invest in 80,000 apprentices. That's right, colleagues, 80,000 apprentices across Australia in areas of skills need, because we want to put in place the right policies, look at where the skills are required and ensure that businesses, but in particular, Mr President, small and family businesses have access to the skills requirements that they need. And Mr President, as part of our investment in excess of half a billion dollars, we're also going to ensure that those who are recently unemployed do have access to the foundation schools that they need to ensure that they are able to fully participate in the workplace. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Defence Industries, Senator Payne, and relates to local content in the Future Submarine Program. Estimates questions on notice have revealed the following. A total of $1.9 billion in contracts has been awarded for the Future Submarine Project. Naval Group has been awarded two substantive contracts, uh, totalling just over a billion dollars, for design work to be predominantly carried out in France. Australian entities have been awarded uh, $834 million in contracts, but Defence has advised that only 67 per cent of that money uh, is being spent on uh, local content. So we've got $1.9 billion worth of contracts that have been awarded by the Future Submarine Project, but only $569 million has been spent on local content. That's about 30 per cent. What explanation does the government have for dropping this figure from originally 90 per cent, announced by uh, Minister Pine, to 60 per cent and now to a mere uh, 30 per cent for local content? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence Industry, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Patrick for his question and some advice uh, of the question. Um, Mr President, uh, as Senator Patrick uh, is well aware, uh, in fact, perhaps better aware than most uh, in the chamber, given his own professional experience, one would hope. Uh, this is a very long-term project. You know that. This is a project which this government took on after those opposite completely abrogated their responsibility to ensure that Australia had the submarine capability it required to do the jobs that we ask the ADF to do. Our commitment to Australian industry engagement and industry content in the attack class program is absolutely steadfast. Senator Patrick used uh, a couple of statistics, a couple of figures rather, in his, uh, in his question. He uh, referred to a 90 per cent figure, which, as I recall, was actually used by a then DCNS official uh, and not initiated by Minister Pine. The involvement of Australian industry in the attack class submarine program is critically important to its construction, its sovereign construction, its operation and the sustainment of the attack class submarine fleet. That has been the premise from which we have operated from the very beginning of this process. I've told this chamber on a number of occasions in various incarnations of my responsibility that we will not put a 
ceiling on local content because we want to absolutely maximise it. We've made a variety of major announcements on how we're securing work in Australia, including the signing of the strategic partnering agreement, the signing of the design contract, the, the, the signing of a framework agreement between Naval Group Australia and ASC, identifying ways to collaborate with each other to support Australia's sovereign submarine capability, the establishment of the Naval Shipbuilding College in South Australia to ensure we've got the workers we need to get jobs done, the transition Order. of 270 Payne, jobs from the France to has Australia. Expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Now, the department in, ha, has given guidance as to why the number is so low at this stage, suggesting we don't have the know why or the know how at this early stage. However, we've got plenty of know how and know why, and that's in ASC in Adelaide. Unfortunately, we know that DCNS offered to partner with ASC in this build, in this program, that uh, has been conceded by Defence. Will you, do you accept that uh, when, when you carve them out, you've made a billion dollar, uh, multi billion dollar mistake in terms Order, of local Senator content? Patrick. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely do not accept the premise of uh, Senator Patrick's question. I was just about to say that we're in my previous answer, we're transitioning 270 submarine design jobs from France to Australia. We've announced that Lang O'Rourke is the managing contractor to construct a purpose-built submarine yard at Osborne North, creating hundreds of construction jobs. We've announced that Lockheed Martin will design. Lockheed Martin Australia will design and integrate the $700 million combat system for the attack class, creating around 200 Australian jobs. We are still in the very early phases of this, Mr President, and uh, to the Senate chamber. But in terms of activities which are going to be located here, just for starters, we have detailed design, we have product engineering, we have design authority for sustainment, we have land-based integration and testing, sea-based integration and testing, construction of the submarine uh, construction yard, which I've referred to, construction of the 12 boats themselves, construction of the support infrastructure, ranges, wharves and training, development of a sovereign supply chain to support the fleet, including ongoing sustainment of the fleet, such as upkeep, uh, updates and upgrades. We are absolutely Order, committed Payne. to maximising the Australian industry and content. Senator Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, um, in, in 2016, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Costello did say 90 per cent, but Minister Pine repeated that to the uh, South Australian electorate. Uh, we've moved from 90 per cent. He then said 60 per cent in a radio uh, interview in, in Adelaide. You have conceded you haven't put any maximums. Uh, we're only at 30 per cent. Minister, how low are you going to let this go? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It strikes me as passing strange, Mr. President, that as far as I can tell, the only people in Australia who are talking down the development of the attack class submarine are senators from South Australia, like Senator Patrick, and occasionally those opposite, when they feel a twinge of guilt about what they completely failed to do for the entire term of their government. Our job, our task, and our commitment is to maximise Australian content, to maximise Australian industry engagement. It is what I have prosecuted, it's what Minister Pine has prosecuted, and it's what my colleague Senator Lena Reynolds will continue to do as the Defence Industry Minister. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Regional Services, Senator Mackenzie. How is the Liberal National Government's strong economic management benefiting those Australians living in regional areas? Minister for Regional Services, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Williams for his questions. He knows that when the regions are strong, so too is Australia, and he's championed this his entire senatorial career. Regional Australia produces over 30 per cent of our GDP and 70 per cent of our export, drives the wealth production across our nation. And the Liberal National Government's focus on returning the budget to surplus for the first time in more than a decade means that we can invest further in the areas that Australians care about. Additional tax relief to support hard-working regional Australians, the public school teachers, the nurses, the tradies in our communities, with more than $1,000 of their hard-earned dollars back in their pockets because of our changes. This will help that no matter where we live, you, we are investing to help people get home to their families safer and sooner, connecting our regions as part of our record $100 billion investment in our nation's infrastructure. This will help manage our growing population, improve freight and transport routes for our fa fabulous uh, fresh produce, connect communities and reduce traffic accidents and fatalities. 
Returning the budget to surplus is not an abstract concept. It produces real benefits and outcomes for people right across the country. No longer an abstract construct in this country will be fast rail. Uh, we have put $2 billion on the table to connect Melbourne to Geelong. We've also invested in developing eight business cases to connect East Coast regional capitals uh, with the regions. The budget surplus also allows us to invest in building better regions fund to improve and support growth and local jobs in our regional community. It also means we're able to invest in our young people, so critical to our prosperity, to support them with vocational training, apprenticeships and, in times of difficulty, uh, mental health sport and suicide prevention programs. This is what real fiscal— Order, Senator McKenzie. Time for the answers expired. Senator Williams, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister and ask, how will Regional Australia benefit from the record investments in infrastructure announced in Budget 2019? Senator McKenzie. There are 100 billion reasons why Regional Australia should be excited about our investment in key infrastructure. There's the additional $1 billion we're adding to the roads of strategic importance to take our total investment to over $4.5 billion to provide long-lasting benefits long after the construction finishes. Through this initiative, we're investing in over 25 key freight corridors, including feeder roads, to more efficiently connect agriculture and mining regions to our ports, our airports and other transport hubs. There's more than $2 billion to improve road safety and dedicated programs to improve roads right across rural and regional Australia. As local government minister, I know the vital role that local councils play in identifying and improving local roads. And because of this sound fiscal management, we're able to provide $1.1 billion to local councils right across Australia to improve their local roads through our iconic Roads to Recovery program. Senator Williams, a final supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Now, my last question is placed in a real curly one to the minister. <laughs> what would be the consequence for Regional Australia of alternative approaches that fail to prioritise crucial infrastructure? <laughs> Senator McKenzie. <laughs> well, thank you. That is uh, not such a curly one after all, because uh, I think the greatest risk to the prosperity of our nation and through uh, hampering the productive capacity of the regions, of the agriculture sector, of the mining sector, is those people opposite yeah, yeah. because of the dirty deal that they will do with our economy-wrecking Greens, who actually, actually want to see the end of the mining industry, employing hundreds of thousands of Australians in the regions. And why the CFMEU Forestry Division, Order. Mining Division, is not saying to you what is your preference deal and why are you actually going to stand with these people who are going to put your own members out of work. There is one reason, one reason, if you're a regional Australian, to back a Liberal National Coalition and the budget is because we will look after your families, we'll look after your jobs Order. and provide a Senator safe, McKenzie. prosperous Time future. For the answer has expired. Order. Order. Order, Senator Wong. It's the last question time for quite a while. Everyone take a deep breath. That's what you keep telling me, Senator Watt. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Cre uh, Mr. President. Uh, I must say that this question has been developed from the contribution of thousands of Australians, and it's, the question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Across recent history, the UN has criticised Australia's human rights record under previous and current coalition governments, subjected us to a barrage of criticism over asylum seekers and offshore detention criticised the boat turnback policy, we have been wrapped by the special rapporteur on torture and accused of chronic non-compliance that was off the charts, meaning we had very little to be proud of. Reportedly, the member for Denison wants to refer coalition ministers to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. Why does Australia continue to support an organisation that allows genocides, torture and true crimes of humanity to go unchecked and waste time undermining our border security? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, <clears throat> thanks, Senator Bernardi, for uh, for his question. I think it's very important to remind ourselves of the importance of effective multilateralism, of the importance of uh, the contribution that it makes to protecting and promoting the rules-based international order, 
uh, what it makes to contributing to our own objectives uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So Australia focuses on contributing to an efficient and effective UN. We don't always agree. In fact, we have robust differences of opinion from time to time within the UN and its associated agencies, bodies like the Human Rights Council, of, uh, of which we are a recently elected member. But the contribution to those things, where strong global cooperation sets a tone, where it sets in place rules and norms for constructive diplomacy in every region of the world, is a very important part of Australia's engagement and has been thus since the inception of the United Nations, where Australia was a founding member 70 years ago. So we see a period of rapid and accelerating change. We see times of rising nationalism and geopolitical competition, but that does not mean that we should walk away from those organisations uh, in which we have the opportunity to argue for the rules-based international order, in which we have the opportunity to protect and promote those systems and processes which enable us to solve problems together. Our most urgent global challenges are not going to be solved by any one country acting alone. There are a vast number of them, as Senator Bernardi has alluded to. And as I have said explicitly, both here Order. and elsewhere— Order. Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister. According to DFAT annual reports, when the coalition took office, Australia contributed $193 million that year to the UN. Unlike self-funded retirees' slow rates of return on investments, the UN has enjoyed a 46 per cent funding increase over the coalition's six-year lifespan to $282 million. Australia has been ravaged by drought, cyclones and bushfires. So why do we keep increasing aid funding to a body that condemns us? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I do think um, it is an invidious comparison to suggest that uh, our relatively um, reasonable contribution to bodies such as this uh, prevents the government from making the contributions that we do in relation to natural disasters and emergencies in our own country. This government has taken significant steps to support those most seriously affected by the worst of natural disasters recently, whether they are, have been floods or fires or cyclones or drought and ongoing drought, which we acknowledge is an extraordinary challenge for those uh, suffering. This government, has not, this government does not accept this is an either-or proposition. We are able, through the management of a strong economy, to play a responsible role in the international community, to contribute to security and stability in so doing, but also to support those Australians in greatest need. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In this place, I have raised specific questions about the Paris Climate Pact, the diversion of Australian aid money to ghost programs in Afghanistan and to purveyors of terrorism in Palestine. Is the government proud of throwing away rapidly precious, or increasing amounts of precious taxpayer money to United Nations that continue, uh, continually opposes both our border security and our sovereignty? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. When, you, when Senator Bernardi has raised those issues of concern, the government has, of course, and other senators, I may say, has, uh, of course, made appropriate investigations. And I acknowledge that uh, uh, some of those have, uh, have needed to be addressed. Some have come to nothing, Mr President. I am not uh, for a moment claiming that uh, the system in which we operate internationally, the uh, rules-based international order which we uh, work within, uh, will always solve and address every problem. The world would be a very different place if it could. But the contribution that Australia makes as a supporter of the rules-based international order, as a contribution to security and stability in our own region and elsewhere, is a very important one. We have been a leader in this context for decades and decades. We raise concerns when we have them. We engage in robust discussions and debates with those Order. who run— Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. 
My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister confirm that in Mr Morrison's budget last night, millions of working Australians earning less than $40,000 miss out on a bigger tax cut, while bankers and CEOs receive a tax cut of $11,000 a year? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, Mr President. No, I cannot uh, confirm that. And that's, uh, you, should not, you should not believe something just because the Shadow Treasurer uh, says so. So, I mean, this government, uh, in our uh, second major income tax relief package for hardworking families, has again prioritised low and middle income earners, has again prioritised low and middle income earners, as well as continuing to address bracket creep, as well as yes. continuing uh, to simplify our tax system with a, with a view of incentivising and rewarding hardworking Australians. And what I, what I would say, and this is very important, um, this is very important, um, uh, Mr. President. So the good uh, Senator uh, asked me about uh, the uh, tax burden at the lower income end. Well, somebody on $30,000 uh, uh, $30, a year gets a 106 percent tax cut as a result of the income tax relief packages that this government has put forward, a 10.6 percent uh, uh, tax cut, whereas somebody on 200,000 uh, where, where where, where yep. somebody on 200,000 gets a 0.2 percent tax cut, a 0.2 percent tax cut. Well, of course, somebody on $30,000 a year will be paying $2,142 in tax, whereas somebody on 200,000 will pay $67,000 dollars in tax, 2,142 versus $67,097. Now, uh, the point is, our tax system is highly progressive. And once our plan has been legislated in full, the top 5 per cent of income earners in Australia will continue to pay a third, a third of the income tax revenue generated in Australia, a third. But of course, Mr. President, I mean, we understand on this side of the chamber that it is entirely appropriate and economically important to incentivise, encourage and reward aspiration. Yeah. Of course, it is entirely appropriate and important for the future economic success of all Australians, including and in particular low and middle income earners, to ensure that all Australians have the right incentive. Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that the majority of people who will miss out on a bigger tax cut are women? Why is Mr. Morrison making it harder for working women to make ends meet? Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, uh, the, the problem, and I mean. I welcome you to this chamber and I wish you a very successful career for many years to come, hopefully for uh, quite a bit longer on the opposition benches. But what I, would, what I would advise you very genuinely is when you are handed questions by your tactics committee, perhaps try and, answer to the, uh, try and listen to the answer to the primary question before you just read out the first supplementary that you are handed. Because the premise of the question is entirely wrong. And if you, had listened, if you had listened to my answer to the primary question, you would know that the premise of the question is entirely wrong, because Australians at the lower income end are getting higher tax cuts on, a, on percentage. The percentage, the, our, our, percentages, our percentages says, our percentages says, our percentages says, Senator, Senator, our percentages. Yes, indeed. Order. So let me repeat it. Let me repeat it. Order. Somebody, <clears throat> somebody on thirty thousand dollars a year gets a ten point six percent tax cut uh, under our government, whereas somebody on two hundred thousand dollars a year gets a zero point two percent tax Cormann, time cut. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order on my left. Absolutely. Now on my right, Senator O'Neill. I've just called order. Your colleague is waiting to get on his feet. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. With cuts to Medicare, hospitals and schools and bigger tax cuts for bankers and CEOs, doesn't this show that after six years of cuts and chaos, this government is only for the top end of town? Yep. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Well, that, that is just a bit of uh, student political rhetoric that I completely reject. I mean, this is, this is a government, this, this Liberal national government is a government that is focused on the best interests of all Australians. We are focused on making sure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. We want to ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to lift their living standards. And you know what? We understand that the way to do this is through a stronger economy. 
through a stronger economy. And that is, of course, why we continue to pursue uh, our national economic plan, which has been successful in delivering a stronger economy. And let me, I mean, what is the alternative? The alternative, the alternative is the high-taxing, anti-business, class warfare agenda of the leader of the opposition, which would make the economy weaker, which would make the country weaker, which would make all Australians poorer. You know what? Socialism has been tried in other places around the world before. And you know what it does? It makes everyone poorer, including and in particular low-income earners. If you want to help lift low-income earners, if you want to give the opportunity for low-income earners Senator to become higher-income earners, the we need a stronger economy. Order. Senator Corbyn, time for the answer Order. Senator McDonald. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, uh, my question is to Senator Canavan, representing the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, and I ask the Minister how our government's um, strong economic management and the budget plan is providing for the resources to invest in new market opportunities for our farmers and our agricultural products. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Macdonald for that question. Recognise his great support and passion for the North Queensland agricultural industry in particular and the great sugar industry around the Burdekin, where uh, Senator Macdonald hails from. And uh, Senator Macdonald is right to highlight the fact that this government understands that for our farming sector to do better, for our farmers to be able to provide for their families and stay on the land, they need to be able to sell their products. They've got to have markets to sell the products to. They've got to have growing markets to get more money to stay competitive and also to make sure they keep, uh, keep the bank happy and the wife happy and the family happy and all those things happy. That's what they need. And so that's why, as a government, uh, over the last six years, we have signed new trade agreements with Japan, with China, with Korea. Uh, through the Trade Pacific Partners, Trans Pacific Partnership Agreements, uh, uh, with Indonesia more recently, all massive markets for our farming produce that's helped uh, agricultural producers make more money. Now, I'm going to raise just one particular highlight, one particular individual circumstance that is well known to Senator Macdonald, the uh, 2PH farms down at Emerald, the Presler family that I know Senator Macdonald, through his career, has helped significantly through different issues, viruses and what have you. But they've also benefited significantly from this government's uh, conclusion of particularly the Chinese free trade agreements, allowed great central Queensland citrus products to go into the growing market of China. It's allowed them to expand. They employ hundreds of people in Emerald, uh, contributing to the, to the central Queensland economy of that area, all thanks to the fact that we're getting more markets open. And that's why in the budget last night, Mr President, we also further announced $30 million to enhance Australia's agricultural trade. This will help farmers uh, overcome some of the non-tariff barriers that exist. So most of the tariff barriers are gone or are being removed, but sometimes it's hard to get products uh, classified, approved through customs in different countries. This funding will help farmers navigate that process, again open up more markets, uh, get more income, provide more jobs in regional communities. Senator Macdonald, supplements the question. Thanks, Mr President. I thank the Minister for that and thank you for men mentioning TPH, which is a, a great uh, Australian uh, company uh, doing great things in the export uh, area. But, Minister, uh, not all of our farmers just at this moment are doing quite as well because of droughts and uh, floods, particularly in the north and northwest of uh, our state. Uh, so I'm asking the minister uh, how the government is supporting those farmers facing hardships through drought and floods. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I recognise the, the fact that uh, Senator Macdonald's in some of the areas there that have been impacted the, the, the hardest by droughting, including around Townsville and visited around Guru there a, a few weeks ago saying the impact on the cane fields there, not, not as devastating as what we saw in the Gulf areas with the cattle industry, but still a big impact for those, those farmers. That's why we've, we've announced more than $6 billion of drought funding in the budget last night and over $3 billion in flood uh, relief. That has included the immediate $75,000 grants we provided to farmers impacted from this flood. That's three times normal level given the significance of this event. Uh, in recent weeks, we've announced that we'll, we'll make up available up to $400,000 in grants uh, to, to graziers to restock their land so that we can get these properties, particularly those in the Gulf that have lost thousands of cattle, possibly up to half a million cattle, back on their feet. We provided $5 million to the CWA, the Country Women's Association, to provide assistance to those uh, in drought, and we're also offering low concessional loans. A lot of other things in the budget to help. We're doing all we can to get people back on their feet Order. after these devastating Senator floods Canada. and droughts. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. Thanks, uh, Mr President. Uh, and again, I thank the uh, uh, Minister uh, for that. 
and appreciate his advice about how we've helped farmers in uh, need. But uh, we, we're a government, I know, that looks to the future. And I ask the minister uh, how the government is securing the future of our farmers and through them for our nation uh, as a whole. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, what we, we have is a positive vision for the future of farming in this country. Right. What we want to see is us grow as a farming country from the 60 odd billion dollars we produce today to 100 billion dollars in recent years to come. We want to feed the, uh, grow the amount of people we feed from about 75 million people that we feed now, over double our own population, we triple our own population, uh, to over 100 million people around the world. And the way you do that, Mr. President, is you build dams. That's, you've got to build, you've got to store water. The way you do that, Mr. President, allow people to develop land. Sometimes they have to clear trees to put in new crops that grow food that's good for the world, not just for us, but good for the world. But over there, Mr. President, over there, they don't want any of that. They don't want to build dams. They certainly don't want to let farmers manage their own land, and they are, they are insulting our farming communities in this country by adopting green left policies that are going to lock up the land and not let us progress our country to grow more food and develop more, more, more local economies in our country. Order, Senator Canavan. Senator Cameron. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. I refer to the Treasurer, who last night told Australians, and I quote, every one of us want to see wages growing faster, end quote. Can the Minister confirm that in addition to overseeing record low wage growth, the government last night cut forecast wage growth? If so, by how much? The Minister representing the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, depending on the timing of elections and uh, returns to parliament and uh, outcomes, that may be the last charming and en engrossing question from Senator Cameron we hear <laughs> in this place. And I think it's important to note that for the record, Mr. President, because we've heard lots of charming and engrossing questions from Senator Cameron over time. And it's interesting that he goes to the question of wages growth, Mr. President, because we on this side know one thing about wages growth. The difference between us and them is that you have to have a stronger economy to ensure wages growth. The order. difference. Po order, Senator Payne. Senator Cameron on a point yeah, of order. A, a point of order on relevance. Uh, I simply ask, can the minister confirm? that, uh, in addition to overseeing record low wage growth, the government last night cut forecast wage growth. That's the question. The minister should be drawn to the question. Um, Senator Cameron, you've reminded the minister of the question. She's been speaking for 45 seconds. I'm listening carefully. I call the minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. I think it would be useful to look at actual budget results in the context of Senator Cameron's question, because unlike those opposite, what our budget results have consistently shown is that we have consistently exceeded expectations and that we are delivering a surplus. That would be foreign territory for those opposite, Mr President, unless they have memories that go back to 1989. Uh, notwithstanding that, we of course operate on the basis of using conservative Order. forecasts. Senator, Payne. Senator Wong. She got there. Okay, Senator Wong is not raising a point. Said... Senator Payne. We have indeed, Mr. President. Those opposite might not like to hear about it. They might not like to think about it. But we have maintained our path back to surplus on the back of those forecasts and our spending discipline. So. We want Australians to earn more and to keep more of what they earn, and that's what we're delivering—a stronger economy, 1.2 million more jobs created by Australian businesses as part of our stronger economy. Wages growth picking up. The Government of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, has said we are seeing a turning point now evident in the wage price Order. index due Senator to the Payne, stronger time labour for market. The answer has expired. Senator Cameron, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In addition to overseeing record low wage growth and a cut in forecast wage growth, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government has voted eight times to cut the wages of over 700,000 workers relying on penalty rates. How does cutting wages 
reflect a commitment to higher wages. Senator Payne. So, Mr. President, if you want to look at a risk to the economy, a risk to jobs and a risk to wages, look over there. That is where the risk to the economy, jobs and wages is. Order. What Senator about Payne. Labor's Senator Wong on a point of order? Uh, Mr President, really, it's question time and the minister has gone directly to having a go at the opposition, which you know we're used to. We know that's their game plan. But the question is, how does cutting wages reflect a commitment to higher wages? Uh, and, and, and how does cutting wages have a— the well, minister, then answer that question, Senator um, Cormann. Order. Um, the minister was speaking for 11 seconds. I will give the minister a chance to continue a couple more sentences. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I was, uh, as I was saying, Mr President, the strong economy is what will deliver higher wages. Without a strong economy, Mr. President, you cannot deliver higher wages. I understand why this is unfamiliar territory for those opposite, because they don't have the experience in their term in office to have delivered that. And we know, even from the policies that they have uh, exposed so far, that they are promising $200 order. billion dollars in higher taxes. On a point of order. Yeah. On a point yeah, of order, Senator Cameron. Mr. President, this minister hasn't got a clue that what we've asked simply is how does cutting penalty rates relate to higher wages? The minister should be drawn to the question. If she doesn't know, she Senator, should just say she hasn't got a clue. Senator Cameron, I, I, I recorded part of your question as saying how does cutting wages reflect a commitment to higher wages? I believe the minister is being relevant to that part of the question. She is talking about higher wages. Senator, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll tell you who doesn't have a clue, Mr. President. I'll tell you who doesn't have a clue. Senator Doug Cameron doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have a clue about the impact that $200 billion of higher taxes are going to have on this country and on this economy. He doesn't have a clue about the impact of their big new carbon tax that independent modelling shows will cost over 300,000 jobs. Order, Senator Payne. Senator Cameron, final supplementary question. Maybe we can do better this time. Last month, the Minister for Finance argued that record low wage growth was a deliberate design feature of the Australian economy. Is the coalition government's decision to cut wages and continued failure to do anything to address record low wage growth a part of its deliberate design to leave Australian workers worse off? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Senator Cameron, consistent to the last, misrepresents government ministers in almost everything that he says, and he's just done it again. What the finance minister has made very clear is that the only way to lift wages is a stronger economy built on more jobs and lower taxes. What Senator Cameron is refusing to acknowledge is those men and women who run small businesses all over Australia who are living in absolute fear of those opposite being elected, destroying their businesses, destroying the economy and destroying their future and that of their children. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank the Senator and ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Pratt. I rise to take note of uh, answers to questions from Senator McAllister, Brown, Giacone Cam and Cameron. And as all of the answers to questions in question time today from this government highlight, what we have before us in this budget is a fake budget full of fake, fake promises. Because if you drill down into the answers to every one of the questions that have been answered, asked by the opposition today, you can drive an absolute truck through all of the premises inside the answers to any one of those questions. Now, we have had here, in the answers to questions from Senator McAllister uh, to uh, Minister Fifield, they have completely treated Australians on low incomes as a complete afterthought in this budget. Less than 24 hours after this budget was delivered, we see a backflip 
for forgotten Australians who weren't included in the $75 payment. Those on Ausstudy, Abstab Study, Double Orphan Pensions, New Start Allowance, Parenting Payments. Why didn't you think of these people before? And if you move from, from that into the other people affected by this budget, look at the fairness. Look at the fairness of the tax cuts contained in this budget, which are inherently biased against those on low incomes. For those under $40,000 getting a puny, tiny tax cut compared to those at the, at, the above, uh, at the top end of town. You see here, if you take someone who's a student on Ofstudy, not only were they going to miss out on their energy supplement, but they have, which has now been um, rectified, but they were also, uh, those on low incomes are absolutely not getting their fair share of the tax cuts in this government. Instead, if you go right out and look at the forward forecasts in these tax cuts, it is an absolute bonanza for high income earners in our nation. An absolute bonanza. And then if you look to uh, wage index in our, in our nation, as Senator Cameron asked Senator Cash, if you look, if you look at the number of uh, the, the false declaration of wages growth in this country that this government has forecast. Not once has this government met forecast wages growth predictions. It was, I think, 3.5 per cent uh, in the 17-18 budget uh, by 2020. The following year, that was pushed out to 2021. And now we see wages growth being pushed out uh, another year. Now, what if, what if those assumptions that the government had put forward about wages growth in our country had been correct? Well, according to the papers that you've put forward, wages should have grown in this country by some 7 per cent. That is despite the fact that you do things like attack penalty rates. What kind of thing is it to expect on one hand that you can deliver wages growth in our nation at the same time as cutting penalty rates? It simply doesn't stack up. You do nothing as a government to stimulate wages growth because your industrial relations settings, and Senator Cormann said it himself, they're pretty much designed to keep wages low in our country. So as we head into uh, this election, which I hope will be called on the weekend, we have before us laid out plain and clear a fake budget full of fake policies. The fundamentals in this budget simply do not add up. The NDIS saving that should have been uh, spent, but it's the slow progress of this com Commonwealth government in dealing with the states, the attacks on penalty rates, uh, the lack of wage rises. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Yep. I remind senators that uh, the motion passed earlier today that the exact cutoff for this debate will be 3.30. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The budget is back in black and Australia is back on track. Are there 12 more beautiful words in the English language than those? If there are, I haven't heard them. I am so proud to be speaking this afternoon on Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's first and outstanding budget, the first of many Frydenberg budgets, I hope. It's a remarkable budget because it does return the budget to surplus and it does so without increasing taxes and while guaranteeing essential services. In fact, not only have we returned the budget to surplus without increasing taxes, we're returning the budget to surplus while cutting taxes, delivering hard-working Australians the, the tax relief that they need and deserve. 
In fact, cumulatively, between this budget and the last one, we are reducing personal income taxes by almost $300 billion. That makes the choice at this election very clear between the opposition, led by Mr Shorten, and the government, led by Mr Morrison, and the clearly contrasting tax plans that we're taking to this election. From the coalition, you have $300 billion of lower personal income taxes. And from the Labor Party, you have $200 billion of increased taxes at least. That's a $500 billion turnaround for hardworking Australians in terms of the tax burden they will bear, depending on who wins this upcoming election. In this financial year alone, up to 10 million working Australians will receive tax cuts of up to $1,080 in this financial year. By the time our tax plan is rolled out in full, 94 per cent of taxpayers will face a marginal rate of no greater than 30 per cent. This effectively eliminates the scourge of bracket creep for all workers earning between $45,000 and $200,000. They'll face no disincentive in the form of higher taxes to taking more risks, to taking on more hours and to being more productive and entrepreneurial. We're of course not just delivering a surplus, but we're putting the federal government finally on a path to paying back the debt burden that was left to us. We've taken six years to get back to surplus, despite the best efforts of those opposite to make it even harder and longer, and we're forecasting that within 10 years all of the net debt accrued as a result of the irresponsible fiscal path that we were placed upon as a country by the Labor Party will be reversed. The damage will be undone. Net debt will reach zero by 2029-30. In time, this will help alleviate the $18 billion of interest payments that Australian taxpayers currently have to meet every year. $18 billion of interest payments a year makes that uh, item one of the single biggest budget items that we have to service. And that is in a time of record low interest rates. God forbid if we weren't able to put us on a path to fiscal repair if interest rates ever return to higher and more normal levels. This, of course, is despite the best efforts of the Labor Party, particularly in this chamber, to thwart our efforts to repair the budget and make that task as difficult as possible. Importantly, we've done all of this. Return the budget to surplus, had meaningful tax relief for working Australians. We've done all of this while guaranteeing the essential services that Australian people rely on. This government will deliver record funding for health. It will deliver record funding for education. It will deliver record investment in our national defence. We've done all this without raising taxes. We haven't had to have a hit on self-funded retirees. We haven't had to have a hit on property investors. We haven't had to have a hit on small and medium business owners. We've had no hit on income taxpayers and we've had no hit uh, on those who use family trusts. All of those people who will be in the gun if Mr Shorten and the Labor Party are successful at the upcoming election. How do we do this? By restraining the growth of spending with prudent fiscal management, led particularly by our Finance Minister, Mayor Tears Cormann, and presiding over a growing economy that's delivered 1.3 million jobs. The choice could not be clearer. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Stirl. Yeah, thank you, Madam Deputy President. <sighs> now, I was sitting there early on in your chair, Madam Deputy President, earlier on when I heard Senator uh, Macdonald talk about the standards in this chamber, how it slipped over the last 28 years, the 29 years he'd been here. And I can say over the last 14 years I've been here. You know, the nastiness, it, it's just incredible. And uh, I sit myself and I saw it from the time that uh, Mr Abbott took over the leadership, standards really did drop. And I don't think I get much of an argument from most of us that aren't Liberal senators. Um, but also, Senator Macdonald said about the lies that are perpetrated in this chamber and other chambers and get away with it. But there's a greater lie here. We are not back in black. We're not. There's still debt. 
and it won't be back in black, projected till next year. So there's another blatant lie that's being peddled by the government. But we understand that their backbench senators get wheeled out and have to run the company line or the party line. So there's a classic example. But that's, I'm not blaming Senator Patterson because that's what the Treasurer is saying, that's what the Prime Minister is saying. I just want to quote one page of an article that was uh, came to my attention, and it was by Greg, or it is by Greg Jericho. Uh, Jericho from The Guardian, and he says uh, it's under the heading The Seven Graphs That Exposed the Coalition's 2019 Budget Fairy Tale. And I won't go too much into it, but he does say tax cuts, surpluses, and fancifully optimistic forecasts add to, up to a make believe budget. And he says Morrison, I'm quoting, in splashes the cash in final election sell to the suburbs. The rosy forecast in Frydenberg's budget, I'm quoting him. I, if it was me saying it, I'd refer to their proper titles. And the big assumptions beyond them, and I'll just round it off on this, where he also goes to say this year's budget is an odd mix of tax cuts and spending measures targeted to win an election, but with, it, with assumptions so joyous and optimistic that you could be forgiven for thinking the Liberal Party wants to lose just so it can blame the ALP for not living up to their predictions. I mean, People are awake up to this. The media are awake up to this. But this has been a real strange session. Now, I'm not using these as props, Madam Deputy President. I just want to put them under my nose so I can refer to them. But it was brought to my attention by Senator Gallagher this morning, and I hadn't noticed. But this is the first time in living memory, well, certainly from me and others, and I'd be interested to hear from other senators, and especially, especially yourself, Madam Deputy President. Normally, when we have the papers after the budget, there's the there is the, the, the photo shop of the uh, Treasurer looking as a leader. There is always, you know how the cameramen get down and they make the Treasurer look like they're, whole, you know, they're, the, they're huge and this is a thumping win for our nation. What, have, what, are the, what do Australia's papers carry today? Can you believe just about every paper in this nation? I'll hold it down here so I don't get told off. Okay, It's cartoons. So on that the Australian, which I call the paper they give away for free at the airport. There is the um, uh, treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, and he's got no clothes on, sitting on a cloud. He's the love cherub, you know, with the bow and arrow, and he's got he's smiling and big rosy red cheeks, and he's shooting arrows out there, and there's money being aimed at nurses and uh, construction workers, I would assume, with the helmet on. But in the background, big black clouds, ominous black clouds, with life taking lightning flying out of that black cloud. Then we go to the Fin Review, the last one, one of the last organs you think would turn the budget into a cartoon. But here they have uh, Mr Frydenbird on the back of a truck, and it's got back in black, back in black. He's playing a guitar. There's the Prime Minister drawn in the cartoon. He's playing a flute or something. And they're mimicking the ACDC, you know, long way to the top down Swanson Street. Uh, but there's a big road sign saying, virtually look out, there's holes in front roadworks. There you go. This is how they're seriously they're taking it. Here's the front page of the Daily Telegraph. We've got the, the I was going to say the Corminator. We've got the Terminator there puffing on a cigar and others. And uh, they're taking the mickey about... Uh, um, um, prime cuts and they're cooking a barbecue. Then we have this one here, the Canberra Times. They have Mr Frydenberg dressed up as a, you know, those ukulele, what do you call those things in the mountains, you know? But it's, uh, and he's got funny pants on with money falling out of them and then he's got the Prime Minister sitting on a bull there as the election rodeo. I'm not making this up. Wait till we get to this one, the Herald Sun. Oh my goodness me, and I'm not allowed to use it as a prop, and I wouldn't dare, but anyway, here's a picture of an overweight Prime Minister with a pair of shorts on the footy jumper, kicking the ball and showing hairy legs. It just keeps getting worse. Then you have this one here, the West Australian, where they've got the Mr Frydenberg as some genie rubbing a bottle. I'm not showing you. Hoping for wishes, you get 30 wishes, not three. It's an absolute joke. They're all wake up to you. Oh, thank you, Senator Still. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Well, uh, can only thank Senator, <laughs> the Senator for uh, his commentary about cartoons and newspapers. It shows how much the Labor Party have got to attack on the, uh, the wonderful budget. But look, uh, Madam Deputy President, tomorrow night you're going to hear <coughs> a, uh, you're going to be subjected to uh, what will be called an alternative budget by the alternative government. It will be full of lies, mistruths and misconstructions. 
Let me just t warn anyone who might be listening to Mr Shorten tomorrow night about Labor's record on what they promise and what they do. Remember, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. A Labor leader said that, was elected, and the first bit of legislation that came in was a carbon tax. Mr Swan, for the six years that I heard him deliver budgets in this chamber, each year promised that next year there would be a surplus in the budget, and not once was there a surplus. In fact, in most years the deficit went up. And if you want to listen to what Labor promises, just go back to the 93 election, where Labor promised tax cuts. In fact, they did more than promise tax cuts. They actually passed a law and it was called the LAW Law Tax Cuts. They were legislated. Labor did that because they thought they were going to lose the 93 election. Turned out, miraculously, they won that election. You know the first thing they did when they came back into office? They reneged on it. They cancelled. They cancelled that LAW Law Tax Cuts. So whatever you hear Mr Shorten say tomorrow night, just know that it won't be truthful. It'll be misconstrued. And don't take my word for it. Go back and look at the record of right Labor's uh, uh, budget uh, misfeasance. Uh, just a couple of things need to be raised, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, uh, the first uh, Labor senator uh, kept talking about penalty rates being uh, dropped by this government. Uh, a lot of Labor senators keep talking about that. A complete and abject outright lie. They know that penalty rate uh, decisions were made by the Fair Work Commission. And who set up the Fair Work Commission? The Labor Party in government. Who appointed most of the judges to the Fair Work Commission? The Labor Party. And yet they continue the lie that it's the government that's cut penalty rates. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Ms. Madam uh, Deputy President, Labor simply can't be trusted with money. This is a wonderful budget. Every low to middle income earner will get $1,000 more in their pay packet uh, once the uh, government's laws are brought in. For a dual income family, uh, that's uh, $2,160 to help uh, low income earners, middle income earners support consumption growth and ease the cost of living. As my colleague uh, Cinder Patterson has uh, explained, uh, there are tax cuts for all uh, going into the future. And immediately, immediately for small business, the engine room of Australia's economy, uh, there is uh, the instant tax write-off increased from 25 to 30,000. And uh, it seems, if I'm reading the budget right, that that now becomes a permanent feature for small business. Uh, and why can we give away? Why can we make these concessions to small business? Why can we make these? Uh, uh, concessions to low and middle income earners. Why can we have record spending on education, record spending on health, more drugs, more expensive drugs put on the PBS? Why can we substantially increase infrastructure expenditure to $100 billion over the next 10 years? Why can we do all this? Because we've managed the economy carefully. We've got the budget back into the black. We've got the uh, budget in the way that in the forward years there will be more surpluses and we'll be able to build more hospitals, more schools, uh, more roads, because that's what you can do when you carefully manage the uh, finances and uh, carefully uh, manage uh, government uh, expenditure. Labor, on the other hand, will spend like crazy. We know that. Everybody knows that. Uh, they'll buy votes with it. But someone always has to pay, and we've seen the results of that. Uh, we've seen the job that our governments had to do to get the budget back in black and keep it going that way. We need to do that because we need that money to spend Thank on you, essential Senator services. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take notice a note of the uh, questions uh, asked of a number of government senators in relation to last night's federal budget, and as my colleagues have already said. Uh, there's really only one way you can describe last night's federal budget, and that is a massive election con job. 
This budget last night comes after six years of neglect of the Australian people and, worse still than neglect, outright cuts to the services that so many Australians depend upon right across my state of Queensland and right across this country. Over the last six years, we have seen cut after cut from this LNP government to schools across Queensland, to hospitals across Queensland, uh, to infrastructure uh, that Queensland desperately needs as a growing state. Uh, and on top of all of those cuts, the other thing that has defined this government over the last six years is absolute chaos. Uh, from year to year, from Prime Minister to Prime Minister, the knives have been out constantly. Uh, the undermining has happened uh, constantly as well. And I was just thinking before, we've, we're now on our third Prime Minister uh, under this government, and if they try really hard, they've still got a few hours left to knife another Prime Minister and put in a fourth. That's the kind of thing that you couldn't rule out from this government. Such is the level of chaos that we have seen from them over the last six years. So six years of cuts and chaos delivered by this government, and they're trying to paper over it now with a new Prime Minister and a new Treasurer and a new federal budget. Uh, but I, I have confidence that the Australian people will see through this and that Queenslanders back in my home state will see through this and will see that this is just an election con job, that a government that's on the ropes, that has neglected them for six years, is trying to rush through in a belated attempt to win them over. As I was watching last night's budget, I was actually thinking it reminded me quite a lot of sending someone a, bel a belated birthday card six years after their birthday. So for six years, this government has cut back on service to Queensland, neglected what Queenslanders need, and six years later, on the eve of an election, they, they come out and say, well, here's a few sweeteners, we'll try and win you over. The problem this government has is that, in my experience, when you send someone a belated birthday card, all they remember is the fact that you forgot their birthday in the first place. And I'm very confident that last night's budget will show uh, that Queenslanders and Australians in general will not forget uh, the fact that this government has cut their services, will not forget the fact that wages have barely grown under this government. They'll remember all of those things, just like they'd remember it if it was a birthday that this government had forgotten and sent them a belated birthday card six years down the track. I was also remembering before, you know, we're all being a little bit reminiscing because this is probably the last session of part, last, last day of sittings before the next election. And who could forget one of the LNP shining stars in Queensland over many years, but the former Senator George Brandis. And some of you might remember that he had some things to say about the Queensland LNP uh, before the last state election, and he described them as being very, very mediocre. Well, I think that description could also be applied to last night's federal budget delivered by this government. Very, very mediocre. And it was particularly mediocre for my home state of Queensland. This budget last night, all it did, rather than put money back into the services that Queenslanders, Queenslanders need, it actually locked in the hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts that we've seen to Queensland hospitals, the hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts that we've seen to Queensland schools, to TAFEs, to apprenticeships. We had in question time today ministers getting up and talking about all this great news about new funding for skills. Well, why didn't you do some of it sometime over the last six years rather than pulling it out of the bottom drawer just before an election? Mackay, in one of Queensland's most, reg most uh, important regional towns, is now suffering from a skill shortage, with unemployment down to about 3 per cent and employers struggling to find people for jobs. And why would that be? Could that be something to do with the fact that this government has cut tens of thousands of apprenticeships over the last six years? And all of a sudden they want us to forget about that and, and look at the fact that they're putting in a few little trickles of money for apprenticeships and for skills into the future. So this budget last night locked in those cuts to schools, to hospitals, to TAFEs, didn't reverse them at all. The budget has no plan to lift the wages of Queensland working people who have barely had pay rises for any of the six years that this government has been in power. And probably worst of all is that there, there is not a single dollar of funding from the federal government for new infrastructure in Queensland, not just this year, but next year as well. So they want us to look at all these infrastructure projects they're talking about, but they're years into the distance. Not only would you need to vote for this government at the coming election, but you'd need to vote for them at the next one as well. It is a joke. It is a Thank con you, job. Senator and Senator White, your time has it. expired. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe it's carried. Senator McKim. 
you, President. I move to take note of the response from the Leader of Government Business in the Senate to the question asked by Senator Di Natale during question time. Well, another budget, another year of the coalition selling out our future. Billions of dollars in subsidies to help burn fossil fuels, money to help unlock new gas, a bill being rammed through later on this evening with Labor's help I might add, to enable taxpayer money to push more fossil fuel projects overseas. In fact, this budget contains more money to reopen the Christmas Island Detention Centre so the Prime Minister could hold the most expensive press conference in our country's history than it does new money to respond to the emergency of climate change. Our temperature records are tumbling. The hottest three months ever recorded, smashing the previous record by a degree. We are running at over two degrees Celsius above the long-term trend. In recent times, apocalyptic scenes have dominated our news. In my state of Tasmania, communities have been threatened and our precious, unique wilderness World Heritage Area devastated by fires made more likely and more dangerous by the breakdown of our climate. Vast areas of Queensland have flooded. Thank you, and we've Senator seen McKim, your time.